And a very warm welcome to all of you from uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and the Department of Public Health and Informatics in Bangabundu, Sheikh Mujib Medical University. My name is Helen O'Neill. I'm the strategic advisor uh, in South, MSF South Asia. I'm also responsible for the uh, MT sponsor, the management team sponsor for the MSF Asia Scientific Day. So today we gather for this scientific day in Dhaka, um, Bangladesh, amidst the pressing need for humanitarian action. Our aim is to foster a collaborative environment that brings together the scientific community, public health organizations, and academics to create a robust ecosystem for sharing knowledge, expertise, and experiences. The joint efforts of these institutions seek to unite researchers, practitioners, academics, senior scientists, and patient representatives with the common goal of catalyzing improvements in the quality of care provided to patients and populations at risk. Our focus remains steadfastly patient-centric. Today promises an engaging lineup of knowledge-based interactive sessions over the next couple of hours. It's going to be a long and busy day, uh, but I hope a very engaging one for everybody. We have the privilege of hearing from both young student researchers and seasoned scientists and scholars from around the world as they present their groundbreaking work. For our online audience, we, will, we have provided a user-friendly guide, but before we proceed, uh, there's some house rules for the conference. We kindly request everyone to adhere to the conference schedule, uh, keep cell phones on silent during sessions, and maintain decorum throughout the event. Timekeeping will be quite strict. Um, and we plan a tea coffee break for those who are curious around 11.15. Um, so, and it will be 15 minutes only. The online participants are encouraged to send their questions via the chat box uh, below the live streaming window on the website. Additionally, you can click on the CC option on your screen for English auto-generated captions. So whether you're joining us in person or online, we invite you all to share our live stream and engage with us on social media using the hashtag MSF Sci Asia. Questions for the speakers will be addressed after each session, so please stay tuned. We also ask all attendees to review and complete the consent form at the registration desk. If you haven't already done so, please do so. Thank you for joining us at the MSF Asia Scientific Days 23 as we embark on a day filled with insightful discussions and the pursuit of excellence in medical care. Together we can make a difference. The hope. And now I would like to introduce you um, to Dr. Bishmaraj Srivasta, who is um, a physician by qualification and he started his public health career at M M MSF and subsequently pursued his postgraduate at John Hopkins University, Baltimore, and at presently he's working as the strategic medical lead as, at MSF South Asia. He's also the editorial lead for this Sci Day, and in fact, he's the principal architect of this event. Dr. Raj. Thank you, Helen, for the introduction. Uh, respected officials from the Ministry of Health and other ministries, senior faculty members from Bongo Bandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, colleagues from other organizations, MSF offices, and audiences from all over the world. I would like to formally welcome you all to the ninth edition of MSF Asia Scientific Days. To give a brief overview, the Asia Scientific Days is an annual public health program organized since 2015 to highlight some of the major health emergencies from across the region and beyond. We also aim to identify and network with key stakeholders such as policymakers, academic bodies, civil society groups, among others, and create a sense of encouragement among the younger public health professionals about the importance of research and evidence generation. As part of MSF South Asia strategic ambitions, we aim to invest in the scientific days as an opportunity to catalyze evidence-based improvements in the quality of care that is provided to patients and populations in humanitarian contexts. 
through the promotion of research and innovation, and thereby supporting cross-disciplinary networks and communities of best practice. As part of our networking and engagement strategy, we have been partnering with academic institutions from across the world since the past few years. This year, we carry this tradition forward with the honor of collaborating with BSMMU, one of the leading medical institutions in the region. With this partnership, we hope to engage with doctors, nurses, researchers, and other public health professionals from Asia to bring forward the emerging health challenges confronting our world through our agenda. For the same, we have organized a mixed session of panels, presentations, and posters from our speakers to highlight their experience of working in resource-limited settings and share relevant learnings with stakeholders from across the globe. As organized every year, we will also be live streaming our event proceedings on social media platforms so that public health enthusiasts from across the world can log in and join us. Some of the key topics that we will be sharing for today's program includes a balance of emerging or newer health challenges, such as the impact of climate change on resource limited settings, especially for the vulnerable population groups residing in those regions, and the growing role of non communicable diseases in resource limited settings while also addressing existing health issues, such as the burden of drug-resistant tuberculosis in Asian settings. So we would encourage our audience members, both in person and virtually, to ask questions and share their insights with the speakers and panelists. Last but not the least, I want to highlight that our thematic development exercise has always been a very field-centric approach, where we encourage providing a platform for fresh evidence which is generated at the grassroots level. Selection of all abstracts for the final day has been done through a rigorous review process from the editorial committee, composed of subject matter experts from various diverse fields such as biostatistics, epidemiology, infectious disease, um, humanitarian medicine, health program management, among others. I would like to thank the editorial committee members, both from within MSF and BSMMU, for their support in the entire review and thematic development process. I would also like to express my gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and members from BSMMU's Department of Public Health and Informatics, namely Professor Dr. Mohammad Atikul Haq, Professor Dr. Shariful Islam, and Dr. Fariha Haseen for their support and guidance through each step of our Scientific Days program development. Finally, I would like to thank our MSF core committee, composed of Dr. Farhat Mantu, Ms. Helen O'Neill, Dr. Rabia Khatun, Dr. Nausheen Zaidi, Ms. Neha Saluja, Mr. Deepak Bhatia, and Dr. Sadia Sultana. So with this, I conclude my welcome note. I hope all audience members joining us both in person and virtually make the most of this opportunity by engaging with our speakers and panelists. Thank you very much once again. And Helen, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raj. Dr. Raj for short. Okay, uh, and now I would like to call on Dr. Fariha Haseen. Thank you, Dr. Fariha. Doc Dr. Fariha is an associate professor at the Department of Public Health and Informatics of Bang Bangdu, uh, Sheikh Mujib Medical University. She heads the Reproductive and Child Health Division of the department and also is an acting member secretary of the steering committee of BSMMU for the MSF Asia Scientific Days 2023. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope you all are feeling energized and ready for the day ahead. Thank you all for taking the time to be here this morning. It's great to see such a diverse and engaged group of people. With great honor, I welcome you all to the MSF Scientific Days Asia 2023 where global health experts are gathering under one roof to share their insights, expand their knowledge, and create new connections. This annual event focuses on discussing scientific advancements and generating innovative solutions for the most pressing health challenges in Asia and beyond. Science has truly transformed our world, bringing us amazing technologies, medicines, and processes that have greatly improved healthcare, energy, and the environment. And as we face increasingly complex challenges, continuing to advance scientific research is more important than ever. 
When it comes to humanitarian global health, it's not just about saving lives and treating diseases. It's also about promoting human dignity and ensuring access to healthcare and empowering individuals to take control of their own health. This field requires whole leadership, innovative solutions, and a commitment to making a real differences in the lives of people around the world. The MSF Scientific Days is a unique platform for attendees to connect with peers working in similar fields and facing common challenges in different contexts throughout Asia. Since inception in 2015, the conference has been a hub to experts working in the humanitarian and academic fields to, uh, to showcase their research and innovative work, exchanging knowledge about the trends and challenges in innovation and healthcare. This year, MSF is collaborating with Department of Public Health and Informatics, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, to organize the event. Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University is Bangladesh's leading institution for postgraduate medical education and research, with advanced departments equipped with state-of-the-art teaching, research, and service technology. The event today will cover a variety of topics, including emerging diseases, data science, and tech innovations within healthcare system antimicrobial resistance, and pandemic preparedness plans from the Asia perspective. The primary objective of the event is to enhance the evidence base for MSF operations and advocate for solutions to various global health and challenges. Our event features a comprehensive program with a diverse range of activities that will engage the and inform expert attendees. You can expect to hear a keynote speech from one of the leading scientists in the country and the that will challenge your thinking, participate in panel discussions on current scientific topics, and witness oral presentations by researchers. Our poster sessions also showcase the latest findings in the field. In addition, we have planned several networking and social events to facilitate connections with other experts in your field. Our aim provide you with a stimulating and enriching experiences that will equip you with new sites and ideas to apply in your professional and personal life. The MSF Asia Scientific Days 2023 owns its success to the in invaluable contributions to academicians, scientists, researchers, and dignitaries from esteemed institutions such as BSMMU, ICDDRB, DNDI, MSF South Asia, Laser General Hospital, DGHS Bangladesh, CDC, Sultan Idris Shah Serdang Hospital, Karolinska Institute, National University of Malaysia, McMaster University, and National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute, who have shared their technical expertise and research findings. We are also grateful to our meticulous reviewers, enthusiastic volunteers, and committed staff for their dedicated efforts. We extend our sincere appreciation to the participants for their insightful inputs, unwavering interest, and remarkable contribution. Your participation has been instrumental in making this event a grand success. Thank you all for your valuable contribution. On this very auspicious day, we are honored to have Dr. Feddosi Kadri, a Ramon Maxese Award winning scientist, as the keynote speaker. Dr. Kadri has conducted groundbreaking research on cholera vaccines, making them available and affordable, saving lives, uh, millions of lives. We look forward to hearing from her and learning more about the latest advancement in global health. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you very much. That was for sharing your, your ideas about today for us. It's very, very interesting for us. Thank you. Um, we're very lucky to have um, the next speaker, who is our keynote speaker for today, because she's a very, very busy lady. It's Dr. Ferdowsi uh, Kadri, and she's the senior director of the International Set, uh, Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh. She's also the founder and lead of the Institute for Developing Science and Health Initiatives. And her work includes basic and applied immunology of infectious diseases, but also clinical and large field-based studies on enteric vaccines. She is also the, uh, the uh, recipient of many awards, including the Magasese uh, Award, 
And I would like to invite Dr. Kudasi to come up. Good morning, everyone. Shubhu uh, Shakkal. Okay. This is. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here amongst uh, so many people. And I hope I don't spoil your morning by talking about things that I've been doing and about Bangladesh and our health problems. Um, thank you, Helen, for uh, inviting me. And also, you know, Farhat and um, Rabi, of course, who has been in touch with me and everyone else. Uh, I will get all the names wrong if I keep on asking about all the names but uh, so it's a pleasure to be here I don't think I should waste time so many of you in Bangladesh prob probably know what I do and um, Faria has given a small um, idea of what I'm going to talk about but today I thought I should can you hear me properly because I'm too close to the mic then so I thought that maybe because of uh, this uh, uh, the meeting and the occasion MSF does so many things all over the world in humanitarian crisis, in looking after people, in providing better health, and now the science days. I think uh, being a scientist, it's exceptionally important to s see what we do and what I, with my colleagues, I don't do anything alone, what we have been doing uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years. And um, so, uh, we are in an era of extreme natural and man-made uh, uh, Israel-Palestinian bombing and small children dying. We heard about Afghanistan and the earthquake. We've heard about uh, the floods all over, including water logging and floods in our own country. And we know that we are, uh, due to climate change, I think mainly, we are facing pandemics, floods, tornadoes, everything, tsunamis. And every time something shakes, I feel that, is this the grade six uh, earthquake now that's expected in Bangladesh? And so uh, everything is very interrelated. And we, I, I will always have a global perspective, but more a Bangladeshi perspective, because I'm a Bangladeshi and I love the country. And so Bangladesh is uh, extremely prone to climate change effects. Look at the bus underwater. Oh. Look at the bus underwater. If there was a handheld mic, it would have been better. Look at the bus underwater. Look at what is happening just now. I fear to get into my own home. I live in Bo Boshundhara, so when there's rain and I'm outside, I'm always very worried if my car is going to float or not. This is better, I think. So, um, because I move so much, it's better to have this. So we have many problems, and uh, I, will, I have uh, divided my talk into four parts. I hope I don't make it too long. So we, uh, um, cholera is an important aspect of uh, my work and also a major public health problem in Bangladesh. Uh, we call it acute watery diarrhea, but we now know that it is cholera. Um, at least 20, 30 percent of it is cholera. I'll talk about that first and then go back one by one into the things that I want to talk about. So we are a cholera endemic country. We are known as the home of, the, of cholera, the Ganges Delta. I must and the part in Bangladesh and also in India. So uh, of the six of the seven pan pandemics that have happened in cholera um, from 2,200 years ago, uh, we have uh, seen that most of them originated in, uh, in South Asia and mostly in the Bay of Bengal. And the first pandemic, uh, the first cholera case was reported in Jeshore in our own country uh, in 1817. So cholera has claimed millions of lives in this region in previous times, villages would be vacated because people died. And that's how the, in fact, the population remained very low. So this is a disease that's uh, due to high density of uh, people, overcrowded households, unhealthy living conditions, poor sanitation, less safe water, less uh, education about, say, about uh, sanitation and health, and also sharing of water sources and toilets. And, uh, the burden of disease globally is three to five million lives and over 200,000 deaths. And uh, right now, there are epidemics in 25 countries in the world. So 
So it's Asia, Africa, and also the Middle East. So we have Lebanon, Iraq, these are not spared. And uh, we have over 20, uh, 20, what is this? Uh, Two million cases, uh, diarrheal cases every uh, yearly. And the one, and the leading causes of under five morbidity and mortality has been cholera for a long time. It's important cause of dehydrating diarrhea, but it is highly underreported. So if a person comes with dehydration, nobody tests the stool, whether it is cholera or it is not. And uh, we, it's a yearly epidemic, two peaks in a year. Those of us who work in ICDDRB, we know that there's going to be a spring peak and then a summer peak. And then uh, there are, in, it is expect, believe that the population at risk is 66 million in, in the country, of the 170 million people over here. So, a large proportion of the fam people are at risk, and the burden, the deaths are low, only about 4,000 4, deaths. Some of it is lower than expected, but maybe some are underreported due to cholera. It's only the confirmed deaths that we say are 3,272. So there are some pictures to show all the f how the patients come to the ICDDRB, what are the community uh, that have cholera. From 2011 onwards, I will not talk about the chapter before that. For 60 years, ICDDRB has been working on cholera. But I will talk about the things that happened from 2011 onwards. Why that? Because from that time onwards, an affordable oral cholera vaccine became available. You know that vaccines have to be affordable for the world. Previously, it was like, you know, $65, $70 a dose. But it came down to $1.85. And from that time, I have been very involved with this, with my team, and globally with WHO in the work that we are doing. So first we showed in 2011, in a paper that was published in Lancet in 2015, that it's uh, in urban high-risk population. If you give the two doses of the oral cholera vaccine, you have 70, 65% effectiveness in controlling cholera. So that's a big number. And also you have indirect herd protection. That means if one person does not have cholera in the home, three or four people are are also spared and also the community is spared because the cholera stool is all over the drains when there's a season of cholera. And uh, this uh, feasibility study that we carried out showed that uh, it was, uh, vaccine was uh, evident in all age groups and sustained for four years. That's how long we followed up. So this set the ground for the use of the cholera vaccine for protecting against endemic cholera. I'm just ta not talking about epidemic cholera, but endemic cholera like Bangladesh. So until now, in, in the different kinds of work that we've been carried out with the government of Bangladesh, CDC, DGHS, 10 million oral cholera vaccines have been uh, distributed in Bangladesh in studies as well in the Rohingya community. You may have heard that when the Rohingya people, what we call the LGMN, came into Bangladesh in 2013, we knew that there was going to be a pandemic. The Gavi and WHO sent us the vaccine in six days' time. That was a historical event. And we have been able to control epidemics in such this high-risk group who, are living, who were living at that time under very different um, 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 conditions. So we now have a ending cholera global roadmap to 2030. Bangladesh is participating in this global roadmap. There is a ro ro roadmap to elimination of many diseases by 2030, and cholera is one of them. And the global map says that, you know, we will uh, decrease cholera by 90% in at least uh, 20 countries, and Bangladesh is one of them. And based on this, we have been working together with the government in uh, seeing how we can control cholera. While we were doing this last year, 2022, instead of seeing less cholera, we saw the biggest epidemic ever in our hospital that we hadn't seen in 60 years. And so it shows that, you know, we have a lot of work to do. So I don't want to be pessimistic, but when you start doing something, you know that there are so many struggles ahead. And so what we, we were doing at that time, based on the Global Task Force for Cholera Control and based on our roadmap, the National Cholera Control Plan, we were doing preventive OCV campaigns in six HANAS just before COVID broke out in 2020. So we gave one dose of the vaccine. This is a two-dose vaccine. You can see some of the things that we did in six thanas in Dhaka city because those were the places where patients came to ICDDRB with very bad acute quaternary diarrhea, severe and moderate. Then we 
stopped it because of COVID. And then this year, in 2022, last year, we started the reactive vaccination. Reactive vaccination are only in places like in Africa when a disease suddenly emerges due to conflict and war and border um, uh, causes of uh, crossing over of cholera disease. And then we used this in the vaccine as a reactive vaccination, and WHO agreed to this and gave it to us again very quickly. And we vaccinated people in six thanas in Dhaka city, which were the most vulnerable at that time. We could have actually vaccinated more people, but we did not. There's not enough vaccine globally to give it to us. And you can see that the graph over there in the back that um, those were the areas from where patients were coming. So we only selected five of the high burden areas. And uh, I can tell you that from, from what we are doing now, looking at the effectiveness in at least two of the thanas, Dokkin Khan and Mirpur, the disease burden from those two areas have come down over 65%. So that's a remarkable achievement. And gives a, so we have this national cholera control plan. And we were the first from, we're always boasting about ourselves, you know, we have the successful EPI, the most number of vaccines that have been given through the EPI to our children. And we have been able to control mortality in under fives and in mothers. So we were the first to, uh, among the different countries to submit the national cholera control plan to WHO. From then onwards in 2023 uh, and 2022, we have done together with uh, CDC, DGHS and partners from WHO and the country support plat platform. We have done hotspot mapping for cholera in the country. And we know there are at least 140 hot, uh, hot cholera hot areas. And we have a multi-year plan for CV which has been submitted by Gavi to Gavi by CDS only two, three days ago in partnership with us. So why, do we are, why are we talking about cholera as disease that we have not been able to control over 200 years? Because we know now the whole society, there has to be a life course approach to vaccination, which will enable realization of the full potential of vaccination. And cholera vaccination is a life course vaccination. It is given to children one year and above 100 years or more, no problem. It's safe vaccine. So uh, we have a requirement from Bangladesh. Uh, the hotspot mapping and the requirement shows that at least 100 million doses of vaccine are needed for Bangladesh. And uh, this far exceeds. There's a you know that WHO creates stockpile for emergency vaccines, epidemic diseases, and WHO has a stockpile for oral cholera vaccine. But the stockpile has limited vaccine because producers don't want to make the vaccine because it's not cost effective. So the need for vaccine from Bangladesh is 100 million in the stockpile. That means the country, com one company is making it now. It's only 40 million at maximum. And we need 100 million. So when you can see that we are not sitting idle. We are doing many things. We have helped in the transfer of technology of the cholera vaccine to a company in Bangladesh, which is actually a commercially registered vaccine that people take. Yesterday, I was in Bandar Chittagong in an oral cholera vaccine campaign, and I saw that the children who were coming with uh, cards from different organizations, I don't think I saw MSF, but Red Crescent and others, they had many vaccines on their cards and also Colvax. I'm not advertising, really. And I saw that the children had taken two doses of the vaccine, so we didn't give them the vaccine from the campaign. So things are happening. People are changing. So we do have a transfer of technology in Bangladesh, and we do have a vaccine. But because we are not WHO pre-qualified our DGDA, which is going to happen very soon, we cannot, uh, um, this, this cannot be bought by Gavi. And so when it happens, then the, the scarcity of vaccines will increase. Now I will switch to typhoid, which is another disease that's a silent disease that has undifferentiated fever. And uh, it is the incidence of typhoid fever. Uh, this is a, this is a slide from 2015. I can give you a slide from 2023, which will be even worse. So there is the high um, uh, incidence rate areas. And Bangladesh, you can see, is uh, among the high incidence areas. And we have had data from our own studies in Bangladesh in uh, urban slums. And we've shown that. Uh, we are actually the highest burden country. And uh, I don't have a, I don't have a uh, pointer here. Is this the pointer? Okay, let me forget it. You can see the red sign over there, the incidence for 
in five to nine years of old children is 554. This was a three country study, multi country study, Malawi on one side, Nepal in the middle and Bangladesh. And we turned out to be the highest incidence area uh, country in the world. And also uh, in overall in all age groups also it is high. We know that typhoid does not only strike young children, five to nine year old children, but also adults. We hear quite often people have fever, but they, when they go for, they don't go for culture, but if they go to for culture of their blood, which is an invasive disease, you need blood culture. By the time you go to the doctor, you've gobbled up so many antibiotics, your blood culture is negative. So to prevent, WHO has now recommended the use of typhoid conjugate vaccine from 2018. To prevent S typhi transmission, we know there's para typhoid also, we won't talk about it. WHO has recommended the introduction of a single dose typhoid conjugate vaccine for infants and children six months older and above. And it was recommended by SAGE in 2017. And looking at the safety, efficacy, feasibility, and affordability, it was decided that yes, it can be given to children. These, these have been uh, in the WHO epidemiological report. And uh, we conducted a very big trial in which 67,000 children were vaccinated with either Japanese encephalitis vaccine as a, as a control vaccine and typhoid conjugate vaccine. And we found that the overall vaccine protection was 85% in an urban slum. We haven't been able to get these figures for an oral cholera vaccine. And 85, uh, for, so this was very good, just a single dose, not even two doses. And we are following up these children until five years to see what the uh, efficacy, how long it lasts, whether a booster is needed. But uh, our NITEC, which uh, now Faria and Maya are also part of, uh, based on all the evidence that was, has been generated from uh, different institutions, from, uh, from hospital-based studies, from community-based studies, and also the PCV study that we carried out in Mirpur, which was one of the largest in the world, and we, the Gavi has um, the NITEC, has accepted it, and the ICC in the 62nd meeting has uh, approved the TCV vaccine application. And so now we will have TCVs, uh, the typhoid conjugate vaccine, coming into Bangladesh from early 2024. That's a remarkable thing. And Bangladesh always is the first country to introduce a vaccine. And this will make a major difference in, the, in our quality of life. So now I will go to COVID-19. Uh, I am a very ambitious woman, you all know. All the experience that we gathered with cholera, typhoid, infectious disease research, immunology, epidemiology, we used all of that to understand COVID in Bangladesh. And so since December 2019, I don't need to talk too much about it. Uh, we know that it first, the first case was in Wuhan. On 6th, 8th March, the first case was confirmed in Bangladesh. And uh, till 2022, uh, there have been um, many, um, many mil um, million cases confirmed. And we know that our deaths have not gone over 29,000, has not even reached 30,000. Our CFR rate is very, uh, very low um, compared to other countries. And we saw, we have seen the Wuhan wave, then Wuhan, which then we moved on to the alpha, Eta, Delta, and Omicron. And in Bangladesh, now we, the, the pandemic has actually almost gone. I would say it's not there. And it's no longer a pandemic. And uh, we have been very successful in vaccination. The slide over here shows the different uh, variants as they come and go. And we have been very, um, we have uh, been looking at different uh, waves and the, um, and the sub variants. We know that there are so many sub variants with the Omicron, which we are now following up. up till the vaccination again was successful in Bangladesh, more successful than in other countries. We had uh, many vaccines approved, Pfizer, Moderna, Sinovac, Sinopharm, Sputnik, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, but um, four vaccines actually were used and five vaccines were used in Bangladesh. Until 30, 30th September, uh, 129,000, almost 130,000 people have been vaccinated, 75, about 80% of the total population with the first dose and 
about 75% of the total population completed the first dose, um, the second dose, and almost 50% have received the COVID-19 booster dose. So that is remarkable. And having this data, we've been looking at all the immune responses and um, seropositivity. And um, as soon as the epidemic started, uh, we together with uh, IDCR and our uh, different organizations that we collaborate with, uh, we've seen that uh, by uh, August to October, the zero prevalence level was about uh, 50% in, uh, in the country. Inside Dhaka city, in the slum, it was much higher, the presence of antibodies. In outside areas, it was also the urban and rural, what happened? It was the same. And um, we also looked at the high density and the low density population in the urban slums. And we found that the people living in high socioeconomic conditions, they had better immune responses. So we say that this may be due to the nutritional status and behavior practices, as well as, as household says. We also have very uh, nicely followed up in outside Chittagong. In, I do a lot of work in Chittagong and in Chittagundo, and we've looked at the uh, in sub-district in Chittagong in, with BTIT, Bangladesh Institute of Tropical Infectious Diseases, and with JHU in collaboration. And we've looked at the different uh, variants that have come there, and we've also looked at the zero prevalence levels. And by um, uh, January 2022, 75% um, of the Chittagong people were infected with Omicron. And 94% of the population in this area were positive by February 22 for um, COVID antibodies. So I think when we see that uh, the, ra ra the rate of COVID really went down, we did not see spikes as much as is being seen in different countries. I have friends who are now complaining that they are seeing COVID again and they are seeing quite severe cases of COVID or you know, mild cases, they're staying at home. But we are actually much better because of our exposure, we have, not, we have been exposed a lot, we've got vaccination. And so I'm quite sure that you know, when uh, it, from the NITAC also it has been decided that we will have one dose of COVID vaccine as a, as a, as a, every year, especially in the vulnerable high-risk population. So we have looked at uh, very, very closely into the antibody responses in patients with COVID infection, SARS-CoV-2 infection, with severe disease, mild disease, moderate disease, and asymptomatic, and just people who are healthy controls down in the bottom. I just forgot to tell you that prior to March 2020, we had a lot of specimens in our bank, in our reservoirs in, at ICDD, I've been at the places, we had looked at our COVID antibodies when we set up the receptor binding domain antibody, and we found that there was no antibody, like, you know, none of us had antibodies. It was less than 500 nanogram per milliliter, and you see the line below that? That's our cutoff, 500 nanogram per milliliter, our cutoff for Bangladesh. But we saw that the, though patients with severe disease had the highest levels of antibodies, then those with moderate, severe, asymptomatic disease, we also sh showed that you know, that um, we followed these uh, people up up till one, uh, six months and now up to one year, and we've seen that the antibody responses do go down, but still the threshold is much higher than the background level. Also, we saw that people who had been infected and then got a COVID vaccine, because we have the history from our database, the register, the vaccine register, and we found that those people who actually had infection before and then took the vaccine, they had actually very high levels of antibodies. So that's a very nice thing that the vaccine was, the infection was actually boosting, was boosted by the vaccine. And so this was for, especially for the mRNA vaccines, but also for Covishield. And uh, a lot of uh, graphs over here, but we wanted, I wanted to share with you that uh, looking at the level of antibodies that, uh, that is generated, we have done a study in eight divisions of Bangladesh for COVID and uh, uh, looking at uh, populations and following them after vaccination for over uh, three years. And so until now, we have uh, covered uh, all the eight divisions and following up the patients. And we've seen that, look at the pre-vaccination level and after the two doses and then after the boosters and then uh, at the boosters, look at the antibody levels. It's a hundred percent. So it is, uh, so zero positivity of all the people, 100 percent. So that is very important result. But we also looked at the boosting effect of different. Uh, in the last graph over there, I can't use my pointers. You can see that 
if you were given the COVID shield vaccine and then boosted with the COVID shield uh, vac uh, um, va uh, vaccine again, uh, and if you were boosted by a Moderna vaccine or the, um, uh, uh, or, or the Pfizer vaccine, the responses were definitely much higher when you were boosted by a Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. We have published all these results. And so we found that, uh, if I summarize all this, that boosting with the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine was actually very good, but also Covishield did uh, give a boosting effect um, after the primary series. So the neutralizing antibody using the pseudo neutralization assay has been set up by us and we've been doing it together with IDCR. And um, after COVID vaccination, even after six months of the first dose, it has been seen, but to all the other vaccines except to Sinopharm, which is a Chinese vaccine. And uh, heterologous booster with mRNA vaccine is actually was very good and resulted in significantly high antibody results, responses as did, as did homologous uh, booster. But uh, we found that overall the Sinopharm uh, vaccine was lower, but uh, boosting was therefore better with the Covishield which, uh, and the uh, mRNA vaccine. Covishield is the AstraZeneca uh, similar vaccine. And uh, my antibody titer is actually, even now I got them checked, it is over 37,000, very good neutralizing antibody because I've had infection, I've had four doses of the vaccine and I've also, so my responses remain very high. I'm quite sure that I'm being boosted by exposure to the lab also. And uh, we've also looked at the effectiveness. You may remember some of you that we were not allowed to carry out any vaccine trials. So we actually returned $15 million to uh, companies that wanted trials in Dhaka. So we actually returned the money, but we did a test negative design of vaccination. And we found that uh, uh, we looked at three vaccines that were being given at that time and people who came back with disease. And we found that the Moderna vaccine at that time, we didn't have Pfizer vaccine, enough people with Pfizer vaccine at that time. And we found that Moderna vaccine prevented against all types of symptomatic COVID-19 disease, but uh, all other three vaccines, Covishield, Moderna, and Sinopharm, protected against uh, severe disease. So that's a good point over here, that uh, actually it's hospitalization is what we want to uh, do. And a little bit about dengue, and uh, we know what is happening in the country. The numbers have increased because every day there's 15 more people dying and number case numbers increasing. So this is a very terrible thing that is happening that we're seeing all over the world in Latin America, but also in Bangladesh. And we have not seen so much dengue from 2000 when it first appeared and what we are seeing now in 2023. And this is a problem that we are talking about everywhere. And uh, this is also something that uh, needs to be discussed more and about vaccination. Since I'm a person with vaccine, we are going to discuss it at NITAC and in other places. And uh, it's endemic in 100 countries and, um, and 3.1 million cases in the America region. So that nobody spared from the mosquito bite. And so that is something and, um, and serious consideration is being given to vaccine. Uh, there are two licensed vaccines. Um, not, uh, and SAGE has just given a rec recommendation for the second vaccine, which is the Takeda vaccine for six to 16 months uh, age group. 2nd October, this has come out. There's another vaccine um, uh, of, uh, of a tetravalent, all are tetravalent vaccines, and this vaccine actually is, uh, has been tested 005 in Bangladesh in a phase one, phase two study, and we may need to work on vaccination in Bangladesh, and we are considering it, but uh, we do not have, um, this, uh, this vaccine has been used in uh, Indonesia, in Brazil, and is going to be a trial in India, but uh, we are looking forward to seeing what we can do in Bangladesh. Uh, I could not leave it without talking about HPV, because that's something that is so close to us, being women. It is uh, uh, a major, uh, of the two cancers most frequently seen in women, breast cancer and cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is only second to breast cancer. And so there are many deaths, and uh, um, in Bangladesh, it is the second most common cause. 60 million uh, women aged 15 and above are at risk. First exposure is the exposure, and we are a very conservative family, and we cannot talk about exposure. So we talk about, con uh, we talk about cervical cancer. And so of the people who have cervical cancer, 50% of them die. 
because they are diagnosed very late, not at early stage. And um, so it's also something that has a probability of increasing more in our country. And so the government has initiated from 2nd October the HPV vaccination campaign, of which we are all a part. And the problem is this, that um, uh, we had a demonstration project in 2017. It took time for the vaccine to come to Bangladesh. But uh, um, in my thoughts, it's a vaccine that uh, uh, needs to be, the awareness needs to be created because we don't see the disease. We don't see COVID, we don't see di diarrhea, we don't see fever. And how do you tell a person to get the, take the uh, HPV vaccine for, produce, for a prevention of a disease that comes 20 years or 15 years later? So this is something that we are to, doing um, more at Aideshi to understand working with the API to reduce the knowledge gap regarding HPV, carrying pre-awareness, vaccination, that will be carried out by EPI and then following it. Now we know that two million children, over two million children will be given the HPV vaccine in Bangladesh. School girls five to nine in classes and uh, outside um, 10 to 14 years of age. So let us see what we can do to decrease any hesitancy that comes with this disease and to create the awareness about cervical cancer, which uh, is very much needed. And last but not least, it's MR, antimicrobial resistance, which I think is uh, the most worst pandemic that we can fear. And we think uh, that there will be uh, 4.95 million deaths per year with 1.2 million deaths directly attributed to MR. But the, the numbers that are estimated by the UN is 10 million deaths can be caused by superbugs and antimicrobial resistance. And the amount of dollars needed to prevent this is 3.4 trillion. We didn't even think about that in terms of um, COVID. So this is a holistic approach has to be taken to this. And uh, so we have uh, many plans in Bangladesh. Uh, we have to work with, uh, there's a five-year national action plan to contain AMR. New OP is coming up. A lot of effort is giving, being given on AMR stewardship, AMR stewardship, uh, surveillance and uh, curtailing use of AMR all over the country, but have you ever thought that vaccines are actually a tool for preventing diseases and therefore preventing the use of antibodies? At least for two of the diseases that I talked about, we can think of this. And so this is something that we have to go on. And I, I think disease X, we know that with the pandemics coming, the disease X is looming, even with, with and without AMR. And according to the new report that has come out, from uh, the Washington Post, September 27th, it, there is a number of different diseases, hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, Marmuk disease virus, and Rivari, Zika, Hennepavirus, cholera, typhoid, and also what about dengue. People say it's not an epidemic, but it is a major concern. Look at us, we're all hiding under mosquito nests and putting on so many ointments. I'm just so afraid. One little bite and then it's over. But also, it is a cause of Zika and other, um, other diseases. So the World Bank has created a new fund for pandemic prevention. And a WHO hub has been created. And a global center for pandemic therapeutics has been created. So with that, we can go forward. And whatever I've said today is what is happening globally and in Bangladesh with the large group of collaborators in Bangladesh and all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Dr. Kadri. Dr. Kadri, one moment. Sorry. Um, Dr. Mantu would like to give you a give you a, a token of our appreciation. Excuse me. That's all a bit awkward. We'll do better next time. And thank you so much. Next, we're going to uh, start talking about TB. Dr. Parvati Nair, if you can make your way to the stage. So, um, we have a session now dedicated to tuberculosis. Um, and through this session, we aim to, aim to bring the relevant key stakeholders together on a common platform to brainstorm 
over current program operations, evaluate the achievements made until now, and the challenges that need to be addressed to successfully eliminate this public health challenge. We'll hear from several experts in this field. <clears throat> Each presenter will have 20 minutes, and we urge all the presenters to be mindful of the scheduled time. We're running 10 minutes behind time at the moment already. That's my fault. Um, we will take questions after all the presentations are done. But I'd like to ask Dr. Parvati Nair to come forward and to introduce the people that she will be chairing. Dr. Parvati Nair, sorry. <laughs> is, I have to go back okay. to my other. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Parvati Nair is a medical doctor with over a decade of experience in the, in the world of tropical medicine. And she's been working for MSF since 2014, uh, a lot in TB and infectious diseases. And she currently leads the implementation of the Global Health and Humanitarian Medicine course for South Asia. And it's a course that provides uh, high quality postgraduate education to medical doctors working in resource limited settings. I hand over to you, Dr. Parvati. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, for that kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege and a pleasure to chair the first abstract presentation of the day especially since it's on TB, which is a subject very dear to my heart. So the WHS has told us that um, TB is currently the 13th leading cause of death worldwide and is the leading infectious killer. It was the, the leading infectious killer now once. Now it's COVID, which is the leading infectious killer, but it's the second one. So, but did you know that it's the oldest contagious disease uh, which has been known to affect humans with the disease being seen in 4,000 old mummies? So that's how long we've had to deal with it. But uh, interestingly enough, the first TB drug was uh, discovered in the 1940s. And then for two decades, we had drugs, different drugs which were di discovered, which were then used for drug sensitive TB. But then uh, we had a long uh, period in between a lull. And of course, during this time, as with all antibiotics, resistance developed. And in the early 90s and in the 2000s, we've lost many patients to DRTB and sometimes to the very toxic treatment. So uh, six long decades after rifampicin was, uh, uh, was discovered came the new drug, bedaquiline. And it brought hope and more importantly, a paradigm shift in the treatment of DRTB, because now you had shorter all oral regimens, which were only six months, when earlier it was 18 to 24 months. And so that's why we have new regimens like BPALM, for example. So, but now we are facing the possibility of losing this game-changing drug, and that's what Dr. Pramila will discuss in her presentation about bedaquiline and linezolid resistance in Mumbai. But before we go further, how did we get to that anyway? So one of the ways for resistance to develop is when patients, uh, or really, let's say, a lack of adherence to the prescribed reg regimen. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, like 10 days of antibiotics in itself is difficult enough. But when you have six to 18 months of adhering to a regimen, it becomes even more difficult. And so for this, a very important part of this is patient support. And um, Sonali Bhattacharji and Dr. Drishti Dulani will guide us through this when they discuss the influence of comprehensive support strategy on treatment follow-up, treatment and follow-up compliance in the NTB trials in India. But for the, and then we have two more presentations which take us a step back on the continuum of care for TB. And it, first we go to the diagnosis of the disease. So a lot of us know about TB of the lungs, which is commonly called pulmonary TB. But 15% of all cases are extrapulmonary, that means it's TB outside the lungs. And Martin Okonji will, discu will discuss this in his presentation on the results of lymph node sample testing uh, with gene expert NDRTB cartridges and the implications of this for the diagnostic algorithm in Papua New Guinea. But before we even collect samples, we do screening. And uh, how we do this and what we have to do over here is uh, look and see which cases require further investigation. And uh, this was once done solely with x-rays, but modern technology has revolutionized this. And we have 
um, to, we have an artificial based triage tool called uh, for computer aided detection for TB which is recommended by the WHO for screening possible TB patients. So last but definitely not the least, Dr. Trisha Tadani walks us through the MSF operational experience of using CAD for TB for active case dis detection in, in an MSF project in Tondo, Philippines. Her presentation also speaks about the feasibility and acceptability of this innovative tool amongst healthcare workers and provides sound advice and implementation based on her real life experience. So uh, all in all, we have a wealth of knowledge and experience in the presentations which come up. So uh, now I hand over to Dr. Pramila, uh, Dr. Pramila Singh, who's a medical activity manager from MSF Mumbai since 2012, who will talk, to, talk us through her presentation on bedacolin linezolid resistance. Over to you, Pramila. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parvati, for the introduction. So, the presentation. Okay. I was a bit coughing, so I just... Sorry, while we're, while we're waiting for the presentation to be uh, 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 put up, I'm sorry about the delay. Um, we did not allow for any questions at the end of the keynote speaker uh, 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 talk. Um, but if you have questions, they can be asked uh, if the people are still present, and if not, uh, online as well. Thank you very much. Are we ready now with the presentation, please? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. So we start with the presentation. The topic which I'm going to present today is high prevalence of bedacolin and linozolid resistance in extensively drug resistant tuberculosis patients in Medicine San Frontiers Clinic of Mumbai, India. So before we start with the topic of high prevalence of bedacolin and linozolid, I would like to provide an overview of the MSF clinic which is functioning in Mumbai. So MSF clinic has been functioning uh, in Mumbai since 2006 and it has been providing treatment to HIV patients, uh, co-infected patients and now the project is focusing mainly towards drug resistant tuberculosis. Since 2015, uh, MSF clinic has been uh, the DRTB referral center for complex case management. These cases who need, um, who, are, who, have been, uh, who have passed long exposures and extremely drug resistance and cannot be treated under the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program are referred to MSF clinic. These patients have limited treatment options and have failed under the program. So this is uh, how the MSF clinic is catering to the needs of complex DRTB patients. Uh, now moving on to the background, um, as we know uh, that India is high in DRTB burden and it is estimated that the um, global, of, uh, global MDRTB population, it, cater, it is quarter of the global MDRTB population 
and WHO, WHO has classified bedaculin and linozolid as group A drugs uh, for the bedaculin based regimens and it also forms the part of shorter and longer bedaculin based regimens. Uh, the drug has been registered in countries since 2016. However, the exact prevalence of bedaculin resistance is still unknown. There has been systematic reviews and there has been 13 studies including in India on acquired bedaculin resistance which reports 2.2% of phenotypic and 4.4% of genotypic resistance among patients who have been treated with bedaculin based regimens. Also there has been meta-analysis which provides the pooled frequency of linozolid resistance among drug resistant tuberculosis isolates which shows the, which, which shows the resistant pattern of 4.2%. This highlights that there is emergence of resistant to bedaculin and knowing the status of bedaculin is important as it, is, as it results in difficulties in constructing the regimens because it is commonly associated with unsuccessful treatment outcomes. Uh, there are two objectives of this study. First is to determine the proportion of bedaculin and linozolid resistance in patients who had previously failed on bedaculin and linozolid based regimens and their household contacts who are diagnosed with DRTB. The second objective is among the patients with bedaculin and or linozolid resistance. First is to describe the social demographic and clinical characteristics to de determine the duration of exposure and resistance to bedaculin and linozolid. And third is to de describe the treatment outcomes. Now moving on to the methodology, uh, the study was conducted at MSF DRTB clinic, Mumbai, India. It is a retrospective descriptive study and the study period is from December 2020 to February 2022. The BDQ and the linozolid samples are sent to a nationally accredited lab. Linozolid DST is, is under the part of the national tuberculosis uh, algorithm. However, bedaculin DST is still not part of the NTP algorithm. The study population is bedaculin and linozolid exposed uh, adolescent and adult patients who are referred to and treated in the MSF clinic with suspected or confirmed failure and also the household contacts of BDQ exposed patients diagnosed with drug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, the table on the right side uh, shows um, the table on the right side shows uh, the patient flow in MSF clinic. So all the patients who are diagnosed with bedaculin and, lino and linozolid resistance are treated with salvage regimen which consists of delamanin, carbapenem and with or without bedaculin. Now moving on to the results. So from December 2020 to February 2022, 88 culture positive samples were subjected to bedaculin and linozolid drug susceptibility testing. Except for the two household contacts, all the patients were bedaculin exposed. And we have seen almost 27 patients were resistant to bedaculin, linozolid, or both out of 88 patients who were subjected to bedaculin and linozolid DST. In this, when we see the resistant pattern, we see that uh, 12 patients out of 88 were subjected to bedaculin, were, uh, were bedaculin resistant, 7 were linozolid resistant, and we see that 8 out of 88 patients were both bedaculin and linozolid resistant. In such cases where we have resistant to both important new drugs, it becomes difficult to form an effective regimen. So now moving on to the demographic and the clinical characteristics of bedaculin linozolid and the concomitant bedaculin linozolid resistant cohort. What we see is a young cohort with equal proportions of male and female, specifically on patients who are bedaculin resistant and a higher proportion in bedaculin plus higher proportion of male in bedaculin plus linozolid resistance and higher proportion among female under linozolid resistance. What we see, the vast majority of patients had bilateral and cavitatory lesions. We see that the mean exposure to bedaculin is 6 months and to linozolid is 16 months. Most of the patients are pulmonary TB. Coming on to the results and the outcome of the patients, out of the 27 patients who were resistant to bedaculin, two refused, uh, two refused treatment, hence 25 patients were started on treatment. Out of 25 patients who were started on treatment, two were successfully completed treatment. One is cured and uh, one is uh, completed treatment. Twelve has died uh, during the course of time. Six failed treatment, one was lost to follow up and four patients are still on treatment. 
Of the four patients who are still on treatment, three are culture converted and one is still culture positive after three months of treatment. When we analyze our cohort, what we have seen that we have high proportion of unfavorable outcomes among these resistant cohort. And the unfavorable outcomes can be attributed to past long exposures, comorbidities, extensive lung disease, bilateral and cavitatory disease, and also late refers to the MSF clinic. Okay. Coming on to the conclusion, what we conclude is that there is high proportion of bedacoline and linozolid resistance in patients who have previously failed on bedacoline and linozolid based regimens. Also, there has been high mortality and un unsuccessful outcomes in treating such difficult to case, difficult to treat patients. This, need, this highlights the need of increased programmatic access to BDQ DST for early diagnosis of BD, BDQ resistance. There's also a need to establish a systematic surveillance of bedacoline and linozolid resistance with a need for individualized treatment regimens based on DST, exposure history, adverse drug reactions, comorbidity profile with optimized clinical and laboratory follow-up. There is also a limitation to this study that MSF clinic is a tertiary and a sentinel center which has access to BDQ DST and it provides uh, treatment to all the patients with extensive and advanced resistant profile. However, this data cannot be correlated to the larger slum population and even the population which we are functioning in. But this data also provides a very valuable information and concern about the emerging resistant trends in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pramila, especially since you've saved us a bit of time there. Uh, for, the next, uh, for the next presentation, I will have two people presenting. One is uh, Dr. Drishti Dulani, who is the med medical coordinator of the NTB trials in India. And the other one is Sunal ba Sunali Bhattacharji, who is a psychologist, counselor, educator, currently in the sexual and gender-based violence based in Delhi, India. They will be presenting online. Over to you, Dr. Drishti and Sunali. Hi, I'd like to confirm if I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, we can't hear you, Dr. Drishti. Thank you. Hi, I'd, I'd like, like to, to confirm, confirm if this is now better. better? Yes, please. thank order? you. Okay. 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 Um, so, hi, good, good morning, morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Dr. Dr. Dishti, and, and I'll be presenting with my co-author, Sonali Bhattacharya, today. today. Uh, we, will we will be discussing a quantitative study wherein we attempted, attempted to understand rates of compliance of participants enrolled in NTB clinical trials between September 2020 and uh, March 2023 in India. I will also speak on behalf, behalf of uh, my co-author, Dr. Dwarvich. So as, as we know, MSF today, today is the largest uh, NGO globally, globally providing tuberculosis treatment and has recently ventured into clinical trials space in an attempt to generate evidence for all oral, shorter, and more tolerable regimens for TB. Their trial, TB Practical, recently pu pu sorry, published their results, and um, NTB is expected to do the same in the next two years. Since our study has, uh, was rooted in the NTB trials, I'd like to give an overview of the study design for better context. So NTB clinical trials collectively refers to two trials, NTB and NTBQ. These are randomized controlled phase three trials to test more effective treatment options for MDRTB. So in India, these trials operate out of the IN2 site located in Maharashtra, Aunches Hospital in Pune, and we have a satellite clinic in Mumbai, ME Squad, in collaboration with the uh, National AIDS Research Institute of India, NARI. Two teams of doctors, nurses, and counselors were responsible for management of a total of 168 MDRTB patients across these two cities. Um, 
okay adherence to medication and follow up is a fundamental part of the outcomes of these trials therefore to support compliance we incorporated a few incorporated a few strategies to reduce the known barriers to treatment i'll discuss a few of the components going ahead the aim of this present study was to quantitatively assess the influence of these patient support strategies on adherence to both treatment and consecutive follow up these are the few strategies we focused on i'll be discussing about the medical management since medical management was one of our primary concerns uh, given that patient provider relationship is a crucial is crucial in ensuring access to treatment to break it down a little more we focused mainly on these four aspects we prioritized early detection of drug side effects adverse events and comorbidities like diabetes and hiv initial frequent visits uh, ensured good rapport building between the staff and participants a helpline number to run 24 by 7 was by a nurse or a doctor actually help the participants to report any distress almost immediately we also facilitated all tertiary care referrals from setting up the appointment to having an on-site doctor speak to specialists participants had access to three tertiary care hospitals across these two cities where opd and ipd management care was provided use of smartphones also allowed participants to conveniently and instantly share in any medical records if it was warranted mental health care was made a part of each visit from the beginning psychoeducation was emphasized and reinforced mental health screening tools were periodically used counseling was available at every visit keeping in mind the stigma surrounding mental health in india when needed an external psychiatric consultation were optionally available via video call at the site or in person as preferred by the participant sonali will now discuss the remaining strategies uh hi good morning uh, just to confirm again uh, am i audible hello yes you are at the okay okay thank you so much uh yeah good morning uh, just to take it further from what uh, drishti talked about uh, i'll be talking about drug dispensation as part of our strategies Uh, we wanted to ensure that understanding how to take drugs uh, was easy for the participants uh, we therefore used uh, these blister packs uh, they look similar to pill boxes now each blister pack holds about 7 days of medication uh, and each intake is separately marked according to date and day as you can probably see in the first image uh, morning and evening doses were also separately marked so uh, the time of each dose was also given now uh for each day treatment was to be taken exactly as given drugs were dispensed monthly so uh, uh, four of these blisters these blister packs were available in english as well as in hindi and marathi the two, two most used uh, regional languages for the study uh, can we move to the next slide yeah uh, along with these blister packs to track intakes uh, these dot cards were also attached with the blister itself uh, this is a paper based directly observed treatment or dot monitoring treatment supporters were identified from within each participant social group with their input and then trained to correctly fill and sign these dot cards daily as the example portrays uh, each intake is separately marked with an x and uh, a missed dose is marked with a zero the time of the doses were also noted and uh, it was finally signed or initialed by the treatment supporter there's also a little space at the uh, at the end Uh, to write any comments uh, regarding you know side effects or uh, the reason for missing any intake these cards were checked weekly or at least monthly after a point during adherence counseling at the site these dot cards were also available in hindi and marathi in addition to english uh next moving on to appointment scheduling uh, we uh, since this is a trial uh, follow up within the trial was charted out as per protocol and to ensure better compliance uh, we worked with the participants to enable planning ahead uh, image 9 will show you the structure of the ntb follow up uh, our tracking tool uh, the clinical visit calculator which is in image 11 let us predict a window of days for each visit for up to 2 years as well as the exact dates of end of treatment for each participant Uh, each participant was also given an appointment card and the next appointment was scheduled at each clinical visit a week or about a month in advance as per a participant's convenience 
flexibility within the window also allowed us to reschedule in case needed for certain visits especially during the covid-19 pandemic we also enabled a uh, telephonic follow ups for the doctor and counselor for participants who were unable to physically visit the site uh, participants were reminded of their appointments a day ahead via either text message or phone calls Uh, moving on to the methods, uh, our sample comprised of 117 participants enrolled uh, from either trial from 2020 to 2023. Uh, we included all participants who had completed the entire prescri prescribed treatment, irrespective of its duration. This data was then retrospectively analyzed. Okay, so as uh, I already previously stated, we assessed for both rates of compliance to treatment as well as follow up. Uh, missing an entire day's treatment was considered uh, a missed dose or day. For assessing compliance to follow up, uh, we referred to WHO's guideline of successfully completing at least six months of monthly follow up post completion of treatment. Uh, so coming to results, in our sample, uh, referring to figure one here, uh, 104 participants, that is about 88.9% completed treatment without missing a single. a uh, day of medication we also incidentally found an almost equivalent performance across both genders 7.7% missed uh, between 1 and 5 days of treatment and only 2.5% had missed more than 5 days of treatment uh referring to figure 2 85% uh, 85 participants or about 73% successfully completed at least 6 months of post treatment follow up 9% had missed at least uh, 9% had missed at least one appointment in the 6 period For 21 participants, or about 18% of the participants, a uh, six-month follow-up was not yet completed at the time of this study, and therefore is not included in the data. Uh, moving to conclusions, uh, based on these results, we concluded that uh, context-specific designs are effective as support strategies. These strategies specifically work to reduce research barriers to adherence in tuberculosis treatment based on principles of harm reduction. We inferred several points from these findings. Uh, for one, we noted that the use of blister packs with dot cards reduced personal factors like forgetfulness and helped participants, supporters, and healthcare workers easily monitor each drug intake by increasing visualization. Bringing in training and psychoeducating treatment supporters helped to curb some stigma surrounding TB and strengthen social support. We found that tracking tools and appointment reminders were helpful to set goals and help participants visualize the entire roadmap of treatment thus they were better prepared for what's to come we also saw an increased acceptance of mental health care when multifold access was provided along with psychoeducation especially via the video call approach uh, participants reported feeling supported and heard when common logistical barriers were reduced as a whole in implementing these strategies we noted better rapport and more trust between healthcare staff and participants and therefore subsequently an overall positive environment of care uh, to discuss a few limitations of both the present study as well as of the components used in the support strategy uh, we like to urge that it is prudent to keep in mind demographics of the target population itself in implementing any strategy such as uh, i'm sorry yeah such as um, just give me a second sorry i lost my place completely yeah uh yeah we would like to urge that it is prudent to keep in mind demographics of the target population in implementing any strategy uh, such as so social support uh, literacy or general life schedules uh establishing a causal relationship between the variables was beyond the scope of our study and more research may be required uh, to qualitatively assess uh, the efficacy of each component Uh, comparative studies may further shed light on the two impact on compliance as well as impact on patients being treated outside a clinical trial setup or in a larger population okay uh, as a closing thought uh, mdr tb is a rising concern globally uh, even as attempts to make treatment easier are ongoing it is crucial that adherence be factored in as an equally important component of achieving successful outcomes and we strongly recommend taking proactive steps to improve treatment compliance uh, the current no do gap as in how much we know about the barriers to chronic treatment uh, versus what we're doing to reduce them is still immense 
Similar low cost interventions as is discussed today with a patient centric approach is the need of the hour. It is possible to modify existing infrastructure to be more accessible and flexible. A participatory approach with a greater community involvement and a focus on increasing patient empowerment can reduce the burden on an overwhelmed healthcare system, especially in low and middle income countries. Technology is everywhere and its creative use to reduce barriers to treatment uh, seems like the next logical step in addressing this implementation gap. Uh, that'll be all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the people that made this study possible. Uh, our heartfelt thanks foremost goes out to our participants without whom uh, not just this study, but uh, NDB trials itself would not be possible. Uh, we're grateful also for the continued support and guidance of Dr. Sandeep Patel. Uh, we note with gratitude his input in structuring this data and study, as well as from Dr. Lorenzo and Dr. Michael. We're also grateful to the entire team at NDP Clinical Trials India. A special note of thanks for Dr. Dorgesh N, who could not be present with us today, uh, but without his contribution, the study would have remained an intangible idea. Thank you again and have a great day. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sonali, and thank you, Dr. Drishti. We will be taking presentations at the end of all, I mean, questions at the end of all presentations. So uh, the next speaker is Martin Okonji. Martin Okonji is a medical laboratory technologist working with MSF as a lab referent in, op uh, in laboratory referent laboratory services in Operation Center Paris under the Asia region. Uh, over to you, Martin. As mentioned, my name is Martin Okonji. I am medical. Could you put it in presentation mode, please? Oh, yes. This. Go ahead. So, so my name, name as, as mentioned, mentioned, is Martin Okonji. I'm medical technologist by training, working with MSF uh, France since uh, 2003. I am actually been working in different contexts in Africa, Middle East, and of course, currently, as mentioned in Asia. So I'm here to present to you on the topic of uh, lymph node results that we compared with the sputum samples in Papua New Guinea, PNG. As uh, mentioned, the uh, MSF has supported, of course, the PNG National Tuberculosis Pro Program in PNG since the year 2008. We did, we did, uh, the next slide. Okay, so WHO recommends uh, ULTRA as the first diagnostic test uh, for presumptive tuberculosis. The ULTRA can also be used to diagnose resistance to rifampicin. The expert XDR uh, cartridges, which uses the XDR cartridges, is also a new follow-up test that can be used to identify second-line drugs which are used to treat uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis. It is therefore necessary to incorporate uh, non-sputum samples, uh, like in this case, uh, fine needle aspirate samples, especially for children and people presented, presenting with the extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Because there is little evidence that is documented in testing such non-sputum samples. So our objectives during this study was actually to compare the results of sputum and lymph node samples using MTB, RIF, and MTB XDR with a view to highlighting the feasibility of improving diagnosis of extrapulmonary tuberculosis, and of course, uh, especially among children 
and people presenting with the extra pulmonary tuberculosis, EPTB. During this study, we met the criteria for retrospective analysis. And uh, so we, we actually received the exemption for formal ethics review from the MSF uh, medical director. On our methods, uh, we, we actually did a retrospective uh, data analysis. So we did analysis of our samples that were also collected according to MSF uh, laboratory standard operating procedures, which we set uh, during the beginning of the project. So all patients uh, that had XDR uh, samples, we, we, we tested all patients with XDR except the patients who also had a, a positive uh, sputum result. So anybody that had a positive sputum result, we actually did not test uh, their samples for XDR with XDR cartridges. On our results, one third of, our, of the FDA samples that we tested actually tested MTB positive using ULTRA. And out of these 7%, which represented the 57 out of the 782 samples that were positive, tested resistant to rifampicin. And one quarter of sputum samples, that is 26%, representing 1,140 out of uh, 4,319 were MTB positive with ULTRA. And from this, 5.6% had rifampicin resistance detected uh, in the results. So in our conclusions, In our conclusions, we noticed high rates of TB detection and also rifampicin resistance detection from lymph node samples with ultra cartridges and XDR cartridges. Lymph node samples, therefore, can be used on MTB rifampicin or MTB ref to increase TB diagnosis. And also, it can also be used in identifying DRTB. Lymph node samples can be tested with XDR to improve DRTB management by identifying the drugs which are used for DRTB treatment. Children, of course, and other uh, extra pulmonary patients or people presenting with EPTB can benefit if their results, if their samples are used for testing. On limitations, as you can notice that we only did a retrospective data analysis. And also we never included all the other extra pulmonary samples like uh, stool, CSF, uh, effusions and, and biopsies. Finally, we would like to highly appreciate uh, the patients uh, whose samples were tested during the study period. We are also grateful to the, the National Tuberculosis Program of uh, PNG, who actually supported uh, the initiative since the beginning of the project. We are grateful to all the lab staff and all the other staff who are involved directly or indirectly during the entire patient management. And of course, finally, I want to thank the audience for listening to this present presentation, wherever you are. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. We will be taking questions at the end uh, when after all presenters have finished. So our next presenter is Dr. Trisha Tadani. She is a medical doctor with a background in anthropology and with a primary interests of public health, community medicine, and infectious diseases. Over to you, Trisha. 
Hello and good morning, everyone. All right, All right. so I, I am Dr. Trisha Tadani, and I'll be presenting on the implementation and the feasibility of digital chest X-ray coupled to computer-aided detection in tuberculosis active case finding in Tondo, Manila, Philippines. For our context, MSF is currently conducting screening for active TB in Tondo, Manila to strengthen TB case finding and linkage to care. Tondo is a high-density, low-income area where a third of the population are extremely poor. Here, the MSF team conducts active case finding, or ACF, around the catchment areas of four local health centers. For a brief background, in 2021, the WHO recommended the use of computer-aided detection, or CAD, in place of human readers for TB screening and triage among people aged 15 and above. CAD's performance was evaluated and was found to perform as well as radiologists. However, its accuracy may vary according to the population, and this is why local calibration is necessary to decide on a threshold that's adapted to your context. So how does CAD work? A digital chest x-ray is obtained and the image is then processed by the software. CAD then produces an abnormality score from 0 to 100, with a higher score indicating a greater likelihood of having TB. A heat map is also available, using colors to pinpoint lesions suggestive of TB. The set threshold score is then applied to the CAD score to identify the patients who need confirmatory testing. In our project, we use the gene expert on the patient's sputum to confirm the diagnosis of TB. So, if a participant undergoes a chest x-ray and their CAD score is above the threshold, then they're sent for gene expert testing. If their CAD score is below the threshold, no expert is done. The study aims to describe and assess the feasibility of implementing CAD with digital chest x-ray for screening in a challenging context, including the documentation of the CAD threshold calibration. If found to be feasible, chest x-ray with CAD could be integrated into broader algorithms for TB screening and triage, opening up larger scale operational possibilities, such as the use of mobile diagnostics for active case finding. This study was approved by the MSF Ethics Review Board and by the University of the Philippines Manila Research Ethics Board. For our methods, we conducted a prospective description of the programmatic activities. And in the quantitative part, our study population includes participants greater than or equal to 15 years old who were screened with a TB symptom screen, test x-ray with CAD, and gene expert testing for those with a CAD score equal to or above the threshold. For the qualitative aspect, we did a mixed methods assessment of the feasibility and the acceptability of CAD among the healthcare workers who used it, the participants who were screened with it, community leaders, and the key stakeholders of Tondo. And this was done through individual interviews, focus group discussions, and direct observation. For the perspective description of the programmatic activities, there are more scientifically rigorous methods for the threshold calibration, such as the toolkit from the WHO but these can be very intensive, require a lot of time and resources, and aren't practical for many contexts. This is why we took on a more pragmatic approach. This was done by communicating with the experts and the manufacturer, and by doing reactive adjustment, where we started from a much lower threshold. We did this by looking at the positivity rate of our gene expert before we implemented CAD, the testing capacity of our own gene expert machine, and our own radiologist sensitivity and guidance. From here, we decided on an initial threshold of 25, where 35% of our participants at the ACF were referred for gene expert testing. After a few weeks, the threshold was increased to 28, and this corresponded to 34% of our participants being referred for expert testing, and this is compatible with our machine's testing capacity. So for the screening algorithm, participants undergo TB symptom screening with X-ray and CAD. If they have no symptoms and their CAD score is below 28, no further action is done. However, if they have a positive symptom screen and a CAD score below 28, or a CAD score above or equal to 28 regardless of their symptoms, they are sent for sputum testing for gene expert. The chest x-rays of the participants with the CAD scores equal to or above the threshold were also reviewed by the radiologist on site. And if warranted, they were referred for further evaluation by a doctor. For those who have a negative gene expert, no further action is taken. But if the expert result is positive, then they are referred for, gene, uh, for TB treatment and household contact investigation. 
Here we have a participant being screened uh, with our x-ray truck uh, in our active case finding. And to the right, you have another aspect of the project, the patient support team conducting household contact investigation among uh, uh, exposed to positive uh, TB positive patients. For our preliminary results, this was gathered from January to May of this year. We screened a total of 4,800 people and 34% had a CAD score that is above or equal to the threshold. From these, we've sent a total of 1,919 samples for gene expert testing. Of the 1,900, 250 came back positive. So among all of our patients that we've screened, 5% had a uh, gene expert positive result. Um, among all patients tested with expert, this is 13%. And among all patients with a CAD score equal to or above 28, the expert positivity rate is at 15%. Here we can see the expert positivity rate according to the CAD score. Most sputum samples were collected for patients with CAD scores in the 28 to 39 range. And while we do have a few participants with CAD scores in the 80s to 90s, their expert positivity rates are at 59 and 62% respectively. And although lower CAD scores do have lower expert positivity rates, had we used a recommended threshold of 50 by the manufacturer, we would have missed 35 or 14% of our detected TB cases. Moving on to the feasibility, acceptability, and the practical aspects of implementing CAT in the Philippines. A key component of this implementation was piloting a pragmatic approach to selecting the threshold based on the context as a currently recommended calibration relies on access to large sets of x-rays, and this isn't available in many settings. The calibration used a pragmatic mixed methods approach, drawing on both quantitative and qualitative data to ensure that the initial threshold set and the subsequent adjustments were feasible, acceptable, and practical. Feasibility had to take into account the uh, gene expert testing capacity and the daily patient flow through the site. And while this was a very quantitative calculation, it was supported by qualitative findings about the patient needs of this highly mobile population. As one staff member explained, the expert testing capacity is the most important thing because you need to be sure that you have a short turnaround time to get the result to the patient just before they move. Qualitative findings around the user acceptability also had to be considered for the calibration of CAD. As this was a pilot of CAD for MSF, it was new for everyone at every level of the project. Even those coming out to train and support the team were learning about CAD's capabilities throughout the process. Additionally, while studies on CAD showed it performed as well as human readers, the case-to-case -case discrepancies in the uh, field still impact the user perceptions of CAD's efficacy. And as one team, team member reported, on a scale of 1 to 100, I have a confidence of around 70 because there are some cases where that uh, look CAD negative, but they can clearly see that there's something there. Taking user acceptability into account though, the team decided to begin with the most conservative threshold that was feasible in order to maximize sensitivity. Simultaneously, they were supporting the team with hands-on training in situ and collecting quantitative data on gene expert positivity rates alongside qualitative comparisons of CAD versus the radiologist readings, particularly of X-rays that had CAD scores just above or below the threshold. This allowed the team to experience and become familiar with the results when they rely on CAD and to predict the impacts of changing the threshold. Following this, reactive adjustments are done based on the data that has been collected and team discussions, and this contributed to the user acceptability of CAD. As one staff member stated, I think the current setup is doing okay, but let's see if there's gonna be any more discrepancies and then maybe we should adjust the threshold depending on the data that we're getting. Along with calibration, there were findings on the feasibility and the acceptability of using CAD. The feasibility of using the software requires dedicated HR with a technical capacity to support not just the installation of CAD, as well as data management, but the X-ray installation and maintenance, as well as the specificities of the truck and its logistics. As described by a team member, CAD has to have a high quality digital test X-ray. And in the same truck, this was a, a huge problem that provided a lot of logistical challenges. So we need HR with a technical capacity to follow up. There should be someone in the projects from the beginning that is fully accountable for this. Also, to ensure that CAD is feasible for a TB screening project, 
users identified the need for good training and knowledge about the limitations intrinsic to CAD so that their personal practice and the project design could compensate for these limitations. So, for example, if we have a pleural effusion, CAD won't read that. In that case, we still need the radiologist. And it's not an error of the software, but we do have to consider this because it might be a problem for the circuit. Looking at acceptability regarding the actual hands-on use of CAD, all our project team members found that it significantly increases the screening capacity and reduces bottlenecks. The fast interpretation really helps to move people to detect more patients, especially in a dense population of Tondo. Additionally, it was described as supporting the decision-making across the whole team. As remarked by one team member, even if you don't have much experience with TB, you will still see so much. So when you're making a clinical decision about whether to treat a patient or not, then it's very good assistance. So in conclusion, we found that in Tondo, the first phase of the active face finding campaign has showed a very high TB burden. And chest x-ray coupled with CAT allows us to screen a high number of patients in the community with a much lower turnaround time. However, it's important to note that the CAT threshold calibration needs good data collection before we implement this. And your gene expert testing capacity may influence the threshold you set. And you have to do reactive adjustment, which is a method that you use to adjust the threshold based on the data that you collect. We also found that CAD is a powerful tool for TB screening, but its success depends on some careful planning and key considerations. One, a pragmatic mixed methods calibration process can be effective, but has to carefully consider and balance feasibility, acceptability, and practicality. You'd also need dedicated HR, with the required technical capacity throughout the planning and implementation, and this is critical. And lastly, we've found that the intrinsic limitations of CAD must be well understood and accounted for in the project design. I'd like to acknowledge the following people and institutions without whom this study would not be possible. Thank you very much for listening and good day. Very interesting presentation. And now we take questions. Uh, are there any questions from the room? Okay. Or online? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And firstly, thanks to all the speakers. Such a holistic uh, exposure to TB and its various aspects. I have a very small question for Martin, in fact. Uh, Martin, did I get you right when you said that uh, the biopsy samples were not, did not come positive uh, when you checked them? And you shared which all biopsies uh, had you used from which different organs? So, so during our, yeah. our study, we did we used fine needle aspirates, only fine needle aspirates. We did not use the other biopsies. That was a limitation that we did not use the biopsies and the stool and all the others like that. But we did the fine needle aspirates. So we the prepared last them like all the okay. last okay. slide. The last slide you mentioned, the biopsy, uh, you could not do or the biopsies when you checked, they came negative. Maybe I didn't get that right. About the other samples on the last right, slide? Right. So. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, we did not, not include, in, that was the limitation. We did not use all the other samples like biopsies. We you never tried, tried biopsies, biopsies and they did not come yes. positive. Yes, yes. We, did we did not, not try biopsies. biopsies. That's, 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 that's a limitation. Diffusion, CSF, CSF and stool. stool. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Any other questions in the room or online? Raj. Yep. Uh, thanks. So there is one question online from Dr. Islam uh, from Bangladesh for Dr. Trisha the last presenter, uh, what are some of the compliance or data security issues that were kept in mind when using newer technologies like artificial intelligence? 
Um, unfortunately, I can't speak for many other uh, AI tools that we have. However, as far as CAD, which is the only one I have experience with, this is uh, basically a box where you are connected to a local network. So when we do active case finding, we use CAD, and this is uh, on a local server, and you only have like two to three computer or devices that are connected to this. And this is uh, all we have in terms of the data connectivity. Access to this has also been limited. So the people who configured CAD or calibrated CAD with us at the start, so we have um, the people from the Diagnostic Imaging Working Group, um, they made sure that access was limited to only those who needed it uh, with accounts that were very secure. So I, I'm really sorry, I don't think I can speak for all other uh, AI tools, but this is how we work with CAD. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Rajat, any other questions online? Uh, yes, there's another question. Uh, this is for Dr. Pramila. Are there any newer, shorter treatment regimen trials in the current TB landscape for India? So in India, uh, yes, we have this new BPAL M trial. The study has been finished. Uh, because one of the sites was our own site where we are uh, working in collaboration with the national uh, program in M.E. Ward of Mumbai. And the results will be out soon. So that's been conducted in India. Any more questions in the room? If not, I just have one question for uh, the NTB team, uh, in which you all say that uh, you, you had 7.7% 7 .7 of the patients with who missed less than five days and 2.5% who missed greater than five days. What are the reasons? Are there any uh, connecting factors or anything you all saw? Uh, the number, number one reason, uh, sorry, I'll just hop on really quick and answer the question. Uh, the biggest reason was uh, due to medication uh, side effects and uh, that we quickly managed so it never escalated beyond uh, say a couple of days and uh, I think if Drishti could add on to it because they did most of the management. Yeah, uh, so, so common, common side effects like uh, nausea vomiting were uh, always there. A few participants also uh, had adverse events like uh, constipation and recurrent diarrhea, which is very common with uh, AKT. Uh, I think uh, that have been, uh, we, they were all managed with ancillary medications provided from the clinic. That's why it never escalated beyond uh, a few days. Very much. Uh, I don't think there are any more questions, so I, I'll just wrap this up, session up. Uh, so I just want to mention one quote, which is that TB shaped history, it's the phantom plague. And this, this is a sobering reminder of the effect that TB has had on populations throughout the years, from prehistoric times till now. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that one in three deaths due to antimicrobial resistance, which Dr. Kadri referred to earlier, are due to drug resistant TB. So it's up to all of us to keep the flag flying and the flag fight against TB. And a big thank you to all the presenters for the experience and the innovative strategies that they've, they and their projects have brought to the table uh, and to our patients without whom this none of this would be possible. And thank you for your patient and active listening. Thank you very much, uh, Parvati all the speakers, Camilla here as well, and the people online, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, the next uh, topic before coffee break, it is coming, I promise, um, is a panel discussion. And this uh, panel discussion uh, is on neglected tropical diseases and uh, climate change, and the potential gaps and opportunities for the South Asian scenario. scenario. I invite uh, Dr. Farhat Montu to come up here and uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Farhat is the Executive Director of MSF South Asia. 
with a lot of experience in the field and other positions in India as well. So, shall I call the other people, or are you, you record? Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, we are still energized by the keynote. And can people hear me? Okay. So, uh, this panel discussion specially curated for the day. And there is a reason why I wanted to be a part of it. And I really insisted to be a part of it. Because MSF, also known as Doctors Without Borders, is seeing the impact of climate change day in and day out in 70 countries we work. Although the panel title today here talks about the South Asian scenario, but we all know diseases don't know any borders. So what is happening here today in Bangladesh could be a reality somewhere else, and equally we may not be even aware of it. So what do we want to talk about? So we have specially uh, identified four uh, speakers who do not want to be called specialists but and experts in this area, but we wanted to bring the diversity of uh, perspectives on neglected diseases and the impact of climate. We have uh, two panel members that are uh, in the room, and we will have two panel uh, members who will be joining us online. Even though we are focusing on South Asia, but we do have one panel member joining all the way from Latin America. Um, I would like to see if uh, we have our panel members who are online on the screen. So what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to introduce uh, briefly when each speaker speaks, but I would like to invite our two panel members in the room. Dr. Mahmoud Khalilu Zama and Dr. Kavita Singh. I would request both of you to please come here. And we have Dr. Nilika and Dr. Byron joining us online. And I know it's very early morning or very late in uh, uh, wherever you're joining from. And I think Nilika, you're joining from Sri Lanka. Welcome to the panel. And uh, to start with, I will invite Dr. Uh, Mohammed Khalil Uzama, who is working as, as an associate professor in the Department of Public Health and Informatics at BSMMU, Bangladesh. He has more than 20 years of research experience in environment, health, NCDs, and health service management. Uh, we would like uh, Dr. Zama to give us a tour into the Bangladesh scenario. But before I invite him, I wanted to share statistics with you because numbers speaks for themselves. I recently came across the Bangladesh official count for dengue related deaths in last 23 years. So in last 23 years until the end of last year there were 849 recorded deaths officially. And do you want to know how many deaths there were officially as a count for dengue? related deaths from Jan till September 20th, it is 867. So what happened in last 23 years in terms of mortality, we are just experiencing in the first eight months of 2023. This gives us an indication of how deep the problem is. And Dr. Firdosi in her keynote today alluded to that. And we would like Dr. Zaman to give us uh, more about what is happening in Bangladesh, and what did uh, the government of Bangladesh do to address this issue, and maybe some learnings and some challenges that are there. Over to you. Officer in the Department of Public Health and Informatics, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. And at the beginning, as I told uh, Dr. Farhad, that uh, I'm not an expert in dengue, but uh, as a public health, uh, since I'm in the field of 
public health. So I will try to uh, focus more on the public health issues, uh, concerning issues on dengue. All right. Uh, next slide, please. This one? Okay. Okay. Um, you all know that rapid, rapid urbanization, uh, population density, and climate factors uh, contributing to the increased transmission of uh, dengue virus by the Aedes mosquito, and which leads to uh, some challenges uh, from our perspective, especially in Bangladesh, <coughs> to mit manage and mitigate the impact of dengue surge in Bangladesh. Efforts in vector control, public develop, uh, awareness campaign, and healthcare infrastructure development uh, became very crucial. So Bangladesh uh, observed the largest dengue epidemic in uh, 2019, where one, 179 dengue-related deaths were recorded from more than uh, 100,000 cases. But uh, you can see, as of October 88, it means yesterday, a total of, um, I mean, more than 200,000, 223,564 dengue cases admitted uh, to the hospital, and the number of deaths, dengue-related deaths, is uh, 1,086. It already crossed 1,000. So this is very uh, alarming for us. Uh, I mean, we were talking about 2019, but we are standing in 2023, uh, and it's uh, much bigger than the uh, previous, previous uh, experience. But there is a uh, change in the uh, pattern of dengue. It's a rising trend, but previously dengue was isolated only in urban areas. But in the last three years, uh, dengue has also spread into non-endemic uh, areas, uh, such as the district, uh, district towns. And uh, we are, uh, it's reported that uh, the, I mean, the dengue uh, deaths or the cases both are higher than the uh, rural in rural area than those of the urban area, which previously we thought that urban area is the hub uh, of dengue, but that uh, pattern is also changing. So, um, for dengue control, um, I mean, the Bangladesh government is trying to take necessary steps. For mosquito control activities, they allocated uh, 84.5 crores of Bangladeshi taka to procure necessary equipment uh, for dengue prevention, uh, cleanliness activities, and campaigns. So the government effort is there, but um, whether that is properly distributed or homogeneously uh, activated, that is the question uh, in front of us, because the number of deaths and also the number of cases indicates that there are some lack or uh, lack of coordination uh, in dengue control activities by the government, which the government is leading, but the other organizations are also, also uh, are taking part there. <clears throat> so, the Bangladesh is uh, now facing a number of challenges and barriers um, in managing dengue outbreaks. So I'd like to mention some of those, like the hospitals are overwhelmed with dengue patients and there is shortage of beds and supplies. So uh, it is in the newspapers also we are, uh, we are finding that because of the number of uh, patients in the hospitals, uh, it's very difficult for the physicians or the medical personnel to treat and deal with those uh, number of patients. And there are shifting budgets uh, where homogeneous funding adaptability crucial for sustained control. Um, the funding, it should be ensured not for only for specific uh, dengue season, but throughout the uh, year, uh, which is uh, lacking, we, we can see. And there are fragmented response for, from agencies. Thus, coordinating diverse agencies is another challenge, because only government is not enough to deal uh, this dengue situation. So the other agencies should come forward and there should be a coordinated way. And rapid urbanization along with poor waste management exacerbates mosquito breeding. Um, and you, you can see that the, uh, because uh, the, in the urban area development work is going on and we have, uh, I mean, not properly dealing with those, uh, I mean, lagging of water there uh, and the breeding, mosquito breeding are there, we cannot control uh, because the lack of coordination between the uh, other agencies. And another part is not only for the government, but one um, important part is from our uh, community, so the lack of knowledge uh, in the community about the uh, 
how crucial is their role, that is a lack. So that is also another challenge uh, we are facing in the, uh, dealing with dengue. And rural urban healthcare divide, because uh, that is also impacting, because uh, previously we, were, we thought, I mean, we, it's, it's an urban problem, but now the number of cases is nearly 1.5 times uh, in the rural area than those of in uh, urban area. So they are not, uh, I mean, to some extent, they are not ready to deal like the urban areas. So that is also a challenge uh, to deal uh, or control the dengue in Bangladesh. And an altered climate patterns influence mosquito habitats and changes dengue dynamics. We, all, we can already see, but we, we need to keep this in our mind uh, to control the dengue. And also logistics, information sharing complexities in global outbreak response is uh, another challenge in dealing dengue in Bangladesh. So uh, there are three main reasons for dengue spread. Uh, it's identified favorable uh, temperature, intermittent rainfall and population density unplanned city planning. To stop dengue, um, the control measures should be like a comprehensive policy strategy, appropriate action measures, or uh, a supportive environment, involvement of mass people and dedicated teamwork. These are, uh, I mean, our experts identified uh, these uh, steps to be taken uh, and to uh, to deal uh, dengue in Bangladesh. So uh, that is all from my end. I mean, it's a very brief. I think uh, uh, we can clarify something uh, from the question and answer session too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zama. Uh, at least thanks. Please but uh, reduce hospitalization and all the costs that uh, come with hospitalization. So if you look at, uh, and, and uh, a lot of our governments are saying, you know, uh, it, it, we don't have enough money to, uh, uh, you know, invest in developing a treatment, but then look at the cost that dengue uh, causes in the terms of loss, loss of life, uh, hospitalization, loss of work, and all these indirect costs, and the costs that are allocated for foggy mosquito control activities and other public health uh, yeah, in implementation of other uh, public health, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, programs. So if we have a treatment, uh, we can significantly reduce the burden of dengue and, uh, of course, uh, reduce the cost of dengue. And of course, uh, we have reduced the case fatality rates in many countries because of fluid uh, management. But is that enough? And again, can we do better with the treatment? Uh, uh, by uh, complementing this, and of course, having a safe and effective dengue vaccine. Uh, again, uh, we, uh, uh, for COVID, we have so many vaccines, and we we do have a, a, a dengue vaccine being registered. Again, it it is not it does not provide sterilizing immunity by prevent completely preventing infection, like you see with the measles vaccine. So we need all this uh, integrated strategy with vector control vaccines and dengue uh, to address this rise in burden of dengue because of all the reasons uh, uh, that we know, like climate change, urbanization, and population growth. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nilika, I would like you to stay online because I'm sure after we have all the speakers, uh, there would be questions because we do have equally a good number of people joining us online. So we hope that uh, our speakers are leaving with you lots of questions and food for thought. Moving on, we uh, go to our third speaker for the panel, Dr. Byron Arana. He's the head of CL disease at DNDI. He has over 20 years of experience working on clinical trials and epidemiological studies, mainly in CL, the aerial, and respiratory disease. Over to you, Byron, to share your experiences. Thank you very, very much. much uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, a pleasure and honor to be here uh, today. And good morning for everybody. Uh, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm well, not an expert, I have some experience in, in clinical trials and uh, as a medical doctor, uh, I have experience in, in cutaneous leishmaniasis in particular, uh, and to some extent in visceral leishmaniasis. Uh, I'm not an expert in climate. However, uh, after more than 30 years working on leishmaniasis, uh, I certainly have seen the 
effects that the climate change do in the epidemiology of the disease. And that's uh, some fact that we are, I'm going to, to present here today. So you all are very familiar with leishmaniasis because visceral leishmaniasis is uh, probably the most uh, endemic uh, form, is for sure the most endemic form in the Indian subcontinent. And Bangladesh together with India and Nepal have been very successful in the uh, aiming to eliminate the visceral leishmaniasis as a problem in the region. Uh, this uh, disease, uh, together with visceral cutaneous leishmaniasis, which is the other and probably most prevalent uh, form of the disease uh, worldwide, uh, are very well uh, linked to environmental change, changes, such as deforestation, building of uh, and urbanization, and all of this. Uh, really, uh, every time we see different problems associated with climate change in the epidemiology of the disease. Unfortunately, as many of these uh, neglected tropical diseases, it affects the poorest of the people in, on, on Earth and uh, is prone to outbreaks, as I already mentioned. And even though the number of cases of visceral leishmaniasis is declining in some areas, in particular in the Indian subcontinent, uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis remain as one of the biggest problems. And there has been estimated that there are between 0.7 to 1.2 millions of new cases every year. Next slide, please. So here is uh, uh, used to say that even though in the Indian subcontinent the number of cases are going down for visceral leishmaniasis, the problem is growing in other regions like in Africa, and is becoming a, a right now the the main contributor of the burden of the disease worldwide, and that's why uh, now the efforts to translate the elimination success uh, program in Indian subcontinent to Africa is ongoing. And uh, this we are hoping that in the following uh, years, this will start more formally in Africa as well. The number of cases in Latin America is also decreasing. Uh, however, the lethality there continue to be very high. Cutaneous leishmaniasis, for the contrary, is keep going up and up, and every year there are more and more cases reported. Uh, so acknowledging that the main uh, form to address the problem of leishmaniasis in general is to have an uh, early and quickly uh, diagnostics and treatment, that's the reason that in many uh, situations, that's the tools that we are trying to implement, acknowledging that the control or the elimination is very particularly and only feasible in, in, in few spots, like in the Indian subcontinent, for example. Next. So there are some uh, facts that uh, uh, are very well associated with the, the epidemiology of leishmaniasis. We know that the pathogens, host, and vectors are in, involved in the transmission of leishmaniasis are environmental sensitive, there are many studies showing that temperature and precipitation can found to be predictors of past and sunfly and disease distribution. Humidity and moisture also determine the availability of breeding and resting sites of the phlebotomins uh, sunflies. Temperature, we know, plays a very important role in determining the metabolism of the different sunflies involved in the transmission, and it impacts directly in the time of blood meal digestion the, and the development and survival times of the different species of sunfly. Several retrospective studies have demonstrated the association between prevalence of leishmaniasis cases and climate changes. Similarly, different modeling studies looking at the likely impact of different climate variables on leishmaniasis have shown that climate changes might affect the length of the seasons, the distribution of the vectors and reservoirs, and ultimately impacting on the number of new cases. Next. So in a, in a nutshell, uh, there is one slide missing there, or maybe his. So th this is just to show you that uh, how the different variables have been associated with the different with the number of cases. So in the bars, you 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 see the the number of cases per month. In this particular case, in the in a community, in a district in Iran, and the and the lines on the curve show the different uh, the different uh, parameters in climate uh, like temperature, humidity, and wind, and another another change. Uh, variables in the associated with climate. Next, please. This is the in in some examples of modeling. Here, as you can see, when they put in the in the in this model different variables associated with the climate change, you can see how the 
distribution or, or the areas affected by the uh, prevalence of reservoirs and, and, and the species of the uh, different species of sunflies associated with transmissions also expand their uh, habitat. And that's why the, these other uh, new areas becomes more susceptible to develop the disease. Next. So in, in summary, uh, this is just to give you an example that different uh, um, among all these variables, the increased temperature has been associated with a shortness of, of vector development, as mentioned before, and reduce the parasite development time in the vector and increase the vector biting rate. Rain, increase in, in the rainfall also has been increased in the breeding site for vector and the, and the hosts. But uh, uh, when this rainfall is extreme, also a uh, good prompt to reduce the number of cases because the flooding and the destruction of the breeding sites. Next slide, please. So uh, here in a, to, to summarize uh, all this, uh, what the model says, it's been predicted that there is going to be a, a, a decrease in the disease, particularly in, in visceral leishmaniasis in the North Africa and, and the Middle East. But this also being predicted using these uh, methodologies that is going to be an increase in the number of cases in Western and Central Europe and from some semi-arid to all areas in, in Africa. The geographical distribution of cutaneous leishmaniasis in Latin America may decrease, uh, particularly in the Amazon region. Uh, however, vector distribution may shift to higher altitudes in, in other countries, resulting in possible vector and reservoir species reaching other areas which are currently not affected by the disease. Next. So, sorry, in, 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 in summary, it has been estimated that by 2080, the number of cases uh, may, may be increased uh, uh, much more than what we are seeing currently due to the climate change uh, changes, to the climate changes, sorry. And last, please, the, this is my last slide, I think. So uh, acknowledging, as I said before, that the main way of controlling the disease is uh, having a very good diagnostics and treatments in, in place. The NDI is mainly focusing in, in developing new drugs, which can be easily deployed in outbreak situations or in, in, in cases where need to be reached patients at community level. And we believe that the oral treatments are the best options and those are the best opportunities that we have to, to reach most of the people affected by either cutaneous leishmaniasis or visceral leishmaniasis. New treatments also uh, to, to treat uh, patients, uh, special populations like pregnant women and children, and uh, treatment that can be reduced the time to, to, for the patients to be treated. Uh, and as I said, more adapted to be used in the field and to all these uh, epidemiology changes that we are seeing uh, every day due to the climate changes and other variables. Thank you very much. I think this is my last slide. Thank you, Byron. Uh, I would request you to stay online because I'm sure there would be some questions. Uh, now I go to the last speaker of the panel, uh, who is uh, my colleague, Dr. Kavita Singh. She is the South Asia Director for the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Most recently, she served as Mission Director, the National Biopharma Mission Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council, also known as BIRAC, a public sector undertaking of the Department of Biotechnology. Just as a disclaimer, I'm not claiming to introduce every speaker with the long uh, experience they have, so it's a very brief introduction. Over to you, Kavita. Thank you so much. And firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for you know, realizing the importance of this topic. And uh, I will take up from where Farhat mentioned the first statement. She said, uh, we don't know which diseases are coming. We don't know which diseases are traveling where. There's a lot of unpredictability, uh, uncertainty, but uh, it's all, it's, and after COVID, we got to be ready all the time for, uh, for the possibility. And I'm just bringing in my next slide because of that. That yes, we talked about dengue, which is, which is uh, at the top uh, of a priority at this point of time. We talk about leishmaniasis, which is 
uh, a very important topic of the region, but must congratulate Bangladesh also the way VL has been handled. But other than that, it's not the real, there are so many other diseases. So I'll forget dengue, which has been talked about uh, a lot. Uh, leishmaniasis, uh, I would really want to make a point that the number of leishmaniasis cases have reduced from the, you know, the number which we have done, and especially in our part of the world. But, uh, and in one of the slides, the last slide of Baron, you would have said, you would have seen it was mentioned that the vectors are traveling. And that's what we are seeing today also in our region. Uh, we are seeing the vector traveling and we are seeing cases of VL occurring at much higher altitudes. You could see some reports from Nepal coming in of how the number of cases are increasing in non-endemic zones, never seen before. You know, we always thought hills will protect, but it's not the case. And I will not again go into the reasons for deforestation or population growth, but uh, diseases like cystosomiasis, we again think is not a big burden for us, uh, but it is uh, increasing in some parts of the world. Chagas doesn't impact us, but in Latin America is a disease of concern, often talked about. And again, uh, here the vector range is projected to increase to different countries. And even in higher altitudes of Kenya and highlands may be seen an increased risk of sleeping sickness. So I wanted to mention few of these neglected tropical diseases as they are growing, they're growing in the region, the vectors are traveling. So uh, an important to keep a track of all of them while we are at it. And I'll also take two minutes, in fact, to, uh, because you would have seen a lot of speakers from Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, uh, actually a baby of uh, MSF, Doctors or Borders, formed 20 years back with a very, uh, very, you know, um, hardcore mandate of being an R&D organization. And an R&D organization in a not-for-profit sector is something uh, which is a very common in, uh, we don't have many of them, at least in India, and I'm not sure about Bangladesh, I don't, I've not heard many in Bangladesh, but you would have heard of like International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, you would have heard of PATH, I saw, uh, you know, the logos of PATH in some slides. So what we do is uh, this uh, product development partnership organizations, you get the relevant partners together. You get research institutes, you get government, foundations, trusts, scientific researchers, public health programs, a Ministry of Health and Family Welfare together to see and identify which innovation is missing. You know, and we all saw that till we have innovative solutions which are adapted, field adapted, which are accessible, affordable, it's usually very challenging to fight such diseases. And I'm going to make three, three points, three observations from three different, um, you know, uh, uh, angles, I would say. And one is, uh, whenever you talk about climate change, you always talk about what are the countries committed. So you would have heard about nationally determined contributions from each country. And they identify, many countries identify three sectors, water, agriculture, and health. And they all identify the link between climate change and, uh, you know, what are their actions will be. But most of them talk about vector control. Most of them talk about the resilient health systems, but often miss talking about innovations and, you know, identifying the right, right tools. So innovation R&D somehow, somewhere gets missed while we understand the importance of these diseases. Even if you go to the COP26, uh, WHO says that for on climate change, build climate resilient and environmentally sustainable health systems and support health adaptation and resilience across sectors. Now, enhanced systems for disease surveillance, epidemiological investigations, virus testing, vector control are needed. You know, they are the, really the front line, but they will not suffice, right? That's a message I'm trying to drive in, that availability of and equitable access is not only availability, COVID has taught us that it's that both, both words go together. The availability and equitable access for tools to diagnose, prevent, and treat climate sensitive diseases are a very key part of building resilient communities. So, you know, it's an integral part, but somehow we don't explicitly mention R&D or innovation. And lastly, when I talk about access to innovation, there are some public health policies, again, which I will not go deep into, but just reminding that till we ensure that public investments in R&D are conditioned, uh, you know, for their inputs, for outputs, for processes, till then, innovation in the global south will always suffer. And uh, we are seeing that we are getting hit. So global south coming together for innovative R&D uh, and climate-sensitive infectious disease is an important area for us to talk about. 
I'll just not go to the next slide because it's really talking about what DNDI is looking at it. Just mention the four points. Yes, we look at treatments for climate sensitive diseases. We're looking at when you're making treatments, are your processes also environmentally friendly? You know, you're not using uh, uh, chemicals which are harmful for the environment. Are you ensuring that? You're ensuring that are we adequately talking about policies which are going to impact the R&D on these diseases? And of course, when you're doing everything, it's a reminder that are you also contributing to the environment change? So keep a track of that to be more effective. And I think I'll conclude with that for the moment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to have the two speakers on the screen. So now we open the floor uh, for questions. If there are any questions, please raise your hand, or we could see if there are any questions online. OK, so uh, we'll go to one in the room. Excuse me. You. Could you briefly introduce yourself and then ask the question? Yeah. And if you have a preference for a panel member, let us know. So I'm Dr. Monique Kamath. Uh, I'm the board uh, board of director for Medicine Science for East Asia at the moment and a public health expert from Mumbai at the moment. I have a particular question for Dr. Jamal because we are seeing such a high rise of dengue cases. Uh, clinically, we also see post-dengue symptoms which are really debilitating. Does Bangladesh take cognizance of these symptoms, particularly the, uh, the hepatic symptoms that we are seeing uh, after dengue? Because many patients actually don't get admitted. They, they treat themselves at home or they, you know, they can't afford admission. And then you see uh, post-dengue kind of syndrome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation that um, in rural area, uh, the, I mean, if you compare with urban area to rural area, the rural area, the patients are coming late to the hospital. And so they're, de I mean, they're dying faster than uh, the urban area uh, patients. So this is uh, one uh, scenario we, we can see. So that is, uh, I mean, in uh, public health point of view, <clears throat> awareness is a big problem there. And we have the guideline for uh, treating dengue, uh, especially it's a complicated one because new uh, serotypes uh, are coming. So our uh, clinicians, they are taking uh, steps to uh, deal with this. I mean, there are the guidelines, so they're, they're still working on the guidelines. So hopefully the question you asked, so they will, uh, I mean, not in the com completion. I have no information that's a complete package uh, regarding the uh, post dengue, what you mentioned. But they are definitely, they are working on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question at the back, please. Um, sorry, Dr. Zaman, for bombarding with, you with questions. Uh, second question is for you, too. Uh, I work for MSF. We have a mission in Bangladesh. And uh, we were missing a little bit the vaccination part, although the second uh, speaker did touch on this. I was just wondering, uh, because we see a lot of cases also in our uh, projects, uh, the interest of the government in uh, the vaccine, because there are promising vaccines, one in Japan that they just got out, but they are, uh, their manufacturing power is small right now. I was wondering if the government will be interested to look at it, uh, because the population in Bangladesh is big and the need will be high if really the government is interested, and it will be good. Uh, if we do look at it. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. So vaccine is a promising thing for all of us because uh, our population is big and the government is definitely uh, taking it very positively. But uh, the challenge previously, uh, because we have some studies on, uh, I mean, COVID vaccine. So uh, as I mentioned in my last answer that uh, our awareness is not that up to the mark. I mean, people are less concerned about uh, this one I, i'm uh, one question should be it should be like this that whether the people will be interested to take the uh, vaccines 
So those, uh, along with the government initiative, um, the awareness or uh, people uh, motivating people for taking the uh, vaccine will be important. Definitely, the government will come forward. We hope because, uh, like COVID, uh, dengue is also uh, people. I mean, yesterday I was reading one newspaper. Our minister of health, he uh, he is also focusing largely on dengue. That uh, the number of cases and also deaths are increasing. So definitely, a vaccine will be uh, one promising thing for uh, the government and also the people of Bangladesh. Is it okay? The answer is okay. No. Thank yeah, you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Saman. Maybe Nilika, you would like to reflect on that? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, there's no question. Uh, a vaccine uh, would be really important because uh, that's what I hi uh, highlighted, that everybody has been concentrating on vector control, re eliminating breeding and so on. Uh, so a vaccine is promising. And uh, uh, the, the vaccines so far uh, that are being developed uh, ha have good efficacy in people who have had dengue. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, and the WHO SAGE recently uh, uh, put out their guidance and the current vaccines, for instance, being registered have uh, uh, limited efficacy against all four serotypes. So, uh, for instance, Q-Denga, the, uh, the one that has been uh, registered around, that has good efficacy in seronegative individuals. In other words, people who have not had dengue for serotype one and two, but not the other serotypes, three and four. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, Although the vaccine is going to have a huge impact, that alone is not going to work, uh, the current dengue vaccines, because it doesn't protect against all four serotypes in uh, people who've not previously had dengue. Uh, so, uh, so so this is why we, we need a, a, you know, a, a, a strategy with, with everything coming in. Like for COVID, uh, we had vaccines, we had social distancing measures, which, which are, are like, yeah. and also we had treatment. I mean, even now, there are about 200 something clinical trials going on for COVID uh, and only one for dengue, uh, which is a sad situation for, for treatment. And uh, so we have to have integrated approach like we had for COVID uh, if we are to address this increasing burden of dengue. Uh, we do have an online question. Okay, so there is a question from the team there. Uh, I just had one quick question, uh, Dr. Kavita. Uh, so, ma'am, you mentioned that uh, emergence and re-emergence of uh, certain diseases are observed as a link with climate change. Can epidemiological surveillance and tracking play a role in that? Uh, and is that possible considering the link with climate change? Thank you, Raj. Raj, I'm, uh, I think everybody would agree that surveillance is really the uh, soul of any uh, infectious disease. Uh, and surveillance not only of the vector, but surveillance of the vector, surveillance of the uh, microorganism surveillance of the uh, increasing uh, population uh, vulnerability you know with aging with uh, comorbidities so a uh, surveillance and a uh, good handle of all the data which are we call the triad of any infectious disease is very critical to um, warn us and to keep us prepared so yes you are right surveillance is critical okay so we have one more question Please state your name and if you have a preference for a panel member to respond. I am Dr. Anindita Shabnam Kuraishi. I am assistant director working at the GHS uh, Mahakali Dhaka. My uh, question would be to Ms. Kavita. So I am, uh, I was uh, going through the panel discussion here. Uh, now we can clearly see that the uh, that, uh, the diseases that we are saying that neglected tropical diseases, uh, saying the climate change issue, it's not, it's not going to be limited to uh, only tropical uh, areas anymore. So do we need to change uh, the term that the neglected tropical disease? It is not only a problem for the tropical countries anymore. So WHO, as a, as a WHO, should put special effort, like it's, it's a problem for the whole of the world. And uh, as you are saying that we need more uh, attention to R&D, uh, development of vaccine, development of treatment, as Nilika was saying, for the dengue. So uh, should we tag it <laughs> as neglected tropical, tropical diseases, or rather uh, term it as a, uh, coming danger as the next pandemic. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for this question. And uh, it could be, uh, I think we could spend some time more on that. But I agree with your suggestion. Uh, you know, what you're suggesting, it's time to uh, rethink. And maybe therefore this, uh, you know, when I believe, you know, when you go to, especially when I go to India and we go to government, they say we don't neglect it. We, they are not even sure why WHO calls it neglected tropical diseases because lymphatic filariasis, VL is on the top of the agenda of the government. So they don't like the word neglected tropical diseases itself. But therefore now, you know, to get it a more rhyming, I think, or getting it a more perspective, climate sensitive diseases is getting more traction. And that's because you, are, you see these diseases now impacting Europe. You're right, you see this malaria happening in uh, even, you know, in US. So uh, maybe it is, you know, the climate sensitive infectious diseases could be a, re a way of getting attention more now because when you see it, you believe it that it can happen. And, uh, you know, and the second part of the question that getting R&D more uh, interested, I would just say that uh, you might have seen some publications coming up. When you, when you start seeing these diseases uh, in the global north, and you will start seeing R&D happening. Now, will that mean these, uh, the new innovations again will not be available to Global South? So is it a double whammy? Will they be available? Will they not be available? So again, a point of, you know, I don't want to raise a controversy on this issue, but that's the uh, conversation happening globally. Thank you, Kavita. I think uh, we will not stop here on this conversation. We will continue and take it into the tea break uh, with our two panelists here in the uh, in person, so you have an opportunity to bilaterally interact with them. I would like to thank two of my panelists online. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I think it leaves us with lots of questions and also some solutions of how we can collaborate and work together. And for me, uh, more than tropical, the part that really is uh, close to MSF is the neglected part. Uh, we as MSF work with neglected populations. We work in areas where there are diseases that impact a certain part of population. So we really want to make sure what doesn't come to the headlines is actually more discussed in academic circles that the attention still stays on that and policymakers make timely interventions and financial investments to make sure we make progress in them. Thank you very, very much for that. Thanks a lot. Um, and now I'd like to say that finally we are at our coffee tea break and we've made up some few minutes, but I would like everybody be, to be back uh, in this room at 11.35, please, with phones on silent, consent form signed. Enjoy your coffee tea break. Thank you very much. with academics from other countries, and particularly our partner site, sites in uh, India, is to be able to ensure that the training and teaching is given by experts from around the world. The people who teach it are genuinely people that work on these topics in the field. And so we bring not just the theoretical um, aspects of, of disease control or, or infectious diseases or public health, what we also do is bring this really sort of field-grounded approach to our teaching. So what it was really like to deal with diphtheria in Bangladesh last year, um, rather than just what we read from the textbooks. 
uh, there's a lot of um, parallels that I can draw between the cases that we are shown and the ones that we work with on the field. And this is not something that I was ever taught. For example, you know, we once thought you know, when we study a disease, it's all about uh, um, the diagnosis, the treatment, the follow-up. Nowadays, I think you have to put a lot more into the, uh, the context of uh, um, delivering those treatments. Before I applied for the course, I knew it was going to be important, but after I started the course, it dawned on me that it was actually much, much more needed than I realized, because we realized that the information is out there, but sometimes we just don't know where it is, and we don't know how to access beyond my I also like the way it's delivered and the way we are being guided to actually know the most important part of the things we are learning and it's actually quite clinical so when you see a patient you actually know what to do rather than it's just being more theoretical. The blended learning makes sure that we put people in groups and the group activities really builds on the expertise and experience of people. And one of the biggest benefits for me of choosing the GHM course compared with other courses in tropical medicine was the ability to stay at home and continue my work um, while I was still doing the course. It also allows me to meet people who do so many varieties of jobs all linked to needing a GHM course. We still want to increase the global reach of our course by expanding and facilitating access to medical doctors who work in low and middle income countries. We have a great network of collaborators, academics, clinicians, colleagues working for international and humanitarian organizations, but we want to extend that network even further, further into Africa, Middle East, Asia, the Americas. So all that in, in order to enrich the content of our course, to make it more global and to reflect even better the, the public health priorities in resource limited settings across the globe. So uh, it is uh, developing a highly qualified and skilled workforce which would be needed in the future to act and contain diseases in a very humanitarian way which is very important. So now we need to understand that when you speak about a patient, uh, he's not just a cluster of symptoms, a clinical symptoms. He is an individual with. Uh, who has a social history, a social background, he comes, there's a lot of culture, uh, his socioeconomic background, and just like you and me, he has many hopes, ambitions, dreams in life. And when you have a traumatic diagnosis like um, TB, your life changes altogether. And suddenly you hear that you have to stop working and to dedicate yourself towards the treatment. And then what? You know, every step is a question mark over the what next, what next. So then we sit with the patients, we come up with a plan. So it starts with empathizing the, with the patient, educating the patient about the treatment, checking for his motivation for the treatment, looking for the skills that he, whatever he and the family has, and then working on those skills and to ensure adherence and care that and support the patient throughout the treatment. देखती हूँ ना अभी यहाँ पे जितने पेशेंट आते हैं ज्यादातर सब लोग ऐसे परेशानी होते हैं कि क्या यार कितना और करना है अभी थक जाते हैं ना ऑलमोस्ट सब कुछ कितनी दवाई खाएंगे कितना खाना खाएंगे लेकिन सभी डॉक्टर्स काउंसलर्स वो बहुत हेल्प करते हैं यार एमएसएफ व्हाट वी वी डू नॉट वी डू नॉट बिलीव इन यू नो नो दीस आर योर ड्रग्स नो गो होम एंड टेक देम no, that that could happen anywhere. You know, but MSF, we want them to know that why they are taking these drugs and what happens if they take these drugs and why these drugs are important for their treatment. So if you do that, uh, patient a uh, patient learns to take charge of the treatment. You know, काफी मेहनत करते हैं MSF. एक-एक patient के लिए इतना खर्चा करते हैं, उनके पीछे इतना time देते हैं एक-एक patient को. तो patient को भी ख्याल रखना चाहिए. कि time पे खाना खाओ. और डॉक्टर से बोलते हो पूरा सुनो मेडिसिन मिस मत करो 
मेरे पहले मम्मा को एम डी आर टी बी डिटेक हुआ था तो मैं उनकी देखभाल करने के लिए हमेशा वो जो हॉस्पिटल है वहाँ पे जाती थी लेकिन उस टाइम पे इतना कुछ मालूम नहीं था कि प्रिकॉशंस लेना पड़ता है मास्क पहनना पड़ता है तो मैं नॉर्मल मेरी मम्मा है तो उनकी केयर करने के लिए जाती थी और बाद में उनके गुजर जाने के बाद मेरी भी टेस्ट हुई तो मुझे भी सेम एम डी आर टी हुआ इन्फेक्शन कंट्रोल इज अ वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट पार्ट ऑफ द टी बी एजुकेशन इट्स नॉट जस्ट द काउंसलर्स टेलिंग द पेशेंट अबाउट दिस इट इज एवरी वन ऑन द टीम द नर्सेज विल टेल द पेशेंट अबाउट इन्फेक्शन कंट्रोल एंड द डॉक्टर्स विल टेल अगेन द काउंसल एंड नॉट जस्ट दैन द ट्रीटमेंट बॉडी हु इज अ कंपनी द पेशेंट ऑल्सो नीड्स टू बी टोल्ड which is even more important then an infection control visit is done from by the nurses to the patient's house so we analyze if the patient is going to need an exhaust fan in the house or just changing the arrangement in the house so that the patient is near the window thing little things like that which make a big difference that way we we believe that you know an informed patient is an empowered patient pediatric tbr under diagnosis the challenges uh, faced by pediatrician in uh, uh, dr tb is humongous it's very painful for a child to take injections for 6 months mera nazim ansari naam hai tera saal se inke saath mein rehti hu inke और बच्चों की देखभाल ही मैं ही देखती हूँ उसकी मम्मी भी देखती है मैं भी देखती हूँ उसकी मम्मा दवा कर रहे थे ना तो वो डॉक्टर है घर पे तो उनको उन्होंने एक सरा लिख के दिए तो हमने एक सरा कराए तो बाद में पता चला इनको टीवी हो गई फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द डायग्नोसिस इट सेल्फ इन चिल्ड्रन इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट एंड गेटिंग वेरी गुड सैम्पल और आइसोलेटिंग दैक्टीरिया इट सेल्फ इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट वी नीड टू हैव वेरी गुड डायग्नोस्टिक टूल एंड चिल्ड्रन don't take any medicine properly and tb medicine is not just a single medicine it is four or five medicine together jaisa piece ke do ek do teen mahine ke liye piece ke hum log manate salman ko dawa kha le beta ji ye dila rahe hain wo dila rahe hain Uh, it is possible to have a very short duration of treatment for this. Bradycule and delamine are a good replacement for the injectable drugs, which carry serious toxicity. The WHO since has approved this both these drugs in children, so it's high time that you know these drugs are made available, which will be more palatable to the child as well as to the caregivers, parents especially. जब से यहाँ से हम दवा कर रहे हैं तो हमारे बच्चे बहुत बेहतर हैं, बहुत अच्छा हैं। उनका वजन भी बढ़ रहा है, वो खा पी रहे हैं, अच्छे हैं, माशाल्लाह खेल रहे हैं बच्चे। diagnosis is one major challenge in pediatrics children won't give you sputum they won't uh, take out the uh, cough in the vials so we have to put a pipe through the nose or through the mouth in the stomach and take out whatever secretion is possible to get once we have the guidelines that allow children to be diagnosed with a stool sample we'll see larger number of children being diagnosed with drtb who has validated it and we can offer the right pediatric formulations टीबी के पेशेंट को काउंसलिंग की बहुत ज्यादा जरूरत होती है और जब भी बच्चे पेशेंट बन के आते हैं तो उनको उनके समझ में जाके टीबी एजुकेशन करना बच्चों के साथ पजल्स लेके ग्रुप एक्टिविटीज करते ताकि पेशेंट को ट्रीटमेंट के बारे में डर ना रहते हुए यूजर फ्रेंडली चाइल्ड फ्रेंडली पेशेंट ट्रीटमेंट ले पाए the message is really how to make available uh, pediatric formulation in the field and the second is the cost so how to reduce the cost because the steel is under patent and the cost is high ha atta sagle jana amala vicharthat tichha color change jhala पहले ते अशी नव्हती एकदम नॉर्मल होती जे जे ट्रीटमेंट चालू झाली ना औषध कसं द्यायचं तिला खायला काय द्यायचं तिचं सगळं पथ्य वगैरे आम्हाला सांगितलं पण आम्ही तसं मनापासून सगळं व्यवस्थित दिलं आम्ही वैष्णवी स्वतःच बोलते की मला डॉक्टर व्हायचं आहे मी सगळ्यांना चेक करणार त्याच्यामुळे तिला पण ते कुठेतरी चांगलं वाटलं की आपण हे असं पुढे पण असं जाऊन हेच करावं
hi burden countries including india need to pool procurement to ensure that we have a sustainable supply and tb program so that children with drtb receive a short oral tb regimen as msf we were a part of the platform to really to speed up this process it's uh, very important to invest in the future uh, especially knowing that the children they are doing very well in the council of training better than adults This hospital is very important because we are one of very few facilities providing the secondary health care. And for many refugees in the camp, it's the only option to receive care in the intensive care unit or a high dependency unit. We also specialize in um, non-communicable diseases, which is very unique profile in this setting. Without the hospital in this setting, Sooner or later, they would die from, you may think, simple disease like diabetes. People shouldn't die because of diabetes. It's treatable. Hypertension, it's treatable. And it's not even that complicated if you manage this properly. The big challenge, the growth is uh, very, very high. There's going to be a need for more uh, support for the NCD program here in terms of human resources and then uh, in terms of drugs for training to actually sustain that increasing number of um, uh, patients coming to us. Most of our patients are also affected by hepatitis C. We believe that uh, most likely because they have been neglected um, they, for so long uh, back in um, where they are coming from and they didn't have access to healthcare. Most likely there, that was where they contracted hepatitis C. The burden is high. Most of them present very late with uh, a chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, uh, which is very difficult to manage. <laughs> Barmat the Guru no Hari no Hari, Barmat the Bosaranic Ashila. Tarbo di Kedaya, Huji, Edea, Anna Pusha with the Losugi, Yobadi, Losugi, Reda Hotitona, and Moto sit under the Bagulio by Bishazar, Kuria, the chair laggy. He lay a cabal with Anna in company. Did a shilling or for a divil of Bazi. A hand of Hari and the Reda Hot of Honor Hot and Dabaja, Datana, and so on, and where I am on the Ayari. We have a huge impact on the host community as well. Because um, Cox Bazar district is a very interesting area of Bangladesh. It's kind of a distant from the huge metropolis of Dhaka and Chittagong. They don't have easy access to healthcare either. I can see that the বিদেশী সংস্থা এটা আসছে এদের ট্রিটমেন্ট খুবই ভালো লোক উপকৃত হচ্ছে মুখমুখে শুনতেছি লোক বলতে যে যারা বলল আমার আত্মীয় সজন এখানে আছে তারাই বলছে আমাকে the global health course is a course that's designed to uh, introduce doctors who are considering uh, volunteering or working in low-income settings and humanitarian crises to equip them with the tools that they're going to need to use. And so we thought with the opportunities that um, the internet has brought, could we develop a training that would increase access, make high-quality training that's relevant for where people work, accessible uh, as a part-time online course. So it means that people continue their education even while they're working in some of the fast-growing places that are in the country. 
the best part of the program is that we are democratizing education to everybody and it comes from the vantage point of an humanitarian organization like MSF. What we've been able to do through both an online course but also engaging with, with academics from other countries and particularly our partner site, sites in uh, India is to be able to ensure that the training and teaching is given by experts from around the world. The people who teach it are genuinely people that work on these topics in the field and so we bring not just the theoretical um, aspects of, of disease control or or infectious diseases or public health. What we also do is bring this really sort of field grounded approach to our teaching. So what it was really like to deal with diphtheria in Bangladesh last year, um, rather than just what we read from the textbook. Uh, there's a lot of um, parallels that I can draw between the cases that we are shown and the ones that we work with on the field. And this is not something that I was ever taught. For example, you know, we once thought you know, when we study a disease, it's all about uh, um, the diagnosis, the treatment, the follow-up. Nowadays, I think you have to put a lot more into the, uh, the context of uh, um, delivering those treatments. Before I applied for the course, I knew it was going to be important. But after I started the course, it dawned on me that it was actually much, much more needed than I realized. We realize that the people are getting out there, but sometimes we just don't know where it is and we don't know how to access it. So it has gone beyond my experience. I also like the way it's delivered and the way we are being guided to actually know the most important part of the things we are learning, and it's actually quite clinical. So when you see a patient, you actually know what to do rather than it's just being more theoretical. The blended learning makes sure that we put people in groups and the group activities really builds on the expertise and experience of people. And one of the biggest benefits for me of choosing the GHM course compared with other courses in tropical medicine was the ability to stay at home and continue my work um, while I was still doing the course. It also allows me to meet people who do so many varieties of jobs all linked to needing a GHM patient. We still want to increase the global reach of our course by expanding and facilitating access to medical doctors who work in low and middle income countries. We have a great network of collaborators, academics, clinicians, colleagues working for international and humanitarian organizations, but we want to extend that network even further further into Africa, Middle East, Asia, the Americas. So all that in, in order to enrich the content of our course, to make it more global and to reflect even better the, the public health priorities in resource limited settings across the globe. So uh, it is uh, developing a highly qualified and skilled workforce which would be needed in the future to act and contain diseases in a very humanitarian way, it's very important. I was scared. I didn't have to do anything. I said, I didn't want to die, but I didn't eat any food. I didn't want to die now. I was in a bad situation. I was in a bad situation. No, we need to understand that when you speak about a patient, uh, he's not just a cluster of symptoms, a clinical symptoms. He is an individual with uh, who has a social history, a social background. He comes. There's a lot of culture, uh, his socioeconomic background, and just like you and me, he has many hopes, ambitions, dreams in life. And when you have a traumatic diagnosis like uh, TB, your life changes altogether. And suddenly you hear that you have to stop working and to dedicate yourself towards the treatment. And then what? You know, every step is a question mark or what next? What next? So then we sit with the patient, we come up with a plan. So it starts with empathizing the, with the patient, educating the patient about the treatment, 
checking for his motivation for the treatment looking for the skills that he whatever he and the family has and then working on those skills and to ensure adherence and care that and support the patient throughout the treatment मैं देखती हूं ना अभी यहां पे जितने पेशेंट जाते हैं ज्यादातर सब लोग ऐसे परेशानी होते हैं कि क्या यार कितना और करना है अभी थक जाते हैं ना ऑलमोस्ट सब कुछ कितनी दवाई खाएंगे कितना खाना खाएंगे लेकिन सभी डॉक्टर्स काउंसलर्स वो बहुत हेल्प करते हैं at msf what we we do not we do not believe in you know now these are your drugs now go home and take them that that could happen anywhere but msf we want them to know that why they are taking these drugs and what happens if they take these drugs and why these drugs are important for their treatment so if you do that uh, patient a uh, patient learns to take charge of the treatment ye log kafi mehnat karte hain mujhe ek ek patient ke liye itna kharcha karte hain unke piche itna time dete hain ek ek patient ko to patient ko bhi khayal rakhna chahiye कि टाइम पे खाना खाओ और डॉक्टर जो बोलते हो पूरा सुनो मेडिसिन मिस करते मेरे पहले मम्मा को एम डी आर टी बी डिटेक हुआ था तो मैं उनकी देखभाल करने के लिए हमेशा वो जो हॉस्पिटल है वहाँ पे जाती थी लेकिन उस टाइम पे इतना कुछ मालूम नहीं था कि प्रिकॉशंस लेना पड़ता है मास्क पहनना पड़ता है तो मैं नॉर्मल मेरी मम्मा है तो उनकी केयर करने के लिए जाती थी और बाद में उनके गुजर जाने के बाद मेरी भी टेस्ट हुई तो मुझे भी सेम एम डी आर टी बी डिकटेट हुआ इन्फेक्शन कंट्रोल इज अ वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट पार्ट ऑफ द टी बी एजुकेशन इट्स नॉट जस्ट द काउंसिल टेलिंग द पेशेंट अबाउट दिस इट इज एवरी वन ऑन द टीम द नर्सेज विल टेल द पेशेंट्स अबाउट इन्फेक्शन कंट्रोल एंड द डॉक्टर्स विल टेल अगेन द काउंसिल and not just them the, the treatment buddy who is accompanying the patient also needs to be told which is even more important then an infection control visit is done from by the nurses to the patient's house to be analyzed if the patient is going to need an exhaust fan in the house or just changing the arrangement in the house so that the patient is near the window thing little things like that which make a big difference that way we we believe that you know an informed patient is an empowered patient pediatric tbr under diagnosis the challenges uh, faced by pediatrician in uh, uh, dr tb is humongous it's very painful for a child to take injections for 6 months mera nazima ansari naam hai 13 saal se inke sath mein rehti hu main inke और बच्चों की देखभाल ही मैं ही देखती हूँ उसकी मम्मी भी देखती है मैं भी देखती हूँ उसकी मम्मा दवा कर रहे थे ना तो वो डॉक्टर है घर पे तो उनको उन्होंने एक सरा लिख के दिए तो हमने एक सरा कराए तो बाद में पता चला इनको टीवी हो गई फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द डायग्नोसिस इटसेल्फ इन चिल्ड्रन इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट एंड गेटिंग वेरी गुड सैम्पल और आइसोलेटिंग द बैक्टीरिया इट्सल्फ इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट नीड टू हैव वेरी गुड डायग्नोस्टिक टूल एंड चिल्ड्रन don't take any medicine properly and tb medicine is not just a single medicine it is four or five medicine together jaisa piece ke do ek do teen mahine ke liye piece ke hum log manate salman ko dawa kha le beta tujhe ye dila rahe hain ye dila rahe hain uh it is possible to have a very short duration of treatment for this Radicular and delamine are a good replacement for the injectable drug, which carries serious toxicity. The WHO since has approved this both these drugs in children, so it's high time that you know these drugs are made available, which will be more palatable to the child as well as to the caregivers, the parents especially. जब से यहाँ से हम दवा कर रहे हैं, तो हमारे बच्चे बहुत बेहतर हैं, बहुत अच्छा है। उनका वजन भी बढ़ रहा है, वो खा पी रहे हैं, अच्छे हैं, माशाल्लाह खेल रहे हैं बच्चे। diagnosis is one major challenge in pediatrics children won't give you sputum they won't uh, take out the uh, cough in the vials so we have to put a pipe through the nose or through the mouth in the stomach and take out whatever secretions is possible to get once we have the guidelines that allow children to be diagnosed with a stool sample we'll see larger number of children being diagnosed with drtb who has validated it and we can offer the right pediatric formulations
टीबी के पेशेंट को काउंसलिंग की बहुत ज्यादा जरूरत होती है और जब भी बच्चे पेशेंट बन के आते हैं तो उनको उनके समझ में जाके टीबी एजुकेशन करना बच्चों के साथ पजल्स लेके ग्रुप एक्टिविटीज करते ताकि पेशेंट को ट्रीटमेंट के बारे में डर ना रहते हुए यूजर फ्रेंडली चाइल्ड फ्रेंडली पेशेंट ट्रीटमेंट ले पाए The message is really how to make a viable uh, pediatric formulation in the field, and the second Hello. is the cost. Hello, so how to reduce the cost? Uh, I request you all to take your seat, please. We'll start our next session very soon. Please take your seat. Dear guests those who have already had the refreshment please take your seat we'll start our next session very soon
Hello? May I have your attention, please? Dear audience, may I have your attention, please? I believe you all have your tea break and refreshment. Please be seated. Now we are starting our next session. Welcome back again. I know you have enjoyed all of the session in the morning. We have gathered around in a platform where knowledge, innovation and collaboration intertwines to address the health challenges of our time. I am Dr. Manushi Shaha. I will be your co-MC today. I am currently a student of Department of Public Health and Informatics, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, Bangladesh. I'm sure you have already have had the brisk tea break, feels energetic, met your peers and exchanged your views. Let's bring back our attention to the next session, which is about the abstract presentation on non-communicable diseases. In this session, we'll dive into the programmatic and socio-cultural dimension of preventing and managing non-communicable disease burden such as cervical cancer in the context of Bangladesh, EEG in neonatal seizures, and its invaluable role in predicting neurodevelopmental outcome, mental health perspective, and many more. The guests from the behind, if anyone from the back have trouble to see the presentation or read the presentation, we can move forward. There are plenty of empty seats. Let me directly introduce our chair of this session. This non-communicable abstract presentation session will be expertly chaired by Dr. Sohil Reza Choudhury, Professor and Head of the Department of Epidemiology and Research, National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. He is the lead of various cardiovascular disease prevention program, such as hypertension control program, which has been a successful one with a collaboration with NCDC, DGHS, and funded by Resolve to Save Lives. He is also the General Secretary of Hypertension Control Committee and the Organizing Secretary of United Forum Against Tobacco. His contribution to fight non communicable disease is beyond description. So, without further ado, I am handing over to conduct the abstract presentation session to our respected. Chair, please, sir. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, so, we'll straight go to the our uh, session today. We have five presenter in this session, and I would like to request the first presenter. Dr. Faria Hassin, Associate Professor, Department of Public Health and Informatics of Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. She will be talking on pragmatic and sociocultural aspects of preventing and managing cervical cancer in Bangladesh. Dr. Faria, please. Thank you, Chair. So, this is Dr. Fariha Hassin. Uh, today, I am going to share some of the very key research findings of the research, which is titled as Programmatic and Social Cultural Aspects of Preventing and Managing Cervical Cancer in Bangladesh, a Gender Lens Review. So, before going to the main presentation, I would like to say something about my university. Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib University is the leading postgraduate medical institute in Bangladesh with a rich heritage dating back to the Institute of Postgraduate Medical Research, that is IPGMR. Besides providing education, the university also plays a very crucial role in promoting research across various disciplines of medicine. 
Since its establishment, the university has functioned as a tertiary healthcare center offering both general and specialized clinical services. So now come to the main point. I would like to something uh, say about the introduction of this research. We all know women face challenges regarding cervical cancer. Why? Due to the multiple risk factors. What are those? Such as early marriage, multiparity, low education, low socioeconomic status, and many others. So these factors are actually influenced by gender norms prevailing in a patriarchal society. So what is gender norms? What we are practicing years after years. So this is a part of the social norm. Hence, this study was conducted with a gender lens and intersectionality framework to understand deeply how to prevent and treat cervical cancer considering these factors. That means these diseases are not only depending on the biological factor. The study aimed to identify the factors influenced by gender roles and norms that contributed to the development, identification, and treatment of cervical cancer. It may be, it seems, these factors are very simple, but we can see how deeply these factors can contribute to the life of a woman, particularly the patient of cervical cancer. So methodology, this study received clearance from the Institutional Review Board of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. This is a cross-sectional study with the mixed method approach. And the study side was we collected data from the four institutes. Those are Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, Dhaka Medical College, and Maimashing Medical College. We did this study from July 2020 to December 2020. That means during the COVID pandemic time. The study population were the cervical cancer patients, and we did survey, and also the, we also applied the quality research methods. For the survey, we uh, collected data from 174 diagnosed cases of cervical cancer women, and we did the qualitative interview, and 13 key informant interview, and nine key in-depth in interviews. We used questionnaire for the survey and for the qualitative data collection, we used guideline for in-depth interview and separate guideline for in, uh, key informant interview. So I would like to share first some biological vulnerabilities of cervical cancer patients. So what are those? Like age, age at marriage, age at first pregnancy and parity. So here you can see the majority of the patients, uh, participants from this study were 40 to 50 years old and 50 to 60 years old, that is 33% and 31%. And if we also notice that 83% of these patients, they got marriage before the age of 18. And when they got the first pregnancy, among them, 55% got pregnant before the 18 years. So audience, you already identified two of the vulnerable factors. One is age and one is age of marriage. What about the parity? If you see that uh, almost 38% of these diagnosed cervical cancer patients had children five and more. So the multiparity is also played a role here. What about the educational status? So as these women, they were already diagnosed and many majority of them from the rural area. So you can see that uh, majority said that they do not have the formal education and that is almost 60%. So you can see that age, parity, education, all these social factors, they can also play with the biological factors and contribute to the development of the cervical cancer. Now come to the social vulnerabilities of the cervical cancer patients. What are those? When we talked with them, they said, feeling shame to share illness with family members and service providers also. And this could be one of the reasons they do not want to go to the health facilities and they do not want to share the information with the service providers. And we also found that limited access to treatment due to decision-making power held by male members of the family, typically husband or son, and financial constraint also played an important role. Women who delay treatment due to financial constraint are at higher risk than those who have already um, initiated the treatment. 
So sometimes I think you all understand that decision making is not that easy process and sometimes it is not a single decision making process as well. Family members contribute this kind of decision making process, especially if it is a long term treatment process. We did a quality research, as I said, so we identified some gender norms related to the vulnerabilities of the cervical cancer of the patient. Let's see what we found there when we did the in-depth interview and key informing interviews with the patients and, server and the service providers. They said maybe poor education plays a very strong role, unemployment, status of housewives so sometimes also contributed to the decision making of taking the services and unaware about preventive measures and about available services at the facilities. You know sometimes what happened, we develop the services, but sometimes maybe we do not think that the development of services which were done by us, whether those population know about these services. So there is also a gap of information among them and delayed family decision. There are many factors which can contribute to the delayed family decisions. You have already seen the male members, the financial constraint, and sometimes the understandability within the family by the female members or the neighborhood, they also play. So you see these are related very much strongly with the gender norms. So one of the service recipients said, you can uh, hear her voice here, my marriage was done when I was maybe at the age of 15 years. And, uh, and uh, I arranged my elder daughter's marriage at the age of 14. Now she is 19 years. So you can see that whatever we are practicing in our own life, we would like to see the same picture in our future lives. So I think there is another gap and we need to do many things to protect this woman. So we also find some economic and programmatic factors of cervical cancer. I would like to show two of the verbatims. One is one service provider is telling that there is a link between poverty and sanitization. As poor people have low income and lack of health awareness, women use dirty clothes instead of pad due to lack of money, which leads to the cancer in future. So as we heard from today's morning presentation, Dr. Perdusi Kadri mentioned about the life course approach. I also would like to mention about the life course approach for the prevention of the cervical cancer. We do not expect that patient will come with diagnosed cervical cancer. It has to be started the prevention from the very young age, that is the adolescent age. Let's uh, listen voice from a doctor. What the doctor is thinking? Patients are not able to take therapy, cannot maintain schedule properly as their residence is far from health center. So you know that the cancer treatment, it needs continuation, it needs follow up, it needs huge amount of money sometimes. So continuation and follow up is also challenging. In some cases, especially if these women are from the low socioeconomic condition. Here I would like to mention that we collected this data during the peak of the COVID-19. So you can imagine at, at that time, the, uh, the patients were, they had to be at home, hospitals, they also have to give more focus on the COVID-19 pandemic. At that time we mentioned and we also experienced that other health services that were also challenged. So maybe the, this may be a very simple cross-sectional study that it can give us message that during this kind of pan pandemic, how we can continue the other health services as well to protect the women like them. So what we can say in the conclusion, in the conclusion we can say this research has revealed a critical insight about certain factors which have deep rooted gender and socioeconomic and cultural implications. It is essential to consider the structural and systematic barrier faced by the cervical cancer patients, such as limited access to education, economic opportunities, and access to healthcare. There is a need for comprehensive and primary prevention approach to address the challenges faced by the women who have experienced early marriage, early pregnancy, high parity, lack of formal education, and lack of less access to treatment. Now the proportion of early marriage is decreasing in Bangladesh and also we are seeing that the knowledge level and awareness knowledge level is also increasing among the young group of population. But if we think about the patients or the older age group of the population, we need to do something specially for them. 
So the approach should prioritize the intersectionality of gender and socio-economic status in designing appropriate intervention. Therefore, a holistic and multi-sectoral approach is necessary to address the root cause of harmful gender norms and prom for the promote sustainable changes. It is very important to understand the gender norms. If we cannot understand the gender norms, especially the negative gender norms, we cannot do to transform these negative gender norms as a positive gender norms. That means we need the gender transformative approach. Maybe we are gender responsive, gender aware, but we are waiting to have a service which will be not only gender friendly, it has to be gender transformative. So not only the women, their family members can come with the strong decision that this disease can be prevented. If disease is happening, the early diagnosis has to be done. And if the early diagnosis is done, the treatment has to be continued. Then we can ensure the woman a good life. And I think this is our responsibility. And SDG 3 and SDG 5 is also telling the same thing to us. So uh, this is my last slide. So I would like to mention, uh, I would like to show the team of research. I'm very much thankful to them. They have contributed in this study tremendously. So I could say something on behalf of them. And I would like to thank them in front of you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam, to contribute in this research. And especially I would like to thank this study, which was funded by the GNSPU Health Economics Unit, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of Bangladesh. Thank you so much for your patience hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faria, for a nice presentation. I think uh, I can see that we have an um, inaugural session just after this uh, session. So for the time constraint, it would probably be good to have questions after all the presenters present their um, paper. Then we'll have a short discussion. Okay. So. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. Kaji Ashraful Islam, who is the Assistant Professor of Pediatric Neurology Department of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. And he will be talking about EEG in neonatal seizure, prediction of neurodevelopmental outcome. Dr. Islam. Good afternoon respected chairperson and the learner audience. I am here uh, from the Institute of Pediatric Neurodesign and Autism, uh, which is the uh, only institute in the Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Uh, in the institute, Uh, we are dealing with a lot of uh, children with a neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental disorder, including cerebral palsy, autism, and other neurological disorder. And uh, most of the neurological disorder have some uh, risk factors. And uh, we are go through the risk factors of the conditions and if we are find out the risk factors, we can prevent the condition and thereby decreases the burden of the patient. And in our institute, we are providing services through outpatient, inpatient department, as well as doing uh, some research. And neonatal seizure is the one of the most uh, common risk factors of this neurodevelopmental disorder. This is a very common problem which we are facing every day. A good number of patients is admitted in our neonatal intensive care unit. And after that, they are attended in our uh, neurology OPD uh, with the sequelae, like developmental delay, motor deficit, intellectual disability, and epilepsy. And neonatal seizure has a lot of uh, etiologies. Irrespective of the etiologies, uh, they have the 
negative consequences and adverse neurodevelopmental outcome. Among the neurodevelopmental outcome, motor deficit, intellectual deficit, and epilepsy uh, is common. And in most of the cases of the neonatal seizure, we do an EEG. EEG is a very old and good tools to assess the newborn brain. Actually, among the other tools, the EEG can predict the actual state of newborn brain at that moment. And EEG has the different findings. Most of important findings are the background abnormality. The background abnormality is also affected due to the age of the newborn. In case of preterm newborn, there is some specific pattern, and in the term newborn, there is some specific pattern. And to interpret the EEG findings, it is very important to know the age of the infant as well the etiology of the condition. If we uh, do an EEG and interpret it properly, we can predict the outcome of the baby in perspective of the developmental outcome. And so, uh, we design a prospective study uh, to see the EEG findings has any role to predict the neurodevelopmental outcome. Uh, this longitudinal study was conducted in our department, in the Department of Pediatric Neurology, Institute of Pediatric Neurodesign and Autism, as well in the neonatal unit of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Uh, the newborn who admitted in the NICU of BSMMU with a neonatal seizure was the population of our study. And we initially uh, planned to enroll those children in our study. Before starting our study, we took uh, consent <coughs> from our IRB, Institute Review Board. And after taking the permission, we started the enrollment of the patient, we initially selected those children who had at least on seizure during the uh, NISU admission. And we could not include the very severe diseases where easy performance is not possible. And we after the unit was managed according to our NICU protocol and routine investigations was done according to the cause of the seizure. And after enrollment, a thorough history including physical examination and routine investigation were recorded in a structured questionnaire and an EEG was done with a modified 1020 international system in our EEG laboratory. All the findings, including the EEG findings, are also recorded in the structure form. And every children, every infant were asked to attend our OPD at the age of three months, where all the infants were thoroughly assessed regarding the neurodevelopmental aspect. And the tools we use here in the RND, Rapid Neurodevelopmental Assessment. Here is the uh, flowchart of our study. Uh, we, uh, most of the infants were attended their follow-up schedule, but uh, we 10% uh, were lost our follow-up. And finally, we analyzed 50 children, uh, and there are two groups, one who had the initial abnormal EG and who has the normal EG. Now the point of results. Uh, most of the 
clinical seizure type was the uh, clonic seizure and 38% 34 children 68% of the infant had the norm abnormal eeg the among the abnormality the background abnormality like by suppression was the most common findings and among the focal discharge sharp wave was the most common findings almost 61% of the patient who had the initial abnormal eeg got some form of neurodevelopmental outcome among those 61% uh, with abnormal eeg had the epilepsy and 67% had the devil on intellectual impairment among the common findings where the background abnormality was present uh, in that case 61% with background abnormality table of postnatal epilepsy but uh, 76% a bit higher proportion had the uh, developmental impairment so we have some limitations also uh, this uh, enrollment was a purposive sampling we could not uh, include the all the uh, infants uh, admitted in the nicu uh, as well we uh, could not uh, include the very sick children so these are our uh, limitations so uh, from our findings we can conclude uh, where there is an abnormal eeg there might be a possibility of the neuro adverse new developmental outcome as well if there is the background abnormality there is the adverse outcome is the more chance and epileptic discharge in the temporal region has the uh, associated consequences at the epilepsy and so we can recommend uh, in, in an infant with an abnormal eeg with neonatal seizure uh should follow up closely and uh, monitor and manage accordingly and i want to thanks the organizer to giving me the permission here to say about our uh, research work as well i uh, also acknowledge our uh, institute when I, who can uh, permit to organize arrange this research thank you everybody Thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, we will be taking question at the end of the session, all the presentation. Uh, so now we have a online presentation, I believe. I think uh, Dr. Ian Leong, who is a psychiatrist in Liza General Hospital in Kachin State of Myanmar. He will be talking about mental health impact among conflict affected population of Liza, Kachin State in Myanmar. So the presentation is recorded. So I'd like to request the organizer to play the presentation. I am Dr. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Yan Leong, a consultant psychiatrist from Myanmar. I'm going to present the same initial findings from the study titled Unveiling the Hidden Struggle, Mental Health Impact of Conflict in Liza Kitchen State of Myanmar. First of all, I would like to show the current situation of my country. As you all might be aware, Myanmar is in the third year of political instability in the coup in February 2021, with numerous armed conflicts between anti-gender forces and the military. It is undeniable that the national health system has been profoundly devastated, 
especially impacting the mental health of the community that have been displaced and those living in the regions exposed to brutal military operations, some of which are particularly targeted at health and education facility. You can see the results in the map. On the top of the map is the kitchen state where our project is located. In the next slides, I will explain briefly about the geopolitical situation in Kitchen State. Kitchen State occupies the north and west part of the Myanmar, where some areas are controlled and governed by the Kitchen Independent Organization, also known as CIO, which is an ethnic M organization with its M wing called Kachin Independent Army or KIA. There had been a ceasefire agreement, however, in 2011, the military violated the agreement and initiated an offensive leading to the internal displacement of more than 100,000 people. Such long standing conflicts have a huge negative impact. On the mental health of the local community who had very limited professional support even before the coup. So, after the coup, with all the corresponding factors such as post COVID economic crisis, it is no surprise there is an increase in met needs in mental health support. Here, I'm going to show a brief background of LISA. It is located at Myanmar Chinese border and served as the administrative headquarters of PIO. Currently, there are approximately 70,000 IDBs spread across eight IDB camps in Lizer and its nearby areas. The military has been using frequent airstrikes, which led to mass casualty to many innocent civilians. The country unit was established in April 2021, which was made possible after the arrival of two specialist psychiatrists, including myself, all of whom are dedicated to the civil disobedience movement against the military coup. With the support from a trained nurse provided by the hospital, our unit provides outpatient services from 9 a.m. to 12 noon six days a week is at Sandil. On average, there are approximately 20 to 30 patients per day. For psychiatrist emergencies involving acute excitement, a risk of self-harm or harm to others, the hospital has allocated four inpatient beds. The psychiatrist in charge also takes responsibility for lazy and care and management coordinating with other departments and other medical units as needed. This slide outlines the methodology of our research. Our study presents an initial descriptive analysis of the patient who visited Liza psychiatrist units from June 2022 to May 2023. We are a team of three doctors, two psychiatrists, and one public health professional. All of us are involved in data compilation, cleaning, and verification of this data. This is the demographic data of the study. There were a total of 964 patients who visited the psychiatric clinic 2,397 times over 12 months period. 5% of the visits were initial consultations and 88% were follow-up. Majority of the patients, 75% were between 18 to 50 years of age. There were more male patients and female patients. Nearly 50% of the patients were reported to be residing in urban area of Lizer, followed by IDP camps which was about 28%. Overall, there are 
that the eight different mental disorders diagnosed by consultant psychiatrists according to DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, fifth edition by American Psychiatric Association. Among them, generalized anxiety disorder was observed as the most common disorder, 35% followed by major depressive disorder and alcohol use disorder, 19% and 11% respectively. These 11 disorders are identified among 90% of the patients. This is the list of the rates of the mental disorder, which comprises 10% of the total diagnosis. If we break down the data by sex, most of the disorder were equally observed on both sex, except alcohol use disorder and major depressive disorder. Alcohol use disorder was most common in male, while major depressive disorder was more common in female patients. When we look at the age stratification, generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder are most common in all age groups followed by alcohol use disorder in above 18 years age group. In fact, panic disorder is the third most common disorder in under 18. If we analyze by the area of residence, generalized anxiety disorder is the most common disorder not only in both urban and rural lizer, but also in IDP camp. This study has its fair share of limitations and challenges. There is still a need to carry out more extensive investigation. Association and correlation analysis, if there is any, are not yet undertaken because we are still collecting data. In terms of implementation, our team have to strictly adhere to local safety and security regulations to ensure the well-being of healthcare professionals and the patient alike, and also to optimize the storage of medication. One of the main challenges was the language barrier, since many patients speak Jane Paul, which is the native kitchen language, while we speak Amis. Besides, we encounter some delays during the process of procurement and logistics of medications because the military has increased checkpoints and scrutinized every movement in the region. Patient from distant IT becomes and hard to reach areas have to pass several checkpoints to have access to health care at Liza General Hospital. On top of that, we have limited human resources and funding. Therefore, service sustainability remains on top of these challenges. In conclusion, these preliminary findings do reveal the tip of the iceberg of the substantial mental health needs and challenges that are afflicting the Liza community since they have long endured the negative consequences of protracted civil wars and conflict. We also notice that the community does not put their mental well-being as a priority. In the aftermath of COVID-19 waves, compounded by prolonged wars, economic instability, and ongoing political turbulences, that have surrounded them over the case and become more pronounced after the coup. We also have some ad hoc activity, which was done in response to recent incidents of teenage suicide. Last month, our team conducted a suicide prevention and awareness workshop targeting students and youth within the community. But further measures to address this issue are needed. We will continue to gather longitudinal data from this cohort 
so that we have a better sample size to further analyze potential association and trends in mental health issues in conflict affected community. Data collection is ongoing and the medical supplies are depleted. Then we aim to produce a manuscript and submit to a peer review journal tentatively at the end of this year. As the end note, we would like to express gratitude to the hospital management team and a UK-based charity group that supported this project for a year. We would also extend our half appreciation to the editorial committee of MSF Asia Scientific Deal 2023 for providing an opportunity to share our findings to reach a wider audience. For any comments and questions, please reach out to these emails. Thank you, everyone. Although this is a recorded one, but we should be really thankful to him because he has been working in a very difficult situation and documenting all his patients uh, related to the mental health. Really a very good work and we hope to hear from him in the future also. Now we move to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Shohana Siddiq, epidemiologist, medicine and affairs, and she will be talking about understanding the characteristics, caregiving pathway, and medical services provided to sexual and gender-based violence survivors in Kamranji Chautaka. Dr. Shofik. for giving me this opportunity today. So I'll start with a very strong quotation from one of our mental health counselors from the MSF Kamrangi Chorklin. We have to raise our voices against abuse. Today, one raises her voice, tomorrow another. And one day, the whole world will speak out. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sohana Sadiq, and today I'm going to present the retrospective analysis of our HGBB clinic data from Metsasan Frontiers Kamrangichar project to better understand the characteristics of the survivors, their health seeking behaviors, and the services provided to the service uh, to the survivors in our clinic. Before I start, I would like to take some moment and introduce you to MSF and its vital operation or services that we have in Bangladesh and especially in Kamrangichar. So MSF, also known as Metsas on Frontiers or Doctors Without Borders, actually started its, of its operation in Bangladesh in 1985. And since 1992, it had a continuous presence in this country. And since 2013, MSF OCA, that's the Operation Center Amsterdam, has been providing its medical services in Kamrangichar, which is also known as a crowded peri-urban area situated in Dhaka, with a population of over 1 million residing in under 4 square kilometers. And most of the residents of this area are economic migrants who are looking for job opportunities in small-scale factories. And approximately 47% of these local populations are women, with an average age group of between 15 to 25. So in MS, uh, MSF in Kamrangichar is currently running two urban health clinics with focusing on three main key elements or pillar, or pillar of care that we say that includes occupational health care, and it has a component of injury mitigation and hazard assessments inside the factory, providing occupational health services to the, these informal factory workers, as well as providing the tetanus vaccination to them. 
we have a component of sexual and reproductive health services that includes family planning, vaccination to the ANC mothers, as well as the vaccination to the under five children. And we also have a very unique component of HGVB care that entitles few unique features as well, like the very strong outreach and community engagement that helps us to work closely with our community. We have a safe identification of the survivors inside the community that supports the decentralized services that we offer in this uh, community. We also provide comprehensive care that not only includes the medical services, but it also has a component of psychosocial support. And we don't have a, no mandatory reporting by the survivor to the police. And we also have a safe referral pathway, meaning referring the survivors to the other services like protection, shelter, or the supports they might need. It's also important for us to know why HGVB or sexual and gender-based violence is so important in this context. So a recent study indicated that alone in Bangladesh, around 73% women, especially the married women, experience violence at least once in their lifetime, and 54% experience sexual violence and between 2001 to 2019, around 15,000 individuals were raped. And it's not only the scenario in Bangladesh, it's a global pandemic as well. Globally, it's been seen that one in every three women experience either physical violence or sexual violence at least once in their life. The data and statistics were evident, and it was founded in various uh, journals and articles. However, when we looked for a peer review, we realized that there was still a critical lack of understanding these survivors' characteristics, their health-seeking behaviors, as well as the timely access to care, especially in a urban settings like Bangladesh. So, when I talk about the timely access to care, I need to mention here that uh, the timely access to care is meant the survivor coming within the initial 72 hours of the incident, as it is considered as a cap time where the prophylaxis are more effective. And we conducted this retrospective analysis with the aim to generate the evidence to inform the current model of care that MSF Kamnangichar project is providing at this moment, and also facilitate the advocacy perspective. And since this was a retrospective analysis, it met the exemption criteria from the MSF Ethical Review Board, as well as we also showed the ethical approval from a local institute called CIPRB, also known as Center for Injury, Research, Injury Prevention and Research Bangladesh. So this retrospective analysis was done among the survivors who actually presented at MSF clinics in Kamrangichor between the time period of October 2013 to June 2021, and the data were collected from a standard MSF HGBB data collection tool. So we used our statistical software for the analysis as well as we created uh, frequency table and we did a chi-square test to understand the uh, value and we ex also excluded the missing data from our total sample. So now the results section, uh, what were the findings, what we were able to find out based on the data that we had. Uh, the first point that I would like to highlight was survivors characteristics and their origin. So among the, uh, so between the study period, we saw that there was an overall around 7,900 survivors actually consulted our MSF clinics in Kamrangi Chot, and majority of the survivors were actually women, and only six of them were male, which was even less than 0.1%. And most of the survivors were between the age group of 15, to 19. 
and 3% of them were equal or below 14 years. That means a very young adolescent group. And in the origin part, um, most of the survivors were actually coming from our catchment area, mainly from the different administrative area from uh, where MSF works in Kamrangicha. And if you look at the map on your right, uh, you'll see that most of the survivors were from Ward 5 and Ward 3. Uh, from Ward 5, it was mainly 23%, and from Ward 3, it was 16%. We also wanted to look at the type of violence with the complications that survivors were coming to us. And we divided the type of violence into four major categories, uh, starting from the physical gender-based violence, rape, psychological gender-based violence, and sexual gender-based violence, other than the rape. So when we went further in depth into the types, we realized that the findings indicated that uh, the physical gender-based violence were accounting for most of the violence, which was around 56%, followed by rape, 30%, psychological gender-based violence, 11%, and sexual gender-based violence other than rape was 3%. We have also noticed an increasing trend of psychological violence over the time, ranging from 6% to 20% from 2014 to 2014. It was also important for us to understand who were these perpetrators. We were having survivors uh, in our clinic, but who were those perpetrators? So when we analyzed, uh, the data indicated most of the time the perpetrator were their intimate partner, mainly in our context it's a husband. So 75% time the perpetrator were husband and 12% time it was husband along with the in-laws. So timely access to care was another very important and crucial factor that we wanted to analyze and observe to see and evaluate our model of care. And as I mentioned during my uh, initial slide, that the timely access to care, we meant like within the first or initial 72 hours of the incident. Since it's a cap time where the prophylaxis are more effective and it also helps to protect unwanted pregnancy and uh, STI or like sexually transmitted infections. So especially for the rape survivors. So in general, for the rape survivors, 63% uh, of them arrived to our health facility after the initial 72 hours. And the scenario was more posed for those young adolescents, especially those who were equal or below 14 years. For them, 87% arrived late to our health facility. And those women who were raped by their non-intimate partner arrived late compared to those who were raped by their intimate partner. So, Take of packages is also another important aspect. Like there, we now know like how the characteristics look like that timely access to care. But the medical packages that we were offering, how was the uptake? Was it accepted, or if it's accepted, how they were accepting it? So in general, the uptake for the rape survivor who were arriving within the 72 hours, 80% of them took HIV test. 76 percent accepted STI prophylaxis, 53 percent accepted tetanus vaccination, and 47 percent accepted post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. However, the situation for the young adolescent was mixed. For them, 83 percent accepted HIV test, 23 percent accepted STI prophylaxis, 19% took tetanus vaccination and only 3% accepted post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. So this was another aspect since we are talking about decentralizing and the referral pathway, our working closely with the community. So it was important for us to understand how the survivor were actually coming to us. I mean, how they're coming to our clinic. So we divided it into a two broader perspective. 
one by the type of violence and another one based on the age group. So for the type of violence, the result indicated that the rape and physical gender-based violence survivors were coming to us through our MSF outreach activity in the community. And for the psychological violence, 36% of them were coming through self-referral. And based on age for the young adolescents, mostly they are coming to us through other MSF services, followed by outreach activity and self-referral. And for 15 and above year survivors, they were coming mostly through outreach activity, followed by self-referral and through other MSF services. Like any other study or analysis, we also had few limitation and strengths. And today I'm going to focus some key limitations and strengths for you. So one of the possible limitations that uh, we understood was the possible underrepresentation of the sexual violence data, especially for males and children. And we also want to mention that uh, the missing information of the utilization of certain packages and medical services that we provide, especially the mental health data. And we shouldn't forget that the analysis was completely based on a quantitative data. So there was no qualitative data to support the findings or the interpretation or even to explain the survivor's perspectives experience or their health seeking behavior from their point of view. And as a strength, we actually analyzed a vast quantity of data that both eight years of HGBB consultation data from MSF clinic. We also looked at the very different factors that could possibly explain or influence the timely access to care by the survivors. And also the findings of this analysis contributes to generate evidence on HGBB, especially in an urban setting like Bangladesh. So if I have to sum up uh, the findings, uh, HGBB is a high burden, and I guess we have already seen it was around 83% um, for physical and gender-based violence and rape in together. And uh, the violence were mostly or commonly seen among young women who were attending MSF services in Kamrangichar. And timely access to care was generally influenced not only by the age of the survivor, but also it based on the type of violence that they were suffering or suffered, and also by their relationship with the perpetrator. And violence is usually experienced early in life and for those the uptake of medical packages were low and also very low and outreach referral for this young adolescent group and we have also used the findings of this analysis to restructure our internal pathway of referral inside the MSF clinic. And as a next step um, we have also proposed a participatory action research that designed together with the survivors, communities, and service providers to better understand the situation, the AGBB perspective, and to further inform the urgent actions in this sector. Um, so on behalf of the team, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions during the Q&A session throughout the day, or even you can reach out to me through the email address. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So you are already actually consumed our time slot, but we have the last speaker from our session. So Dr. Fatima Khondoka is a research officer, Department of Public Health and Informatics, Pongabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. And she'll be talking about situation and child rights to protection in the slum settlement of urban Dhaka in the COVID-19. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Khandogar Fatima, Research Officer, Department of Public Health and Informatics, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. My study title is 
situation of child rights and protection in slum settlement of urban Dhaka in COVID-19 pandemic, a mixed math study. The goals of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development goals are long term in nature, but they are intrinsically linked to human rights in general and children's rights in specific. The United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child concludes that children have the right to love, care, and protection. Uh, protection from abuse. In Bangladesh, approximately 7% of children are engaged in child labor. During the last year's COVID-19 outbreak, Bangladesh experienced a 13% increase in child marriage as, they, they, as the deadly virus devastated societies and economy. The study objective was to gain an understanding of the situation for children living in Dhaka's urban slum settlement in terms of their rights to provision and protection during the COVID-19 pandemic. Specific objective was to understand the people's perception and knowledge about child rights and protection in urban slum area of Bangladesh, to understand the survival and development rights of slum children through exploring their basic living, health care and education situation in the current pandemic crisis, to understand the child rights to protection by exploring how people respond to child maltreatment and prevent children from being physically or psychologically harmed. It was a mixed matter study. The study was conducted out of 17 C block North Adabur Slam Adabur Dhaka from January 2021 to December 2021. The sample frame was uh, fixed through demographic mapping. We made a list of 521 families with children aging from 7 to 17 years. The numbers of this household is considered as a sample frame in this study. This is the map of the, uh, the area, Adabot Slum. For sample size, in the qualitative part, we have done 12 in-depth interviews in which three girls, three boys, three mothers, and three fathers were included. For the quantitative part, we have done 374 face-to-face uh, uh, -face interview of the parents who live in the study region and had a less, at least one child between the ages of 7 to 17 years. Sampling technique for the qualitative part was purposive and for the quantitative part was simple random sampling. For the data collection, we have used uh, interview schedule for qualitative part. And in the quantitative part, we have used socio demographic questionnaire, food insecurity questionnaire, ICAS P P tool, modified tool on CPSP to explore rights of protection, provision, and participation. For the data analysis, in the qualitative part, we have used a uh, thematic content analysis in which qualitative data was collected up to data saturation and analysis was done as outlined in the figure. First, we have got, my, got our transcript, then we have extract the meaning unit, then condensed the meaning unit, and we have coded the units, then we subcategorize, then categorize, and ultimately the theme have emerged. In the quantitative part, we have done frequency and percentage, arithmetic means and the standard deviation, multiple regression analysis. We have done our analysis for the SPSS Windows version 2016. Ethical permission was obtained from the Institutional Review Board of Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. In the results section, uh, for the qualitative part, we have uh, found the theme covert. The sub theme were four uh, first, the perception, then provision, protection, and lastly, the participation. In the uh, perception, we have, uh, we have found two categories. First one is children's understanding of child rights, and second, the parents' understanding of child rights. In the provision section, we have found two categ uh, three categories economic hardship, disruption of facilities due to COVID 19, unhygienic living conditions. For the protection section, we have found two categories, unsafe environment for children, child rights situation of parents during their childhood. And in participation, there is only one category, lack of participation. For the quantitative uh, findings, we have uh, found that uh, index child age mean was 12.26 years, 
male was 48% and female was 52%. For the parents, mean age was 35.5 years. 15.5% were male and 84.5% were female because we have collected data in daytime when uh, most of the male was in work. Family size uh, mean was 4.41 and the number of children mean is uh, 1.99. Other socio-demographic characteristics, here we can see that uh, 184 parents uh, achieved non-formal to grade 5 uh, level education. Most of the parents uh, was uh, involved in single occupation. These are the 292. Uh, most of the parents uh, were fem females, so we have got the occupation as a housewife, which is a 234 frequency. And we involved all the uh, parents, so most of the uh, parents were married, obviously, the, the number is 346. When we can see the impact of COVID-19 in family income, we have found that uh, income reduced remarkably is 49% and reduced little is 36%. Food insecurity status based on the last 30 days reference period, we can see that 54.5% um, family have faced mild, mild insecurity in their COVID period. Here is the percentage distribution of children's right to protection. We can see that psychological abuse is highest, which is 93.9% for, for the past year uh, prevalence and 94.7% uh, for lifetime prevalence. And uh, we also see that uh, almost 100% parents has done their, uh, their children positive disciplining. And we have found sexual abuse so much low, that is 0.8%, because we have used the ICAST free tool, which we produce only the parent uh, perception, not the child. So we have found a less amount of psych uh, sexual abuse. Here, the distribution of physical abuse by sex, we can we found that male are mostly uh, physical abused, which we have found that hit on the buttock, took child, and uh, painful knee is uh, mostly uh, male are affected by this kind of physical abuse and uh, female are less abused for uh, physical physically here the distribution of different risk factors related to total child maltreatment we have found uh, some of the risk factor one of them is the sex of the index child here reference was female so male are being more affected for child uh, child maltreatment Sex of the caregiver, here is the reference was male. So female, female caregiver is more prone to do child maltreatment. Education of the caregiver, here we find the up to primary is the reference. Uh, so the, uh, who, uh, the parents who attain uh, below the primary level education are more associated with the child maltreatment. Median per capita income of the caregiver here is the reference is below median per capita income. So the uh, uh, the family who have below the median per capita income are more related to the child maltreatment. Family income during COVID-19 here reference is fully stopped. So we found that the uh, family who have faced the income fully stopped are more related to the child maltreatment. Allow pay always here is reference is no. Uh, so the uh, parents who allow their children to play mostly time are more associated with the maltreatment. We have uh, found this uh, in the qualitative part that the uh, if, uh, playing issue with the playmates or neighbors, uh, it is uh, aggravate the child maltreatment. So these, uh, people, these children who are uh, more allowed to uh, play in the uh, neighborhood are being more maltreated. Treatment from the physician here is references no. So the uh, children who are treated from the physician are less associated with the child maltreatment. Anybody helps the index child to study? Their reference is no. So the, who, uh, the children who have help, get help from the family are less maltreated. Index child can attend online class during the corona. Their reference is no. So the children who uh, attend the online class during corona are less child maltreated. Our model fit is 23%, uh, uh, or that is variation expressed 23%, and it's good model fit.
So we can conclude that poverty is strongly linked to the violation of child rights according to the findings of the study. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic crisis which has resulted in significant job losses and income reduction have intensified poverty, putting some children at an even greater risk of abuse. Here, here is the, some photograph during the study. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Now we have heard five brilliant presentation in this session, and the session is now open for discussion. I, if anybody have any question, we have four presenter here. So, any any question to any presenter? Um, so, um, my question is, um, can you explain like why there is less of prep What else to move away from? Um, so basically, uh, we just want to understand that uh, there is uh, such a low for taking the SDI Actually, uh, so it's raised, 
and uh, we are working on it. As I mentioned, it is a very unique uh, model of care for our HGTV survivors, and we really work very closely to the community. We have the decentralized approach, and uh, in the last slide, I have mentioned that based on the findings, we have actually restructured our referral pathway, especially within our MSA clinic. Uh, I can give you some examples like more safe identification of the survivor so that they feel safer to come and also explain to us or even tell us what are their issues. Uh, we also have a designated space like a floor only for the HGTV survivor where we not only provide the medical services, but also the psychosocial support that stays as a separate lab facility for the patient as well as the pharmacy. So we are working on it and hopefully in coming days the uptake will increase but we also need the, like a strong approach and commitment from our side and also the stake of understanding the community that we can do further during our study. Thank you. I yes. think we have I have a question for Dr. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I wanted to ask you is it that international organizations like MSA have any role in Makite to do the prevention of the uh, Thank you so much for the question. Yes, definitely <clears throat> the international organizations have a very prominent role uh, for the prevention of the cervical cancer with the government of Bangladesh. For example, we can mention about uh, UNFPA, UNICEF, they all are working, WHO, they are working very closely with the government of Bangladesh. And we, you will be very happy to know that the government of Bangladesh have the prevention strategy of the cervical cancer that is 2017 to 2022. That was also supported by the UNFP, UNICEF, and WHO. And uh, I would like to mention another uh, information that for this year we have started to update that strategy because uh, 2020-30 is uh, approaching very nearly. So we are updating that strategy. And uh, with government of Bangladesh and also not only the UN organizations like the academic institutes like Bangamondo Sheikh Mojib Medical University that uh, has a very prominent role for the prevention of cervical cancer because Bangamondo Sheikh Mujib Medical University has a, a prevention program uh, which is led by Professor Ashraf Nisra Madam. Like they are doing a, a job uh, for the, all over the country for the diagnosis and prevention of the cervical cancer, especially the via test, which has been also reflected in the every Upojala Health Complex or sub-district uh, sub health center in Bangladesh. So academic institutes are also working for the prevention of cervical cancer. And I also want to mention about the OGSB, which is also playing a very vital role, and gynecologists and obstetricians, and we are the public health person. So I should say this is a very multi-sectorial approach, and now we are trying to involve the community more and more. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think for the sake of time, the last question. The last question. Thank you, uh, yeah, ma'am. I want to ask curiosity actually of the more than a question. So you presented that uh, you know there is multiparity and uh, younger age, uh, marital age, which is actually has a positive uh, kind of detection on uh, on cancer cervix detection. What my concern is is was was there particular care taken? Is this a bias that shows within the society that actually reflects in the prevalence of uh, the cases, or does it have a direct, actually direct impact? Because it is, I mean, I, I hope I'm clear. Right? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the data I have presented, uh, in my presentation, I have mentioned that, that this data was collected during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was a great challenge for us. And as it was collected from the tertiary level hospitals like BSA Bengal Cancer Institute, 
Dhaka Medical College and Manushik Medical College. So this is a very much hospital-based data. So when we are discussing about the hospital-based data, we have to be a little bit uh, interpret this data a little bit carefully. That means we all know that these are the patients who already have been under the hospital and they have been diagnosed in the hospital setting. So uh, in, the, in my recommendation, as I said, for the multi-sectoral approach, maybe if we do this type of study in the community, I can give your answer directly. Because as these were uh, already diagnosed, they are little bit middle age or older age women, so we have to uh, investigate this a little kind of retrospective. But if we could also do a, a study, that could be a cohort type of study design, or we could also talk with the adolescents so we and follow up them, then we can establish whether that has a, a relationship. But the uh, different kind of literatures have the evidences that the early marriage, the multiparity, it has some kind of association with the early prognosis of breast cancer. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are at the end of our session. Uh, my duty is to summarize the session, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to take that much time. I used to attend sessions on non-communicable diseases, epidemiology, especially cardiovascular disease epidemiology, attend seminars or chairing seminars, but this is a different kind of session that I'm actually attending or chairing. It's a varied presentation and different aspects of NCT are actually brought up here and presented nicely by the presenter. Faria presented very nicely about the cervical cancer and she looked at it through gender lens. Who else can look in the, through gender lens rather than Dr. Faria? I mean, very good. Thank you very much for your this, uh, initiative. And I hope you will come up with your cohort studies in the future. And then we have heard from Dr. Ashraf Islam about e use of EEG and the prediction of neurodevelopment disorder through EEG. I, I think your work will actually help in changing practice or the impact on the practice in using utilizing EEG for uh, prediction of neurodevelopment disorder. Then we have heard about mental health impact in conflict-prone area, that is in internally displaced population in Myanmar. Dr. Yan Lin actually worked very hard and uh, presented nicely about his work, especially the psychological distress the people is going through in these internally displaced pop, uh, areas, the population in this area. And then we heard about uh, uh, gen sexual and gender violence-based survivors in Cambrian Zero, the service by NSF. I would like to thank NSF for providing services to this neglected area in, in the different underprivileged groups. And interesting findings were there. You can see, I can see that uh, psychological violence is going up, the trend but as well as the uh, physical violence is going down. So we need to look at the underlying feature, what is going, what, what is going through the society. And we probably, MSF, need to think about providing psychological care regarding this, uh, from this kind of study. Then we heard about the situation of child rights from uh, Dr. Fatima. Very interesting, and it has been done in the COVID period. In, try to collect data in, 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 in some population and good insight to the child, uh, the child rights issues. I think with this, I'd like to end this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have some memos Thank you so much. for uh, presenter. Yeah. So, uh, organizers, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Sohil Raja Choudhury, sir, and respected panelists for the amazing and insightful discussion. We have our respected guest for inauguration ceremony. But before that, I would ask for a minute uh, and request the team to bring along the gift. And I request our chair to distribute the gift to the respected speakers.
Dr. Faria Hassin. Dr. Kaji Ashraful Islam. Dr. Sohana Sadiq. And Dr. Khandakar Fatima. I also request Farhat Manto to hand over the token of appreciation to our chair. Thank you so much. We will proceed to the next and most awaited part of this program. The time has arrived for a momentous occasion, the official inauguration of this distinguished event. We are profoundly honored to be graced by the presence of our honorable guests, whose influence in this field of medicine is truly unparalleled. Our respected guests for the inaugural ceremony have been among us. Join with me to welcome them. I know the time is limited, so we are eagerly waiting to hear from them. I will not stint my introduction. So we have among us our chief guest, Professor Dr. Mohammad Sharfuddin Ahmed, Vice Chancellor, Bangamundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, who has been at the helm of academic excellence and is a true pioneer leader in this field. We have Dr. Farhat Mahato, Executive Director, MSF South Asia, Dr. Manto's visionary leadership has been instrumental in driving healthcare innovation across South Asia. We have Dr. Rabia Khatun, medical doctor and advisor to the country representative MSF Bangladesh. She has been working in the area of public health since last 20 years. We expected Dr. Bijoy Kumar Pal, Associate, Associate Professor and Chairman in Charge from Department of Public Health and Informatics, but unfortunately, due to his sudden sickness, he is not able to come today. We have Dr. Sharful Islam, Professor, Department of Public Health and Informatics, BSMMU, a respected and beloved mentor who has contributed significantly to the advancement of the public health knowledge and practice. We also have Dr. Faria Hasin, Member Secretary of the Steering Committee, MSF, Scientific Test 2023, the head of the Reproductive and Child Health Division, HI and BSMMU. Dr. Hassan's dedicated effort in steering this event towards success deserve our deepest gratitude. I humbly request our respected guests to take their seats on the stage. This inauguration ceremony. Firstly, I would request Dr. Faria Hassin to say a few words for the audience. Dear esteemed guests, distinguished faculty members, and fellow researchers, I'm honored to extend my warm welcome to every one of you on behalf of the Department of Public Health and Informatics, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. I want to highly begin by expressing my heartful gratitude to MSF for hosting this event in collaboration with Bangamundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, which is widely recognized as a leading center for medical research in Bangladesh. The MSF Scientific Days Conference provides a unique opportunity for attendees to connect with peers working in similar fields and facing common challenges in different contexts without, within Asia. Since its inception in 2015, this conference has served as a hub for experts working in the humanitarian and academic field, providing a platform to showcase their research and innovation work, exchange knowledge about the trends and challenges in innovation and healthcare, and foster collaboration. This year, MSF is collaborating with the Department of Public Health and Informatics of Bangamundi Medical 
University to organize the event. PSMMU is the leading institution for postgraduate medical education and research in Bangladesh, equipped with state-to-art teaching, research, and serve technology in advanced departments. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to the chief guest of this scientific conference, the Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Dr. Mohammad Sharfuddin Ahmed, Pro Vice Chancellor Education, Pro Vice Chancellor Administration, and Pro Vice Chancellor Research and Development of Bangamundi State Medical University for their unwavering support and enthusiasm towards the development of the public health and uh, research sector. I would like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to Professor Dr. M. Atikul Hawk, Dean, Faculty of Preventive and Social Medicine, Chairman, Department of Public Health and Informatics, Member, Chairing Committee, and Member Secretary of the Abstract Review Committee for this invaluable contribution. I would also like to thank Professor uh, Sir Choriful Islam, Chairman of the Abstract Review Committee, and member of the steering committee for his support and guidance throughout the project. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the extend members to the steering committee and abstract review committee who played a crucial role in the successful outcome of the project. His hard work, dedication, and expertise have been instrumental in achieving our goal. Today's event is of particular significance as we come together to advance our collective efforts in addressing the complex and ever-evolving health challenges that our world is currently facing, investing in scientific research and supporting the next generation of researchers is crucial for our future success. It is equally important that we leverage the expertise of experienced researchers and health professionals to ensure that young researchers receive the guidance they need to succeed. At the core of our efforts in, is the desire to empower young researchers to realize their full potential this program serves as a pivotal initiative that bridges the gap between young and experienced researchers, empowering the former by providing them with the opportunity to collaborate with and learn from experts in their respective fields. Our ultimate goal is to equip researchers with the confidence and skills raised to take ownership of their research and make their voice heard. To this end, we emphasize the need for the multi-sectoral approach to promoting scientific research and empowering researchers. This entails collaboration among government, academia, industry, and non-government organizations to create a supportive and enabling environment for scientific research. We must invest in research infrastructure, provide scholarships and fellowships to aspiring researchers, and create opportunities for them to collaborate with research culture. By fostering collaboration and providing opportunities, we can empower researchers, clinicians, and health professionals to address the world's most pressing health challenges um, through active. This program will serve as a valuable platform for sharing knowledge, building networks, and fostering collaboration among researchers and health professionals from different backgrounds and disciplines. The insights and discussion that we'll share today will help us to advance our collaborative effort toward building a healthier, more equitable world. We would like to extend our sincere appreciation to the esteemed Vice Chancellor Professor Dr. Mohammad Sarfuddin Ahmed <coughs> for gracing us with his presence at this sacrifice confidence. It was his visionary leadership and innovative insight that led to the creation of this successful program. We are immensely grateful to his invaluable contribution toward advancing the field of science and research. Thank you for your attention and I wish you all an informative and productive program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Faria Hassan, for sharing your great ideas and recommendations. Now I would request Professor Dr. Soyed Shariful Islam to share your valuable words with us, please. Good afternoon. I've been given the task to welcome you all from the Department of Public Health and as well as the Department Medical University. So I'll make my welcome speech a bit short because we are running a bit late and we are eager to hear from our chief guests. And also we have two special guests uh, such as uh, Dr. Farhad Mento and Claudia Migeleta. So we are eager to hear from them. But uh, to start with, I must thank our Honorable Vice-Chancellor, Professor Sharfuddin Ahmad and his team for 
providing us all around support to make this program successful. And also I must mention two names, Dr. Rabia Khatun and Dr. Faria Hasin, the two engines for this program, their relentless work and also persuasion made possible successful, made possible to success of this program. So I must thank two of you. And also I must mention our uh, ex-student, Dr. Sadia. Sadia, can you ra raise your hand for your excellent work? And also I must personally thank Dr. Srivastav. Dr. Srivastav, he was extremely helpful to us in providing guidance, support, and whenever we needed any expertise help, Dr. Sivarsa was there, so I must thank them. And today we had some interesting se sessions and we'll cover a range of issues in the afternoon sessions such as tuberculosis, non-communicable disease, older people, so on and so forth. And I must say that the MSF, personally, I'm familiar with the MSF as a medicine without border or from, what? Do, do, doctor Without Border, I mean, we came to know that name in early 80s and 90s of the last century. And then there was a time when we were quite dismayed by the Nobel Pri uh, Peace Prize coming to us, the controversial political leaders such as Clark of South Africa, and then Israeli Prime Minister, I don't know how they got the Nobel Prize, and suddenly we hear the name, the Doctors Without Border got the Nobel Prize, and that actually excited us that at least something different happened. Anyway, so MSF is uh, actually working in the humanitarian front in Bangladesh, and we already heard from one of their uh, researcher about the mental health and the issues, and also one from the Kamrangir Chal, and also I came to know that they are working intensively with the Rohingya communities, the displaced communities. I must thank MSF for their good work in Bangladesh and hopefully they will continue their good work, not only in Bangladesh but also South Asia and worldwide. So finally I must thank today's organizers, those who organized the session to make this uh, program successful and also the foreign expertise. We have a list of expertise in front of me such as the ICDDRB, and DNDI, BSMMU, MSF South Asia, uh, Lizia General Hospital, DG Health, CDC, Sultan Idris Shah Hospital, Karolinska Institute and, and and many others. So I must thank all of them and hopefully this session, the afternoon session will be successful. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Saad Sheriful Islam Sir. Department of Public Health and Informatics, BSMMU, always have its door open to the new ideas and collaboration and it continues to do so. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Rabia Khatun to say her valuable words to us, please. Honorable <coughs> Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor Dr. Mohammad Sharifuddin Ahmed, and uh, officials from Ministry of Health and other ministries, uh, senior faculty members from Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, uh, good afternoon. And also I would like to welcome MSF offices and audiences from all over the world. Uh, you are being with us since morning. So first of all, I would like to thank BSMMU, especially our Vice Chancellor Sir, for their co collaboration in holding this important uh, conference and I'm ha happy to be part of this. I would like to inform you that MSF was born 
along with Bangladesh in the same year, in 1971. So many of you maybe know it, but I wanted to repeat, it, repeat this information. So since more than 50 years, MSF is providing uh, free emergency medical assistance to people in distress, victims of natural and man-made disasters, and situations in uh, emergency more than 70 years, uh, 70 countries we are now providing our services. And People's Republic of Bangladesh has hosted MSF from its first intervention in 1972. So since uh, from the very beginning uh, of birth of Bangladesh, we are here intermittently, we are working, uh, and this partnership has been built on mutual trust, reliability and respect for qualitative medical and humanitarian interventions. MSF has been providing emergency medical humanitarian assistance in this country and our current intervention in Cox's Bazar uh, is uh, uh, started, has been started in two, 2009 since Kutupalong Field Hospital was established to serve both Rohingya refugees and the local Bangladesh community. So we are not only serving the uh, refugee community, but we are also serving host community. And these, all these services are free of cost. So this, uh, since nine, August 2017, during the influx of forcibly displaced population, into Bangladesh, uh, MSF scaled up operations, uh, including three hospitals, three primary healthcare uh, centers we have here, one health post, and two specialized clinics. So I am uh, uh, saying on behalf of Bangladesh, so I will be talking more on Bangladesh activities. And MSF also supports Shodar Hospital with infection prevention control, medical waste management, and Okhia Upojala Health Complex with mental and psychiatric health services and many more. MSF is also providing services to uh, supports to water and sanitation in large parts of the camp and is at the front line of the response to outbreaks, different outbreaks. We have, we have seen outbreak of diphtheria, acute watery diarrhea, COVID-19 and now we are seeing dengue. So all these uh, emergency situations are being supported by MSF as much as possible. MSF is working in, you, you have already heard that MSF is working in Dhaka also, in Kamrangichor. I will not uh, repeat those uh, information. And since uh, I am happy to say that uh, since 1972, MSF is, has worked in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare to improve on healthcare standards and protocols appropriate to the national context. This has been the integral part of Bangladesh march towards achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. MSF has provided support for uh, medical pro protocols in uh, management and treatment of Kalazar and that has been, uh, we have been work, working in uh, Greater Mamising District and that protocol is now internationally recognized. So that is one of the success for both MSF and Bangladesh government. In the recent past, MSF has also helped conduct studies on resistance of malaria treatments in the Chittagong Hill Traps. That helped in the introduction of artesunate in combination therapy as first line treatment. Uh, we all know that hepatitis C is an emerging public health concern for the world and also in Bangladesh also we are uh, working on this. MSF, MSF is committed to demonstrating a decentralized model for the treatment of hepatitis C to contribute to national viral hepatitis elimination efforts. And recently MSF provided support to Ministry of Health uh, to develop guideline on hepatitis C which is being finalized. So together with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and Ministry of Disaster Management and Response MSF has been deploying for years its robust and high standard health projects and has always been on the front line of emergency responses. MSF continues to monitor the emergency needs of the population, 
natural disasters and other uh, neglected tropical diseases and all other uh, issues and propose interventions to the government based on the assessment of the needs. We would, we would like to look forward to continuing our mutual cooperation as per the country needs and I would like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity and for patient sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rabia Khatun. Now, I request the Executive Director of MSF South Asia, Dr. Farhat Manto, to share her thoughts with us. MSF has always played its part in every region of the world, serving the people who are neglected and need the attention most. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Islam, Dr. Fariha, Dr. Rabia Khatun, and uh, all my colleagues uh, in the room and on online. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to keep it very, very short because whatever I wanted to say, either Dr. Srivastava has mentioned in the morning or Dr. Rabha has uh, already spoken of. But I would only talk about four points because I do believe they are quite important and critical. The first one is why do we do scientific days? We are primarily a medical humanitarian organization that is into treating patients free of cost. And why are we sitting in this room today? We believe through these days, we are fostering collaboration and amplifying impact of work we experience in locations where there are neglected diseases as well as neglected populations. So the first one which is important is that this day is based on evidence, is based on science. So what we want to do th through this day is to encourage, empower current and future public health experts to address the, one of the silent em epidemics which is called infodemics, misinformation and disinformation that has caught us all around the world and amplified due to social media. Like any opinion is uh, floating around without being fact-checked, without being looked at where the source is. So through these days, we want to bring forth anything that we talk about. It is based in science. It is evidence-based. The second bit I already spoke about, through these days all over the world, we have, while we have this day here in Bangladesh, we would have this day also in UK, somewhere in Latin America and somewhere in Africa. So we would try to see that how do we bring and build a global community of exchange where we mobilize, where we make sure that, that the information doesn't stay in a certain part of the world. Because I did say it earlier, diseases don't know any borders. So the more we know, the better we are equipped to deal with it as a part of larger medical community. We also recognize that many topics we talk about today and we will continue talking about never make to the news headline because either they are not interesting enough because there is a certain fatigue or they only impact a certain part of population or they are invisible epidemics. And let me quote something that is very important. I'm sure you are aware tomorrow is World Mental Health Day. It's 10th of October and we think we all have the responsibility to look inwards and look around ourselves and raise awareness about mental health issues. Last but not the least, I hope that this dialogue doesn't stop today. I hope that this dialogue continues and we strengthen our collaboration, not only with BSMMU, but also all the stakeholders in Bangladesh. Long after MSF is gone, we do believe that, that we have colleagues from Bangladesh who go and work internationally and share their expertise. Thank you very, very much for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Manto. Now, without whose guidance, we may not have been fortunate enough to gather here today. 
who always been a catalyst for innovation and development. I humbly request our respected Vice Chancellor Sir, Dr. Mohammad Sharfuddin Ahmed, to say his valuable words to us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Respected Chairperson, Dr. Farhad Mantu, Chairperson of MSF, uh, Professor Islam, Dr. Faria, and Dr. Rabia Khatun, and all the dignitaries uh, in front of these, uh, in front of me. Uh, on the eve of my speech, I pay my deep respect to our father of the nation, and also I pay deep respect to the martyrs of 1975 and all the freedom fighters who sacrificed their life during our liberation war. And I also grateful to all the countries who supported us, including India and other countries during our liberation war. Uh, today, we have heard that we are the doctors uh, without borders, but the diseases are without border from long period. Nowadays, due to change of climates, I think in our country we have heard that there are some dengue, not only in Bangladesh, this is also in Europe, in Brazil, Argentina, and World Health Organization have told that about 50% of the population of the world will suffer from, from this. How it is coming? It is due to climate change, temperature rise, and all other things. So, the initiation of MSF, I think, today's initiation is highly uh, successful one as because they are working uh, without doctors without borders and they are working not only in the treatment, they are also wanting to remove the diseases, also they are wanting to help the humanitarian activities like Rohingya. You have heard that uh, in 1971, we were liberated and the doctors without borders, they have been liberated on that day and they are working for a long period. And today I am very much grateful that you have come here uh, to give a support to Bangladesh. You are working in uh, Ukhia, Kutupalong, in Cox's Bajar and also in Kamrangichor, uh, where you are working uh, for the uh, violence uh, against sexual and uh, gender violence. Also you are working with the mental health. Uh, our chairperson has already told, tomorrow is the World Mental Health Day. We all know during COVID, you heard that even you can uh, check yourself. If you want to see your mobile and you want to talk to someone, someone may forget. As because forgetfulness, dementia and insomnia all have come from COVID. And we should also uh, take uh, our special checkup for this and research work should be continued. What other things we have done? I have seen that the young persons are uh, sometimes they are due to myocarditis. There is the death of young person. Whether this was due to COVID or dengue, we should think of. Yes, last year we have heard that is in dengue, the death was very less. But this year it is much more. Whether that corona uh, COVID and this dengue, together they are causing some of the immune reaction which is uh, causing the death of the people. We should have some reaction, uh, we should have some research work as because our public health department, they are working very hard for a long period, they are working with long COVID and I am thinking that there will be long COVID OPD in my university that any patient who suffers in COVID but is still they are suffering from other diseases will continue to this. Uh, when I heard about the, this event uh, by uh, Rabia Khatun and Dr. Faria, I was very much excited because of the focus on humanitarian global health. This is an area what is near and dear to my heart. I wholeheartedly support the work of MSF, that is Doctors Without Borders, and other organizations that are working to improve the health of people around the world. I believe the humanitarian global health is about more than just treating diseases and saving lives. It is also about promoting human dignity, making the health care 
accessible and empowering people uh, to avail it. It is about facing the health problems, taking the lead and finding the solutions. When we work to improve the health of people in need, we are also working to build a better world. We are creating a world where everyone has the opportunity to live a healthy and productive life. I am proud to be a part of community of scientists, clinicians and policy makers who are working to make the difference in the world. Throughout the day, we will be discussing some burning health issues that need to be addressed in Asia as well as around the world, such as continuous threat of tuberculosis, the impending burden, burden of non-communicable diseases, hepatitis, neglected elderly health needs, and the crisis of forcibly displaced populations, that is Rohingyas. It is also known as forcible deported people from Myanmar. I welcome all the experts and the distinguished guests from different op uh, organizations and different countries who are working to solve these problems and find the best possible way to achieve the same goal. I am honored to have so many brilliant people at the years in this uh, conference, such as experts from ICDDRB, from DGHS, from Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, and also MSF South Asia, Lija General University of Malaysia, and also MC Master University, Mac Master University, and National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. We are also proud to have dedicated public health personnel at our university who will be sharing our work with you people. I sincerely thank MSF for organizing such an event, bringing together such diversity. My gratitude to our very own Department of Public Health and Informatics and their amazing team for making this a milestone for our country and also for our university. I thank all our guests from various respected organizations who came to attend the conference. I want to express my gratitude to Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, in particular for having us inspired, strengthened and empowered to improve the service, research and care for the health and well-being of our people. You all know that the Sheikh Hasina initiative, which have been recognized in UN Assembly and about 70 countries of the world, they have taken it as an example and this, uh, the Sheikh Hasina initiative is now used as the universal health coverage all over the world. So we are grateful to our Honorable Prime Minister. As per direction, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University is committed to work for the health for our people in need and only in our country, not the, pa the patient should not go abroad. In this uh, uh, way, we are going on. Let's take advantage of the opportunity to work together, share our, share our ideas, learn from each other, may the thoughtful conversations and hard work that take place in the event lead to innovative solutions, skills, that will make a real difference in the advance, advancement of the medical knowledge and ultimately the improvement of the healthcare outcomes. Thank you again for patient steering and I wish the success of this productive conference. With these few words, thank you very much. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabandhu, Long Live Bangladesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for supporting us through many ups and downs and guides us to achieve a better world. Now, I'd like to request Dr. Farhat Mantu to hand over the token of thanks to our respected speakers. Please uh, help her to hand over the Uh, Dr. Faria Hassan. 
I'd request Dr. Saeed Shariful Islam sir, please. Now respected Vice Chancellor sir, Professor Dr. Mohammad Sharifuddin Ahmed. Lastly, I'd ask all of you uh, to take your picture together. Okay, come on. Respected guests. Thank you so much. This inauguration symbolizes not just the beginning of our event. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you all. This inauguration symbolizes not just the beginning of our event, but also a collective affirmation of our commitment to advance healthcare, research, and knowledge. Now I want to announce a house announcement. We invite all attendees to partake a well-deserved lunch break. It's an opportunity to network, to engage with your peers. But please keep in mind that the schedule is tight, so please return by 2.15, 2.45 to ensure that we can stay on track. Please be back within 2.45. Thank you so much. Hepatitis C kills thousands of people worldwide every year. And it is increasing. Hepatitis C virus causes an infection that attacks liver. If the disease becomes chronic, it leads to severe liver damages. Like liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. But don't worry, you can prevent hepatitis C. Hepatitis C virus enters the body through blood-to-blood -blood contact. How does one have blood-to-blood -blood contact, you ask? 
by using unsterilized needles or syringes for medical care. Barbers using unsterilized old unclean razor blades. Use of unsterilized needles for tattoos and piercings. By blood transfusion if the blood has not been screened properly. So next time when you go for a shave or piercing or tattoo or to a doctor. Always insist on new needles, new razor blades, packet syringe and blood from only licensed blood banks. And oh yes, please don't share toothbrushes. They too can transmit hepatitis C. And sharing a toothbrush is simply gross. Be safe and stop hepatitis C. 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 My name is Dr. Mohamed Basroon Ahmed. मैं एमएसएफ यानी तबीबान बे सरहद के मच्छर कॉलोनी कराची में कायम करदा हेपेटाइटिस सी क्लिनिक में एक डॉक्टर की हैसियत से अपनी जिम्मेदारी सर अंजाम दे रहा हूँ ये क्लिनिक 2015 में कायम किया गया और यहाँ पे आज भी हम हेपेटाइटिस सी के हवाले से या काले पीलिया या काले यरकान के हवाले से इलाज कर रहे हैं हेपेटाइटिस सी या काले यरकान है क्या ये बीमारी हेपेटाइटिस सी वायरस से मुतासर खून के जरिए फैलती है और इसके फैलने की आम वजूहत में जरासीम शुदा सुइयों का इस्तेमाल दांतों के आलात का इस्तेमाल जरासीम शुदा शेविंग ब्लेड या दीगर आलात का इस्तेमाल या फिर मुतासर खून की मुंतकली शामिल है पाकिस्तान में इस बीमारी की शरह पाँच से दस फीसद है यानी अगर पाकिस्तान की आबादी बाईस करोड़ मान ली जाए तो तकरीबन ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा ढाई करोड़ अफराद जो कि कराची की आबादी के बराबर हैं वो इस मुल्क के अंदर इस बीमारी से मुतासर है हेपेटाइटिस सी एक वायरल इन्फेक्शन से शुरू होता है जो बिल आखिर जिगर की सोजिश का सबक बनता है हम इसे खामोश कातिल कहते हैं चूँकि इसकी अलामत बाहर तौर पर बहुत ही आम और मामूली होती है यही वजह है कि ये बीमारी गलती से एक आम बीमारी तस्वर की जाती है और बाज़ अवत कई सालों तक इसकी कोई अलामत ज़ाहिर ना होने की वजह से ना तो इसकी तशखीस होती है और ना ये सामने आती है हेपेटाइटिस सी की बीमारी का अगर बर वक्त इलाज ना किया जाए तो ये ख़तरनाक जिगर की बीमारियों में तब्दील हो सकता है मसला जिगर का सुखड़ना या फिर जिगर का कैंसर लेकिन अच्छी बात यह है कि नई अद्वियात और ज़्यादा मौसर इलाज मौजूद है और मर्ज की तशखीस के लिए नए तरीके भी दस्याब हैं इसके इलाज के लिए आपको कम अज़ कम सिर्फ तीन महीने की दवाई खानी होगी हेपेटाइटिस सी वायरस से बचाव या हिफाजत की कोई भी हिफाजती टीके या वैक्सीन दस्याब नहीं है लिहाजा इससे बचाव और हिफाजत की जिम्मेदारी आपकी अपनी है चंद हिफाजती तदाबीर हैं जिन पर अमल को यकीनी बनाएं जैसे कि जब भी ज़रूरत पड़े एक नए शेविंग ब्लेड या नए सिंज का इस्तेमाल करें अगर खून लेने की नौबत आए तो इस बात को यकीनी बनाएं कि खून टेस्ट शुदा हो और हेपेटाइटिस सी जैसे मर्ज से पाक हो सबसे अहम बात यह कि इस बीमारी से मुतल आगाही हासिल करें इब्तदाई तशीस और मौसर इलाज के लिए मुस्तकिल बुनियादों पर अपना मुआना करवाएं एम एस एफ दो हज़ार पंद्रह से कराची की मच्छर कॉलोनी में हेपेटाइटिस सी के मरीजों के लिए प्रोग्राम चला रहा है जिसमें सबसे ज़्यादा खतरे के शिकार आबादियों पर तोज्जो दी जाती है हेपेटाइटिस सी मुमकिन तौर पर एक मौलिक बीमारी है लेकिन आज हमारे पास इसके तशखीस और इलाज के लिए मौसर तरीके मौजूद हैं इस बीमारी के मुतल अपनी मालूम को बढ़ाइए और आज ही अपना मुआयना करवाइए Some people have fallen. Some people have died. Now we are running through every glass door, tripping over hurdles and crashing through the floor. Side by side, side.
Even the history that I'm going to make with the crow and the banana tree, it will make us lighter of feeling uh, when we see the situation, reminding us and connecting us with our heart to the land. That is separating little by little, particularly for the young generation. We're here in Kutupalong refugee camp in Bangladesh yeah. to come together, share stories about culture, practice culture in a way that reinforces it, values it. We started with a kisser gathering where the storyteller shared a range of stories around health, education, keeping culture strong. <laughs> Boromada Gor and Dilashil, Major Gor, Barimani, Girati and Dilashil, Afundi Kalato, Berindi, Gatia Gutu, Afurimani Daham, Tan Lagatimanche, Azakimani, Faretaki, Faramada Gorotaki. To have some locally made song, uh, locally made dancing, we have our own language, we have our own religious practice. Our culture, we are in Long Ji and Shah. One thing uh, I am very uh, proud of myself being a Rohingya, Rohingya uh, we have the generosity. Uh, no matter how poor I am, uh, people always show the generosity. I really, really impressed with the children's involvement because they are our future. If they don't involve such an activity for us, it is not easy to maintain our culture. Action made the government check and authority that the government has said Bangladesh can put it. The Hanuk book, Kumarzushi, Rasamaji, the Tigiri, the Kumiba does it in Haradas as they had just. Actually, the Mohila SB Shaker Hoy, but Rep Hoy. তখন খুবই খারাপ লাগে যে আমি একটা মেয়ে মানুষ এই যে আরেকটা মেয়ের প্রতি আমার মানে খুব সহানুভূতি হয় যদি আমি তাদেরকে সাহায্য করতে পারি এমএসএফ এর মাধ্যমে তখন আমার এটা খুব ভালো লাগে যে আমি একটা মহিলাকে সাহায্য করতে পারি তো বিশেষভাবে কেসগুলো আমরা পাইতেছি এখন যেগুলো পাচ্ছি মায়ানমারের যে রোহিঙ্গা আছে মায়ানমার রোহিঙ্গাদের ক্ষেত্রে আমরা বেশি কেস পাচ্ছি যে তিনজন পাঁচজন বা আটজন তারা র‍্যাপ হইছে এরকমও পাচ্ছি এবং কে তারা বানার বল হয়ে আসছে তাদের হাজবেন্ড তারপরে হচ্ছে 
তাদের বাচ্চা হারিয়ে গেছে বা তাদেরকে মিলিটারিয়া মেরে ফেলতেছে এবং তাদেরকে র্যাপ করতেছে এই টাইপের আর কি পাইতেছি তাদের তো কিছু নাই তারা এক দেশ থেকে আরেক দেশে আসছে তাদের খাওয়ার নাই পড়া নাই সবসময় তাদের শুধু চাওয়া থাকে মানে তারা কিছু পাবে এই আশায় আশায় তারা সবসময় থাকে তারপরে যদি একটা র্যাপ কেস আছে ওই ক্ষেত্রে তার চিন্তা আরো দ্বিগুণ হয়ে যায় যখন আমি পি এফ এটার দিই ওই মুহূর্তে দেখা যায় রোগীর কান্নাটাই আমি থামাইতে পারি না তখন তাদেরকে কান্না করার জন্য বা একটু মেন্টালি স্যাটিসফ্যাকশনের জন্য তাদেরকে সময় দিতে হয় হ্যাঁ বলতে পারি যেমন গত সপ্তাহে আমি একটা রুগী পেয়েছি ওই রুগীটার ব্যাপারে আমার মানে অনেক কষ্ট লাগছে পার্সোনালি সে যখন বাড়িতে ছিল তখন কিছু মায়ানমারের যারা এই দুর্যোগগুলো চালাইতেছে তখন তারা ওখানে অ্যাট্যাক করছে একটা করে তার বাচ্চাটাকে নিয়ে আর মহিলাটাকে এরপরে তিন থেকে চারজন মিলে তাকে দর্শন করছে বাংলাদেশে আইসে এখনো সে মানসিক ভাবে ঠিক আছে সে অবশ্যই সম্মান পাওয়ার যোগ্য আলহামদুলিল্লাহ <laughs> মশারা দিয়ে বো ডাক্তার <laughs> জামাই <laughs> বল <laughs> গরম পড়িব বই বাদে সঙ্গে উড়ে গরম মরে ঘরে বাসায় বাদে বা দিলে বেড়ার মধ্যে আসে গো তো গা টা নরম তাকে তো বসে গো তাহলে বাসা ঘর কি মানুষুরাইবো কেলা হলে 
এবছর ভিতরে মেসালার মধ্যে ধোয়া ললিয়ে ফারে তে হলে পয়েন্ট ফেস মতো না পাইব নিজের গায়ে ফারানো যাব গোব নিজের গা মধ্যেও বালা না গম না থাকিব গো গা মধ্যে বো মেসালা মধ্যে দু তিন বছর বাদে লইলে কয়েবেও ফেস মত পাইব বো সাম মতি ফুসে হরিও লাইক দূরে খেললে কালাই মিলাই নামলে তাকে নব মিলাই বো মিলাব There can be little doubt that our global environment is changing. The science is unequivocal. It's all too clear that we'll be seeing rising temperatures and sea levels, more frequent and intense extreme weather events such as heavy rains, heat waves, cyclones and floods. This will impact fundamental issues like access to food and water. This in turn will impact people's health. We're also likely to see new and changing diseases and people falling sick because of pollution. And people will start leaving their homes. Some places become uninhabitable over time. All existing projections point to large-scale changes ahead. We can only anticipate the humanitarian needs this will bring. and we need to adapt the way we work to be able to respond we know from experience that is the most vulnerable who will be the most affected making them even more vulnerable we know because we're already seeing them in our waiting rooms we're now looking at how we can best address this and get ready for the future we have chosen to do this through the lens of planetary health Planetary health is a relatively new health discipline. Uh, it focuses on the changes that humans are making to our environment and the impacts that that has on human health. These changes to the environment destabilize the natural ecosystem, causing climate change and pollution of our air, soil, and rivers. This, in turn, affects the water we drink and the air we breathe. It means we will see disruptions to our food production systems and changing patterns of diseases, such as malaria. It means we may see new diseases we didn't know before, and also the re-emergence of other diseases as the ecological conditions for transmission of diseases change. The main idea behind planetary health is that it is looking at how all this is linked and how humans are responsible for these changes. Our health depends upon the well-being of the planet, and the well-being of the planet depends on how we act. It is all linked. We are a medical humanitarian organization, so it touches us in two fronts. It touches us as medics, because as medics we are, con we are concerned about the health of the, our patients, their communities and the populations we are trying to serve. But also, as a humanitarian, we are concerned to preventing negative outcomes of humanitarian crisis. And we do know that the environment has an impact on health and has an impact to worsen already existing humanitarian crisis. So it's, it's part of who we are in a way. We are seeing now malaria in places where they were not before because the mosquito now can survive. We see introduction of mosquito transmitted diseases such as Zika or Dengue in urban settings in a larger scale. If the water changes temperature, the Vibrio cholera can survive easier. So there is a direct link between environment and environmental conditions and mainly the vector transmitted diseases. Donc quand on parle de regarder toute nouvelle intervention avec en intégrant un prisme euh, santé planétaire, c'est se dire OK Donc au niveau climatique ici, il se passe quoi Est-ce que les sécheresses sont plus sévères Est-ce que les pluviométries sont plus sévères Est-ce qu'il y en a moins Mais quand il y en a, elles lavent tous les sols. Est-ce qu'on a une augmentation de la température en moyenne euh, Qu'est-ce que ça implique pour les populations C'est toujours des éléments qu'on a, qu a regardés, mais sur lesquels on ne s'est pas nécessairement penché de façon systématique. On a besoin de savoir ça parce que ça, ça va induire des besoins médicaux opérationnels chez les populations qui peuvent probablement être différents de ce que c'était il y a dix ans.
Donc l'objectif de comprendre ce qui se passe d'un point de vue environnemental, d'un point de vue de température, d'un point de vue, euh, on va dire, entre guillemets, santé planétaire, mais ça regroupe tous ces phénomènes-là, c'est de pouvoir anticiper quels vont être les besoins des populations et comment nous, on va garantir qu'on met à disposition des services de santé qui correspondent aux besoins, et pas par rapport à bah, ce qu'on faisait d'habitude pour ce genre de problème. Our medical action is not fundamentally going to change but we are going to add an eco-friendly lens to it. Our medical action should not be implemented in a way that jeopardizes the future of our patient tomorrow. And our medical action needs to be aware the way we implemented it without jeopardizing quality and, and reactiveness, doing it in a way that is the less harmful for people and environment. We can cure people, but we also have to avoid making people sick. So we have a double responsibility as a, as a, as a medical organization of restoring physical health, but maintaining environmental health to avoid people getting sick tomorrow. As running hospitals, as running large medical programs, we are reviewing our way of working in those programs to be able to provide the same level of care. And, 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 and with the same speed and impact, but trying to make it in a way that does not contribute to the climate emergency. Donc on va faire bien pour les populations, on va s'adapter, mais nous, en tant qu'institution, est-ce qu'on est propre, en gros Est-ce que, est que nos pratiques ne contribuent pas elles-mêmes à, à la détérioration de, de la planète si on prend en charge les populations affectées par des, des maladies émergentes qui ont un, un, un lien avec une dégradation du climat, une dégradation de l'environnement, notre rôle, évidemment, c'est d'éviter que cet environnement se détériore un peu plus. Donc, pour moi, c'est normal que ça fasse partie intégrante du plan stratégique. Et c'est plus est-ce qu'on doit le faire ou euh, est-ce qu'on le fera dans dix ans. Non, on aurait probablement dû le faire il y a déjà dix ans. On est déjà largement en retard, mais maintenant, il faut qu'on avance euh, par rapport à ça. Quoi. Et on n'a pas le choix. On n'a pas le choix. We need to care for our patients in a way that does not harm them and their communities tomorrow. And for doing that, we need to take our own responsibility to be the most environmental friendly medical organization we can be. C'est très alarmant ce que racontent les communautés parce que généralement, nous, ici, on vit à base de l'agriculture et de l'élevage. Et ces deux secteurs-là ne répondent pas aux besoins de la communauté. Moi, ma préoccupation, c'est que si rien n'est fait présentement, je ne souhaiterais pas que mes parents aussi puissent euh, se développer à Magria. Les pluies se font très rares et aussi les pluies demeurent inégalement reparties. Au lieu qu'elles soient bien réparties dans le temps, maintenant c'est concentré en un mois. Par exemple, le mois d'août, on récolte plus de pluies. Et tu vois, la plupart sont pareilles. La terre ne donnait plus parce qu'on l'a surchargée. Et aussi, il n'y avait pas des apports nécessaires pour faire produire ces champs-là. Donc avant, quand on cultivait, c'est pour une année et même plus. Maintenant, c'est juste pour six mois. Et après les trois mois là de la période de soudure, ça c'est difficilement qu'on arrive à couvrir cette période.
Le paludisme demeure jusqu'à présent la pathologie dominante et qui tue la plus grande partie de la population depuis des années, quand il pleut. Nous avons développé une approche qui permet de sensibiliser les parents sur la précocité de la prise en charge. C'est vraiment une approche qui a beaucoup soulagé les parents qui trouvent sur place la prise en charge au lieu de faire des kilomètres. Hey, you! Yes, you. Did you know Hepatitis C kills thousands of people worldwide every year? And it is increasing. Hepatitis C virus causes an infection that attacks liver. If the disease becomes chronic, it leads to severe liver damages. Like liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. But don't worry, you can prevent Hepatitis C. Hepatitis C virus enters the body through blood-to-blood -blood contact. How does one have blood-to-blood -blood contact, you ask? By using unsterilized needles or syringes for medical care. Barbers using unsterilized old, unclean razor blades. Use of unsterilized needles for tattoos and piercings. By blood transfusion. If the blood has not been screened properly. So, next time when you go for a shave or piercing or tattoo or to a doctor. Always insist on new needles, new razor blades, packet syringes and blood from only licensed blood banks. And oh yes, please don't share toothbrushes. They too can transmit hepatitis C. And sharing a toothbrush is simply gross. Be safe and stop hepatitis C. 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 My name is Dr. Mohammed Basun Ahmed. मैं एमएसएफ यानी तबीबान ए बेसरहद के मच्छर कॉलोनी कराची में कायम करदा हेपेटाइटिस सी क्लिनिक में एक डॉक्टर की हैसियत से अपनी जिम्मेदारी सर अंजाम दे रहा हूं यह क्लिनिक 2015 में कायम किया गया 
اور یہاں پہ آج بھی ہم ہیپیٹائٹس سی کے حوالے سے یا کالے پیلیا یا کالے یرکان کے حوالے سے علاج کر رہے ہیں ہیپیٹائٹس سی یا کالے یرکان ہے کیا یہ بیماری ہیپیٹائٹس سی وائرس سے متاثرہ خون کے ذریعے پھیلتی ہے اور اس کے پھیلنے کی عام وجوہات میں جراثیم شدہ سوئیوں کا استعمال دانتوں کے آلات کا استعمال جراثیم شدہ شیونگ بلیڈ یا دیگر آلات کا استعمال یا پھر متاثرہ خون کی منتقلی شامل ہے پاکستان میں اس بیماری کی شرح پانچ سے دس فیصد ہے یعنی اگر پاکستان کی آبادی بائیس کروڑ مان لی جائے تو تقریباً زیادہ سے زیادہ ڈھائی کروڑ افراد جو کہ کراچی کی آبادی کے برابر ہیں وہ اس ملک کے اندر اس بیماری سے متاثر ہیں ہیپیٹائٹس سی ایک وائرل انفیکشن سے شروع ہوتا ہے جو بالآخر جگر کی سوزش کا سبب بنتا ہے ہم اسے خاموش قاتل کہتے ہیں چونکہ اس کی علامات بظاہر طور پہ بہت ہی عام اور معمولی ہوتی ہیں یہی وجہ ہے کہ یہ بیماری غلطی سے ایک عام بیماری تصور کی جاتی ہے اور بعض اوقات کئی سالوں تک اس کی کوئی علامت ظاہر نہ ہونے کی وجہ سے نہ تو اس کی تشخیص ہوتی ہے اور نہ یہ سامنے آتی ہے ہیپیٹائٹس سی کی بیماری کا اگر بر وقت علاج نہ کیا جائے تو یہ خطرناک جگر کی بیماریوں میں تبدیل ہو سکتا ہے مثلاً جگر کا سکڑنا یا پھر جگر کا کینسر لیکن اچھی بات یہ ہے کہ نئی ادویات اور زیادہ مؤثر علاج موجود ہے اور مرض کی تشخیص کے لیے نئے طریقے بھی دستیاب ہیں اس کے علاج کے لیے آپ کو کم از کم صرف تین مہینے کی دوائی کھانی ہوگی ہیپیٹائٹس سی وائرس سے بچاؤ یا حفاظت کی کوئی بھی حفاظتی ٹیکے یا ویکسین دستیاب نہیں ہے لہٰذا اس سے بچاؤ اور حفاظت کی ذمہ داری آپ کی اپنی ہے چند حفاظتی تدابیر ہیں جن پہ عمل کو یقینی بنائیں جیسے کہ جب بھی ضرورت پڑے ایک نئے شیونگ بلیڈ یا نئے سرنج کا استعمال کریں اگر خون لینے کی نوبت آئے تو اس بات کو یقینی بنائیں کہ خون ٹیسٹ شدہ ہو اور ہیپیٹائٹس سی جیسے مرض سے پاک ہو سب سے اہم بات یہ کہ اس بیماری سے متعلق آگاہی حاصل کریں ابتدائی تشخیص اور مؤثر علاج کے لیے مستقل بنیادوں پر اپنا معائنہ کروائیں ایم ایس ایف دو ہزار پندرہ سے کراچی کی مچھر کالونی میں ہیپیٹائٹس سی کے مریضوں کے لیے پروگرام چلا رہا ہے جس میں سب سے زیادہ خطرے کے شکار آبادیوں پر توجہ دی جاتی ہے ہیپیٹائٹس سی ممکنہ طور پر ایک مہلک بیماری ہے لیکن آج ہمارے پاس اس کی تشخیص اور علاج کے لیے مؤثر طریقے موجود ہیں اس بیماری کے متعلق اپنی معلومات کو بڑھائیے اور آج ہی اپنا معائنہ کروائیے Some people have fallen Some people have died Now we are running Through every glass door Tripping over hurdles And crashing through the floor that are going to make with the crow and the balayan tree, it will make us a lighter of feeling uh, when we see the situation, reminding us and connecting us with our heart to the land.
that is separating little by little, particularly for the young generation. We're here in Kudapalong refugee camp in Bangladesh yeah. to come together, share stories about culture, practice culture in a way that reinforces it, values it. We started with a kisser gathering where the storyteller shared a range of stories around health, education, keeping culture strong. so we have some locally made song, uh, locally made dancing. We have our own language. We have our own religious practice. Our cultural we are in Long G and Sharp. One thing uh, I am very uh, proud of myself being a Rohingya. Rohingya, uh, we have the generosity. Uh, no matter how poor I am, uh, people always show the generosity. Ara in the day, Hamming, Goliba Shot, Bagatalazas, and the very boy, Gopisepi, Goliba Shot, the Kanguri, Bada Bear Bear, the Kiba Bear Bear, the Rauna, the Yamashi Hashi. I did the time of the boats for the Shilam, we are not to do the night. There is a good decade at both times of the culture and with us. I really, really impressed with the children's involvement because they are our future. If they don't involve such an activity, for us, it is not easy to maintain our culture. আসলে যখন একটা মহিলা এসবি শিকার হয় বা রেপ হয় তখন খুব খারাপ লাগে যে আমি এবং কি তারা বাংলা বললো হয়ে আসছে তাদের হাজবেন্ড তারপরে হচ্ছে তাদের বাচ্চা হারিয়ে গেছে বা তাদেরকে মিলিটারি মেরে ফেলতেছে এবং তাদেরকে রেপ করতেছে এই টাইপের আর কি পাইতেছি তাদের তো কিছু নাই তারা এক দেশ থেকে আরেক দেশে আসছে তাদের খাওয়ার নাই পড়া নাই সব সবে তাদের শুধু চামা থাকে মানে তারা কিছু পাবে এই আশায় আশায় তারা সব সময় থাকে তারপরে যদি একটা র‍্যাপ কেস আসে ওই ক্ষেত্রে তার চিন্তা দাদা দ্বিগুণ হয়ে যায় যখন আমি পি এফ এটা দেই ওই মুহূর্তে দেখা যায় রোগীর কান্নাটা আমি থামাইতে পারি না তখন তাদেরকে কান্না করার জন্য বা একটু মেন্টালি স্যাটিসফ্যাকশনের জন্য তাদেরকে সময় দিতে হয় বলতে পারি যেমন গত সপ্তাহে আমি একটা রোগী পেয়েছি ওই রোগীটার ব্যাপারে আমার মানে অনেক কষ্ট লাগছে পার্সোনালি সে যখন বাড়িতে ছিল তখন কিছু মায়ের মারে যারা এই দুর্যোগগুলো চালাইতেছে তখন তারা ওখানে অ্যাটাক করছে একটা করে তার বাচ্চাটাকে নিয়ে মহিলাটি এরপর তিন থেকে চার দিন মিলে তাকে দর্শন করতে বাংলাদেশে আইসে এখন সে মানসিক ভাবে ঠিক আছে সে অবশ্যই সম্মান পাওয়ার যোগ্য
আলহামদুলিল্লাহ লাগ দুঃখ শীত আছে তো আসি পেল সময় তো খাওয়া পর ধোয়ে তো হলে মজা মেহ তো খাওয়ার রুখ লিম তো নিজে খুশি লইয়ে হলে হন হামলে ঘরত আই চেক ঘর থামা সিটি নিজে চেক করে চাই চাই আরে তারপর এটা খেলেমি তো আসিব তাই ইনকে এপয়েন্টমেন্ট দিয়ে আমার তাই বেলা ফ্যান দিয়ে বড় মানুষ পেশি গিয়ে ভালো করবো রে তাহলে আমার তাই এপয়েন্টমেন্ট লাই তো ইনকে দাবি দিচ্ছি বাইরে ঘুরি বললে আর তো পুষাব হন বেশি ছাঁস করে হলে তাহলে হন ছাঁস করে দিয়ে সব রুবারে হম বাইরে যা নেব আমার হামানি লো আজ ঘর বাড়া লো আজ পয়েন্টর হাসা পাও হাসা তাসা লোব তাহলে লাইক করে না পারিব দেখার <laughs> জি মনে পাশে তো গ্যাস্ট্রিক বেশি বাড়ি গিয়ে বো আমি নিব ওই ধারা গ্যাস্ট্রিক বাড়ি গিয়ে বো তিন দিলে হলে তারা লোয়াই সাবর বারে অস্তাল উঠি অস্তাল উঠি ইন্তি দাবাই দিয়ে বো থাইয়ে তৈরি আসি তারা মশারা দিয়ে বো তো ইন্তি ডাক্তরে কেন হয়ে তুই হানা হম হাঁস বো জাল না হাঁস হর না হাঁস তিন দিলে হলে তো তিন দিন জিনিস সাম পুরিব বেশ হানে করি দিয়ে হম হম সাম পুরিব তিন দিলে তাকে লাই আজ ফুসরলে একা জানে হাম রকম মুশকিল যাবো মিলাবো নতলে হানা জাল নাহাই ও গেলা ডাক্তার নাহাই তো মানব ঝুলে নাহাম করিব নিজের গাল লই অশান্তি ওর হলে তো জালও নাহাই হরই নাহাই ও ওদের ডাক্তারে মানব ঝুলে সাপুর বড়ব তেন দিলা হলে মিরা জিনিস চাই হম হম হাই বো হানা তেন জিনিস গরমের গজুম্ব তেলা ফুসারও লাগ গরু না পারি তো এই বাসা হালা সব টাইম মধ্যে উপর দৌড়াই দেব আল্লাহ একু সু শান্তি হব হন বাচ্চা বো তাই তেলা নিজের জামাই দিয়ে যত অনেক কেহ বল নদের তেলা জামাই দিয়ে বল দে দেব তাহলে হামা নিজে লাগ গরু না পারি বো তেলাই মানে সমরত মধ্যে মানে তখন হনাক গরম পড়িব বই বাদে সঙ্গে উড়ি গরম মধ্যে ঘরতে বাসায় বাদে বিয়ে খুব বই দিলে বেড়া মধ্যে আসে বো তো গাটা নরম তাকে তো বসে বো তাহলে বাসা ঘর কি বামাদের বামায় ইয়াং গরম হাম হরত গরম বললে বামা বামার হানালে বামার বিয়ালে বুঝলেন তো বেড়া মধ্যে আসে বো তাহলে বারে ডাক্তার হানা যাবে বহুত পিছা পুরা যাবো বো লং ইয়ং কা তখন বাপুরি না কা পঞ্জাল হাত আসে যে মানুষের চিত বো ফোন <laughs> বছরের ভিতরে মেশালাম মধ্যে ধোয়ালো লিয়ে ফারে তে হলে পঞ্জাব কেস মতো না পাইব নিজের গায়ও হারানো যাবো গোবো নিজের গা মধ্যেও বালা না গম না থাকিব গো গা মতো বো মেশালাম মধ্যে দু তিন বছর বাদে লইলে ফয়েবেও কেস মত পাইব গো সাম মতি ফুসে হরিও লাগ দূরে ফেললে কালাই মিলাই না মিলে তাকে নেব মিলাই গোবো মিলাব There can be little doubt that our global environment is changing. The science is unequivocal. It's all too clear that we'll be seeing rising temperatures and sea levels, more frequent and intense extreme weather events such as heavy rains, heat waves, cyclones and floods. This will impact fundamental issues like access to food and water. This in turn will impact people's health. We're also likely to see new and changing diseases and people falling sick because of pollution. And people will start leaving their homes 
some places become uninhabitable over time. All existing projections point to large-scale changes ahead. We can only anticipate the humanitarian needs this will bring, and we need to adapt the way we work to be able to respond. We know from experience that it's the most vulnerable who will be the most affected, making them even more vulnerable. We know because we're already seeing them in our waiting rooms. We're now looking at how we can best address this and get ready for the future. We have chosen to do this through the lens of planetary health. Planetary health is a relatively new health discipline. Uh, it focuses on the changes that humans are making to our environment and the impacts that that has on human health. These changes to the environment destabilize the natural ecosystem, causing climate change and pollution of our air, soil and rivers. This, in turn, affects the water we drink and the air we breathe. It means we will see disruptions to our food production systems and changing patterns of diseases such as malaria. It means we may see new diseases we didn't know before and also the re-emergence of other diseases as the ecological conditions for transmission of diseases change. The main idea behind planetary health is that it is looking at how all this is linked and how humans are responsible for these changes. Our health depends upon the well-being of the planet and the well-being of the planet depends on how we act. It is all linked. We are a medical humanitarian organization so it touches us in two fronts. Yep. It touches us as medics because as medics we are con we are concerned about the health of our patients, the communities and the population. Good afternoon everybody. But also as a humanitarian. Hello, hello, hello. Could everybody please return to their seats or other seats and um, sit down because we need to get on with our program. We're already behind time. So anybody who's still in the dining room, I think everybody has eaten by now. Is anybody listening out there? Please take your seats and um, if the water changes temperature, the Vibrio cholera can survive easier. So there is a direct link between environment and environmental conditions and mainly and if the people who are um, are ready to join us for the next panel, which is hepatitis C. Please take your seats. Farha? Is Dr. Farha there? Thank you. Nobody's paying attention to it.
You're going to get them? Yeah. Please, please take your seats. Could the people at the back please take their seats? We're waiting for you, please. Thank you. And now I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Farah Hussein, uh, who's going to chair this panel on hepatitis C. And she's the deputy um, cell manager in MSF Tokyo. And um, she is going to describe our illustrious panel today. Some people will be online and some people here in the room. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Farah. Uh, welcome to the beginning of the second session. So we are going to talk about hepatitis C, which remains a major public health challenge in Asian healthcare settings. An estimated 58 million people are chronically infected with a disproportionately high burden in low-income and middle-income countries. With the silent nature of the chronic HCV infection, countries are having challenges in case finding, setting up a national program to control HCV, and establishing a realistic estimation of the people living with HCV in the community setting. However, there are few initiatives towards elimination from the low and middle income countries which are worth highlighting. Malaysia, Bangladesh, Cambodia and Pakistan are countries rolling up HCV control program at different phases. With MSF field oper operations of course supporting and uh, with them we also continue delivering treatment programs to patients in country. This panel is going to make an effort to provide you, the audience, uh, an opportunity to discuss about the role of the government leadership, uh, partnership, and experience on the field towards ensuring that the neglected hepatitis C patients are getting the access to care in different low and middle income country settings, as well as to discuss ideas to mobilize community for screening and integrating hepatitis C program to existing health program through strategic screening, testing, and treatment opportunities. So we have with us four esteemed panelists. Um, I will start with Dr. Aninda Rahman, uh, who has bravely stepped in because uh, Dr. Nazmul Islam could not make it. Uh, Dr. Aninda Rahman is an epidemiologist. He's uh, working as a deputy program manager in uh, uh, hepatitis, National Hepatitis Control Program for Ministry of Health in Bangladesh. We have Dr. Rusaida Binte Haji Mohammed Said, who is a senior consultant, physician, gastroenterologist, and hepatologist, and head of medical department in Hospital Serdang. She's joining us online. We have Dr. Wasim Firuz, who's working as project medical referent for hepatitis C program uh, at MSF in Bangladesh. And we have Dr. Kawar uh, Aslam, working as project medical referent for hepatitis C project also in MSF in Pakistan. So we will start with Dr. Wasim Firuz. He's going to talk about MSF Hepatitis C project in Okia in Cox's Bazar in the Rohingya camp in Bangladesh. Could we have Dr. Wasim's presentation? Wasim's presentation. Good evening, <coughs> good afternoon everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Wasim. I am going to present MSF Hepatitis C program that we are running in Okia Cox's Bazar. 
and I am trying to explain uh, the simplified model that we have been adopted. So uh, we have divided our presentation uh, right now in Cox's Bazar. We are running total eight facilities. Among them, two facilities we are running our hepatitis C program. One project is in Camp AW, and another project is in Camp 15. In both projects, we have started our hepatitis C since 2020, and till now, up to date, uh, we have enrolled total 6,791 patient on hepatitis C treatment. And currently, I am focusing on based on one project only, the which is placed in Camp AW. So we have started our projects in uh, August 2020, and by now we have enrolled total 4,279 patients. And right now, our uh, monthly current new enrollment capacity is 150 patients. What we have been observed, there is huge treatment demand in the camp. And in Camp AW, we have two facilities, one OPD and another hospital. In the OPD, we actually, uh, it acts as our main screening point, where we do average 350 patient screening per month. And we also do our treatment initiation, drug refill, and follow-up of the patient. We have another 50-bed hospital, which is dedicated for complicated cases. And chronic liver disease is one of the top three morbidities in our hospital. Every month, average 40 patients admitted due to hepatitis-related complication, and majority of them are hepatitis C. So what we are doing, we have been providing a very simplified model of care, and we are giving, providing our treatment by only four steps. And for this, we need a minimum HR. That means only one medical doctor, one nurse, one lab technician, and one counselor. So this is our hepatitis C care pathway, which is, I'm saying, basically only four steps. First of all, we do the RDT among uh, the patients. If RDT positive, then we do a viral load test uh, via gene expert. And if viral load is more than 1,000, then we initiate treatment. And if the patient is symptomatic, we provide 24 weeks treatment. And if asymptomatic, which is more majority of the cases, we provide 12 weeks of, of treatment. And after completion of the treatment, another 12 weeks later, so we do a repeat viral load test. And based on this, if it is less than 1,000, we declare the patient as a cure, that means no active infection. And a portion of the patient who is still have more than 1,000 viral load, those are the failure patients. We do as uh, simplified screening criteria. Initially, we have started our program for our NCD cohorted patient. We have an NCD cohort of 2,500. So we also see a lot of uh, Hep C patient among them. So this is one of our screening criteria. Second, any patient with signs of uh, uh, decompensated cirrhosis, that means jaundice, uh, GI bleeding, ascites, edema, or history of hepatic encephalopathy. A part of this, uh, the patient with their partner, we also try to screen and provide them treatment. And we have a general uh, screening criteria, which is more than 40 years, who are presented in our OPD or IPD. So why we actually uh, choose this kind of criteria? Because we also have a monthly quota. So based on, uh, to maintain our quality and enrollment capacity, we actually choose this. But it is actually variable. Uh, that we can change according to our capacity. And this is our simplified uh, hepatitis C model of care, where a patient who doesn't have any kind of complication need only 12 weeks of treatment. They have to visit only five times. The initial visit, they come, we do the RDT test. If positive, then we collect blood for the viral load. We also do some uh, screening tests, for example, for HIV, pregnancy, uh, hepatitis B, and blood sugar. So in the consequent visit, if patient doesn't have any complaints or any kind of uh, complication, they got only drug refill. That means they don't have to com uh, consult by a doctor. But if patients have any kind of drug reaction or any kind of uh, complication, adverse events, they obviously got a consultation by the doctor. So the patient who are, doesn't have any symptoms, they got 12 weeks treatment. That means only five visits. Who got 24 weeks treatment, they usually got eight visits. And in terms of treatment regimen, 
we have chosen sofosavir and daclastavir this is the pan genotypic antiviral treatment which is recommended in msf settings one due to availability and also for the price reason so now this is a summary of our uh, hepatitis c uh, from uh, october 2020 to august 2023 so we have screen total uh, almost 12000 patients and you have been seen the uh, rdd positive is almost 55% though it's a little bit biased because most of the patient we got in our facility they have already rdd positive result so it is not a pure screening that's why the rate is a bit high the viremic patient is about 95% uh, among them viral load more than 1000 is 4427 and we already initiated uh, 4,200 among them. If you see, uh, among the patients who have observed uh, SBR 12, that means 12 weeks post treatment viral load, 94% they got a cure rate, which is very a good success. And 6% of them is still, after the, even after the treatment, they have viral load more than 1,000. That means they are the failure. Uh, this is the hepatitis C treatment care, basically representation of the graphical representation of the previous chart. So now challenge. So what we have been observed in our community, in our outreach team, there is possible lack of awareness within the beneficiary, but also among the uh, medical person. For example, a lot of person uh, misinterpret the hepatitis RDD result. First, even after the treatment, it will be lifelong positive. But sometimes they send back the patient to us, that patient is still not cured, though we have actually treated them. Right now in the, this uh, UKIA, very few, uh, a part of MSF, nobody provide any kind of hepatitis C treatment, but a lot of them do the RDT test. So we see a huge uh, treatment load that patient come to us. And another thing, we also provide uh, in our cohort, there are few host patients also, that means Bangladeshi nationals. But in the outside market, the price of this hepatitis C treatment is very costly. So right now in Bangladeshi market, uh, for a 12 weeks treatment, you would need 84,000 taka, which is definitely not affordable for majority portion of the Bangladeshi people. And what uh, we can conclude uh, our program by this, that as we have making is very simplified. Uh, basically, we don't have any expert in the field. Uh, we are doing the program by the general physicians, and our cure rate is 94%. So we can come to the conclusion that with the simplified procedure, uh, hepatitis C treatment is possible if the drug is available. And right now, what we are doing, we also recently did a prevalence study of the hepatitis C among the Rohingya community, and uh, we are uh, what in the preliminary findings we see the prevalence is very high, and we are right now analyzing the risk factors. We are also uh, anal implementing the electronic medical record for the hepatitis C patient, and we are also supporting uh, government of Bangladesh for uh, for drafting the first national hepatitis C guideline. Um, we will have question and answer sessions at the end. Uh, we now welcome Dr. Kawar, who's, uh, who's in uh, working for, with MSF Pakistan, uh, to start his presentation. Can we have Dr. Kawar's presentation online, please? I can't hear you. Uh, now you can hear me now. I'm not sure if it's our problem or if. Can you, can you hear, hear me now? Me now? Uh, yes. Can you, can you hear, hear me? me? Yes. Go on, please. Oh, that's, 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 that's great. That's, that's great. great. That's great. That's great. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, MSF Scientific, uh, uh, the team, especially Dr. Bismara, Dr. Nausheen, to reach out to me to 
ജസ്റ്റ് <laughs> uh on the these slides so uh first i just explain the briefly explain the context of uh, hepatitis c in pakistan uh this is not very can, maybe you, no, no, not a good context but we, we need to we need to uh, need, we need to discuss about it so in pakistan the current zero prevalence is 7.5% it's it was 6.2% back in 2008 uh but the last survey was done in uh, um, in sin province in 2018 and in punjab the biggest province of pakistan in 2019 and uh, the prevalence increased from 6.2% to 7.5% in 2020 although it's not a published data but it's a presented presented data so you can consider it as a near as uh, uh, authentic uh along with the zero prevalence definitely the viremic prevalence also increase which is around now 4 to 5% so you can consider the magnitude of infection uh, we have in uh, we have in pakistan uh the currently uh, um, you can say that uh, uh, we we are at 470000 uh, new cases in our hep c pool every year and uh, the only persons who are got the treatment is only 50%. This is 50% is I'm talking about from 2020, not before that. Uh, so the most common risk factor as in different, as in the other uh, South Asian, Southeast Asian countries or South Asian countries, uh, the most common risk factor we identify is the reuse of syringes, um, reuse of medical instruments and increase and in screen blood transfusion. Why reuse of syringes? Because i think as a context we are very fond of uh, having injectable medications uh, as compared to the oral pill so that is the most common risk factor uh, there was a study published uh, like few years back uh, they say that uh, average pakistani used to have 13 injections per year uh, so that is that is that is um, that is massive so that is the one which is contributing to the uh, increase of infection um we we uh, like the, the numbers were increasing so back in 2019 and 2020 um the, the government come the, the government of pakistan come up with the elimination plan for 2030 as the other nations also come up with the uh, uh, elimination plan so we have made the pc1 uh, for 2030 elimination goal and we think that we will we will screen diagnose and treat 50% of the uh, hep c population by 2025 and the remaining one by 2030 but unfortunately the covid happens and all the resources all the money all the gene expert treatment everything is diverted towards the covid uh, so it, the the pc1 is halted um and uh, uh, but meanwhile the the data collection continue the, the so maybe which is one one thing which is very different uh, uh, in pakistan as compared to the other high prevalent hep c countries is that that the data is improving every year uh for pakistan but uh in other country the data improves the number of cases reduces down but in case in, in case of pakistan the data increases but uh the number of cases are also increasing that is one very different uh thing uh, with pakistan um so back coming back to the revival of pc1 so uh, back in 2022 and uh, start of 2023 the government again have the political will to come up with the revival of pc1 and now they have secured funding for that um and so maybe we a plan that we will screen around um maybe 14 million people per year uh yeah that is massive and around we have to treat around 1.2 uh, million people uh in every year for the next 8 years time to achieve the elimination goal um considering considering that the pakistan is the cheapest direct antiviral producing country one of the direct uh, one of the direct, one of the cheapest direct antiviral producing countries of the world and we have the very very cheap as the line uh, screening test but the bottlenecks which which will halt this elimination goal is diagnostics because still there is there is a big school a big uh, you can say organizations amoh 
even a school of thought uh, of high, uh, highly professional people uh, who still consider the centralized laboratory is the uh, the main source of diagnostic purposes. That's why the 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 when the the this alimentation plan will um, will be stuck in. Um, in diagnostic purpose, that's why we 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 have to we screen a lot of people on monthly basis, uh, but the diagnostic numbers uh, uh, are not there, and because they are not diagnosed, the treatment is also uh, not up to up to that uh, up to that up to that mark which we are suggesting for next seven or eight years. So that is that is a small uh, have see context uh, uh, related to Pakistan. Um, so coming back to what MSF did. Uh, maybe maybe if my colleague will change the slide for uh, for my going for my next slide because five minutes are for this slide. Um, for in next slide, maybe um, what MSF did in Pakistan, especially related to hepatitis C. So MS, we know that the magnitude of disease is very high. The numbers are very high. The prevalence is very high. So we are not able to eliminate hepatitis. Uh, hepatitis C from Pakistan, but definitely MSF can come up with the uh, with the model of care which can contribute to the elimination goal, which can be replicated in MOH settings and in also in private settings so that this micro elimination goals can be achieved. So MSF come up with the two two uh, two approaches, which is very evident in 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 my in my in my this slide. Um, so uh, we come up with the two projects uh, in in Karachi. Um, the one of the project in Karachi, we have, which are in mature colony, is one of the is it's not one of the first. It's the first hepatitis MSF hepatitis C project. It's the first to utilize direct antiviral drugs in Pakistan. It is the first to utilize gene expert machine for hepatitis C diagnostic care in Pakistan, and it's also the first who have the who have the access for second line and third line treatment. So there are quite a few first things attached to this this project. So coming coming back to this this uh, uh, this approach, so we come up with the two approaches, uh, and we 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 use these both of these approaches for the for the advocacy purposes. One is the vertical decentralized model of care, which is in in uh, Machu College in Karachi, where which we which is uh, operational research, which we call it bending the curve of HIV prevalence. That is influence from HIV bending the curve of HIV prevalence in in Cape Town, we like you know that what are the the, the things which are very successful uh, in HIV were later on incorporated into hepatitis C. So this model of care is one of it. Um, so we were we are working we are working in, in uh, you, you can say uh, informal settlement, low socioeconomic, low education level uh, with the families the low education level. Uh, it has a population of around one hundred fifty thousand people. It's a very unique in, in geographical location because it is it is bounded on three sides by the land and one side by the sea. So that's why we come up with this micro plan for hepatitis C from this from this uh, from this area. So what we are doing, we are doing door to door mobilization and door to door screening. Screening by biofilms, screening by in house screening, screening by self testing. And we 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 diagnose we screen people uh, um, in the uh, in, in their houses and uh, on uh, or on their corner of the streets and the people who are screen positive we collect the samples on the same side and bring the samples to to our clinic facility which is nearby to that their home uh, we run gene expert test test and we ask these people to come back uh, very next day to their uh, to our facility they come to our facility we have the diagnostic results either positive or negative if they are negative we provide comprehensive patient support session to them and if they are positive they have hepatitis B screening. They will be seen by the consulting physician. They evaluated him for the uh, for exa abdominal examination, the risk factors, everything. They, they 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 will a complete examination, and after that they decided to start them on treatment. So the person will be started on the same day. He will first visit to our clinic. Uh, so that is a very you can say a fast track hepatitis C treatment initiation. That is one of its kind in Pakistan too. Um, so um, the one, two to three things which have been incorporated in this intervention is self-test. We already, uh, I'm very, uh, I'm very, uh, very pleased, uh, like thankful to Bismaraj to uh, accept uh, one of our poster for self-test in this, uh, in this scientific day. So where we have presented that we, we did a feasibility test for self-testing in our clinic. 
and that was very convincing. And now we have integrated the self-test in the community. So the people who are not at home or who have some other concern will not miss the opportunity to be screened. So they should be screened. So that's what we have integrated this um, self-testing. And what self-testing did, it has reduced the loss to follow-up uh, from 24% to 9%. So for loss to follow up um, uh, about uh, you know, loss, this, this loss, this reduced reduction of loss to follow up is because of the simplified algorithm. As Dr. Vas Vasim has said, uh, the people is started on the same day. So we are doing the same day treatment initiation, same day screening, same day diagnostic and the same day treatment initiation. That will reduce, that is has reduced down the uh, loss to follow up rate from 24% to 9%. To 9%. So that is one model of care. But I know, I know there there should be questions uh, about about the cost of this intervention. Definitely, it is it is it is the costly, uh, and uh, to to have door to door mobilization and screening, then the gene expert machine, gene expert cartridges, then self test. It's costly. No matter, it, it, there is no question about it. But but if you if you consider macro elimination in in a high risk population uh, or in a, uh, in a marginalized population or who the people who don't have the access for screening and diagnostic this is the right approach guys this is the right approach for them so this is this is one intervention the second intervention which is we have just did last year we have integrated the uh, decentralized model of care of hepatitis c in a, a ministry of health setting so we identify a rural health center in baldia town a nearby place in uh, to our clinic uh, and uh, the same socioeconomic low education status uh, as uh, as mature colony. And what we did, we we have trained the medical doctors, uh, the MOH medical doctors, the daily health workers, the nurses, the dispensers, uh, the lab techs, and especially the lady health visitors and lady health supervisors to how to screen, how to diagnose, and how to ma how to manage treatment uh, for treatment of hepatitis C. We have uh, did some IPCs. Uh, you can say. Um, management. We we also renovate this facility a little bit, and we provided the screening test, uh, screening kits, diagnostics, treatment to every, uh, to, uh, to to them. And now, after we finish up this facility, like in two months back, it's running in the same flow as MSF was doing. And now it's declared as a sentinel site. So maybe sentinel site means now it has its own resources for hepatitis C screening, diagnostic and treatment, and also hepatitis B vaccination. So that is. That is a successful role model uh, model of care for MSF in Karachi in terms of hepatitis C. So these are the two models of care. As I said before, MSF is not able to eliminate hepatitis C for Pakistan, but they are giving two very successful models of care to MOH and other organizations to replicate them and, and get rid of this hepatitis C from Pakistan. So... Apart from this clinical intervention, we also used to do a lot of advocacy about, about our intervention. And that's why I mentioned these, these, this small line. So we are advocating for universal screening uh, versus the risk factor screening. The dilemma is that, that still till now, the, the most of the hepatitis C patients are diagnosed just because of the risk factor screening. They come to the doctor or a facility, if they have some symptoms or chronic liver disease, they might they screen, or may are they going for, for uh, uh, some uh, uh, some other countries or they are going to medical procedure. That's how they were screened for hepatitis C. But we are advocating for universal screening to screen everyone. If the person is coming with ARAC, HADAC, UTI, respiratory infection, he should be screened for hepatitis C. So not to miss the opportunity for this person to be screened for hepatitis C. Otherwise, we are not able to find out uh, the exact prevalence and exact number of hepatitis C, and we are not able to treat this silent uh, infection. The second thing which we are advocating is for the point of care gene expert. What is the was versus the centralized lab? Although this is a, uh, I, I cannot say this is a bad statement, but there is definitely a demarcation of two school of thought. One school of thought uh, from the famous gastroenterologists, hepatologists, they're still focusing on um, to have the centralized lab because they don't think that the point of care diagnostic is available. But there are new people that, uh, like us who are coming and who are saying, no, if you want to reach out, the, reach out the people and to screen more and more people and to treat more and more people, you need a point of care at the test, a diagnostic tool which can provide you the diagnostic as early as possible so the people will not miss the opportunity. So that's why Gene Expert plays an, an important role. So till, till now, in last... Three years, we have run down 13,000 gene expert tests, including the diagnostics and the SVR. So that's that's what we are advocating, and that's why we have incorporated 
the gene expression machine in um, in in AMOH settings, so they can they can replicate our model of care there, and it's still running it's running very fine. Uh, then one thing uh, we which we used to say to education of healthcare worker is still as I said the, the most common risk factor is still uh, is the reuse of the syringes. So we have to educate the healthcare workers, educate people about the about no need for uh, having injectable frequent injectable medication if they have if they can have the oral pills for that particular treatment. Um, so that is the, that is if the, we we need to change the perception of healthcare workers and also the perception or believe of people of Pakistan that maybe they can have been, they will be treated with oral pills, not they don't need to go for the injectable medication for everyone. So that is my 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 two cents or my, you can say two, my two slides. Um, um, for MS, uh, yeah. Hepsi contacts, contacts in Pakistan. Pakistan and Sorry, MS we are running out of time, so you could make it shorter. Yeah, yeah, so I'm just, the, I have made, made it shorter for you. For you. This is only for you. For you. I, I made, made it shorter. So this is my last statement. statement. Universal, Universal screening is the answer for hepatitis C elimination from Pakistan and everyone here. So please remember it and go for ad advocating for universal screening everywhere. That's all from my side. Thank you I, I so much. Thank you so much. I, we totally understand. You're so passionate about this activity. And of course, you should be because it's amazing what you did. We just heard about two different kind of MSF projects. One is quite standalone, where we are basically treating patients ourselves. And now Dr. Kawar was talking about another MSF project, which is, he called it a love story between MSF and MOH, which is, of course, amazing. Now we will talk about two countries. Uh, we will see what kind of love stories we can make. <laughs> Uh, we welcome Dr. Rahman, Dr. Aninda Rahman, who is uh, the Deputy Program Manager in CDC in Ministry of Health, to talk about Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear audience and uh, learned guests. So I'm here on behalf of uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Mohammad Nazmul Islam. He's sick, so I have to represent him. Unfortunately, I'm also the program manager for Viral Hepatitis Control Program. So I hope I'll be able to say a few words about it. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, we all know about what Bangladesh is. It is a very densely populated country in the world. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very small country as well. We have uh, like 170 million people. And uh, so we do have a viral, uh, uh, national viral hepatitis control program. So it is a subcomponent of communicable disease control operational plan of uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And it started in uh, 2017, late 2017. And it has a costed budget, so it's like around 5 million USD for seven years. So it was supposed to be for five years, but it got extended year after year. So now it is uh, for seven years. So we also do have a, a kind of a strategic plan for elimination of uh, viral hepatitis in Bangladesh, which has been drafted. And we have now have a five-year costed operational plan for uh, this uh, hepatitis control program. But I'm not going to focus on that. So let us just give you some glimpse of uh, the hepatitis situation in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is uh, actually a low prevalent country for hepatitis B and C. So officially recognized prevalence of hepatitis B is 4%, 4% uh, in uh, our uh, common general population. And for hepatitis C, it is 0.7%. So just let me remind you, this data is actually a bit old. So we recently conducted a nationwide study to uh, actually estimate the prevalence. And we have seen the hepatitis B prevalence is fine. It is around 4%. But for hepatitis C, it is much lower. We found it is like 0.1% or 0.2%, something like that. But it's still not published, so I'm not going to share that data. But definitely it is less than 0.7%, that's for sure. Uh, and also we do have a hepatitis B vaccination program in Bangladesh uh, running since 2005 or 2007. And, uh, but we do not have any birth dose. So we have three dose, but not birth dose. And, uh, so there was a target for WHO regarding hepatitis B. We already achieved it. So the prevalence of hepatitis B infection among under five children is less than 0.05% already in Bangladesh. 
So this study was conducted in 2019 and now we are going to repeat this study to see if we are on track or it is the same or uh, something changed. So we, we do have some testing facilities for hepatitis B and C. I'll show them in uh, my later slides. And as I mentioned, it's a, we have a program as well. So this is just to show you some distribution of our risk population because I've seen, uh, I've shown you that uh, hepatitis C prevalence is a bit low, uh, very low in general population, but for risk population it is very high, especially for people who inject drug. So for PWID, this uh, pro, uh, hepatitis C prevalence is very high. It's, it's almost 30, 40 percent. So this is just to show you where uh, this is uh, higher. But as I'm mentioning, like say uh, repeatedly that hepatitis C prevalence in Bangladesh is low, but we must think about the Rohingya population. You know, we have 1.2 million FDM and Rohingya population living in Bangladesh, especially in Cox's Bazar. And we have seen several studies that showed that the prevalence of hepatitis C in Rohingya population is very, very high. Like there are different studies. So some studies uh, uh, have found 13%, some even 17%. So I do know that MSF Bangladesh is conducting a study there to actually, uh, like a bigger study, to actually finalize the result of hepatitis C prevalence among Rohingya population. And uh, uh, I mean, Washing is not going to let me tell you, but still, I have heard that this uh, figure is also very high, like other studies. So this is very problematic thing for us because we know there are lots of host population around them as well. And 20%, it's a, it's a big number, it's a big number. So uh, there are some other contexts. So we do have a hepatitis C treatment guideline, and uh, thankfully MSF has uh, uh, helped us developing that guideline, also WHO and other partners. And we do have a training module, and we have trained more than 10,000 doctors and uh, nurses on viral hepatitis management in last four or five years. And also uh, we have conducted a recent survey to find out how many hospitals in Bangladesh actually have uh, treatment or testing facilities for hepatitis C and B. So obviously it was not a very uh, inclusive study, so we could not reach every hospital, but we have reached many. And we have seen like there are 122 hospitals or centers where we can test uh, ACV RNA or HVV DNA. We provide free treatment, more on that later in my slides. Uh, we have uh, lots of Bangladeshi pharmaceutical company produce hepatitis C drug. Uh, and uh, let me take some of this opportunity. The cost of hepatitis C drug in Bangladesh is very high, unfortunately. So back in 2015, when it started, when Bangladesh started producing hepatitis C drug, it was the lowest in the whole world, I guess. Many people from abroad actually came to Bangladesh to buy drugs. But unfortunately, the price has not changed much. And in 2023, I can see that among the other countries uh, in South Asia or even Asia, the cost of DAS is very high in Bangladesh. I can see some esteemed journalists are here. Maybe they will take note of it and take some actions. So uh, just some uh, result from our survey that we can see from our public sector, about 49% of hospitals do have a screening facility available. Only, I think, 5% facility have confirmatory testing facility available from our survey. And uh, regarding private sector, uh, almost 85% of them have screening tests available and 53.4% have uh, confirmatory testing availability in uh, private side. Uh, NGO sector, I'm not going to uh, take much time on that. So, yes. So, uh, initiative, initiative that has taken so far. So, we, as I mentioned, we have a strategy drafted. We have a, a national surveillance strategy drafted as well. We have a st stakeholder identification done. So, we are regularly meeting them. We are regularly having... Uh, a different kind of initiatives. As I mentioned, our routine child vaccination started since 2003, actually. And we also, uh, from our program, we also conducted some adult vaccination. So uh, uh, to prevent, especially the healthcare providers who are at risk of hepatitis B and C. Uh, for hepatitis C, obviously, we do not have any vaccination, but we do have treatment. And Ministry of Health, from our program, we are providing free treatment to about 150 to 200 patients every year. So 200 patients, uh, as I mentioned already, this is very expensive. For one course, for one patient, it takes almost $1,000, 1,000 USD. So we are providing treatment to almost 200 patients free every year. And we are also uh, uh, giving some treatment to high-risk group for hepatitis B. 
And uh, as I mentioned, we have provided lots of training to doctors and nurses so that they can take better care of the, those patients. So we have done some countrywide advocacy activities, especially on International Hepatitis Day, I mean World Hepatitis Day. And uh, uh, obviously, hepatitis prevention is not only our activities. We have, do have other stakeholders. For example, hospital service management, they are taking care of injection safety, uh, also uh, safe blood transfusion. And uh, HIV program, National AIDS and STD program, they are actually involved more with the risk groups that I mentioned. For example, injection, injectable drug users, then uh, uh, sex workers, transgender, those kind of population actually addressed by uh, AIDS, a HIV program. So we, we do not have surveillance yet, but we have a strategy drafted, and hopefully from next year we will be able to start that. And uh, also we are uh, now thinking about triple elimination, HIV, hepatitis, and syphilis among the uh, pregnant women and child. So this, uh, we have uh, formed a committee, and next, uh, from, uh, I think from this month, we are going to pilot an initiative in Chatpur to pilot this triple initiative. We are trying to screen all the pregnant women and trying to see if we can prevent a, a, a child with uh, being born with hepatitis C. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, back to the uh, uh, antiviral drug that I already mentioned, almost eight local pharmaceutical companies are producing the drug, but this is still very costly, 950 USD, whereas in India, I think the cost has come down to only 50 USD uh, in, in India and other countries. So, uh, we have to think about it. If we can reduce the price, I think our program will be able to cater much more patients, not only 200, we'll be able to cater 2,000 patients. So this is kind of uh, thinking we have, so we will uh, start with, uh, so our medical colleges, they will provide the specialist treatment, and we'll start from the union, even upujara level. So we'll uh, screen them, we'll refer them to higher, higher facilities for the treatment, and that is how we envisioned our plan. So this is just to show you, so I'm at the end, uh, don't worry about it. So just to show you the last two slides, I think this is just to show you the progress we made for hepatitis B. So from 2001, we can see the prevalence of hepatitis B has gone down drastically. And now that we have uh, a very good vaccination, child vaccination, I think this uh, prevalence will come down sharply in next 10 or 15 years. But we do not have the same thing for hepatitis C. That's why we, we, we have to work hard, especially for those risk population. And as I mentioned, we already achieved the WHO, uh, uh, WHO award for this, uh, WHO control, because the uh, five-year-old children in Bangladesh have very low prevalence of hepatitis B. So the challenges, uh, my last slide, as I mentioned, uh, so far we are working only from government funding. So our program is uh, taking the main uh, activities, but it's not a standalone program. We also work on AMR and diarrhea from my own program. And so our HR is very low. So the manpower is a big issue. Uh, we have not, we could not start the routine surveillance yet, but we hope to start from next operational plan, that means next year. And as I mentioned, the treatment cost is very high, so we can afford only 150 to 200 patient treatment every year. We have to increase that. And Rohingya refugee prevalence of hepatitis C is a big concern. It's a big concern. And uh, also, we need some more funding, and also I hope donors will be able to start working on us. So this is our organogram, and thank you very much for your patience hearing. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahman. Uh, we kept the success story for the end. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Rusaida Saeed to present uh, about the success achieved in HPV elimination strategy. Thank you. Dr. Saeed?
Uh, you, we can just start, Dr. Said. It's fine. We, we still can't hear you because you're muted. Okay, we see you. Okay. Okay. Ah, great. Hear you. Go on. Okay. Uh, can I have my slide? The slides, could we start it again? To say it. They're there. You can start. The site is, is there. there, is it? Them? Can you, you see, see this slide? slide? We see them, yes. Okay. 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 Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to speak on the topic uh, promoting HCV testing in hard to reach group in our Malaysia. So, um, the in 2020, Muhammad et al. reported about 0.3% of the adult population in Malaysia are living with HCV infection with a surveillance of 0.2%. So, these are the key milestones of the HCV agenda in Malaysia. In 2017, we break through the barrier when our government issued compulsory license to Sofosbubil and bring down the price of DA treatment less than 300 USD per cost of traffic. And, and in 2019 until 2022, we set a tone for DA decentralization. We published our national strategic planning until 2023. So we make also screening services available using the RDTs and DAA available more than 400 primary health care. And 2023 onwards, we're going beyond low-hanging fruit. And lastly, we have endorsed the DAA uh, using Sophos and Ravi as our part of our HCV treatment in Malaysia. And uh, recently, Ravi Razbir have been listed in WHO uh, essential medicine list. So now we are more concentrating uh, treatment among the per, uh, person who inject drug or use drug from the harm reduction program. We're trying to reach the unreached population in the fishermen, villages, estate workers and islands resident. And of course, together with the, the CSO, we promote HCV testing among hard to reach population, i.e. sex worker, multiple sex partner and MSM. And together with Ministry of Home Affairs and National Anti-Drug Agency, we treat hepatitis C patients in the correctional setting and under surveillance. And together with the nephrologists, we are going to treat stationary failure who are infected with hepatitis C. So we are pushing now the boundaries with the refugees since two years ago. Uh, there's ongoing collaborations with MSF and DNDI. We, MOH, assist in the capacity building and offer consultations to their medical team. So this is the current uh, uh, strategy test and treat in Malaysia. Uh, in June 2016, World Health Assembly, uh, Health Assembly announced to eliminate hepatitis C as public health threat by 2030. So by November 2017, we issued our compulsory license. Uh, in the same year, DNDI, together with Ministry of Health, bring in a storm C study, treatment of hepatitis C with Sofosuvir and Ravidasvir. And in March 2008, we started our national DA treatment with Sofosuvir and Ravidasvir. Uh, and find a diagnostics company brought in a study, uh, test and treat in December 2018, and we started the study in 25 primary healthcare in April 2019. 
We further expand in August 2019 to other primary healthcare. And in 2020, our visions to decentralize the hepatitis C treatment to more primary healthcare throughout the country. So on uh, throughout the year, we emphasize on prevention too. Okay, these are the numbers of uh the numbers of uh, facilities we uh, can offer the AA treatment. We started in 2018 in 24 hospital. By 2019, we decentralized to 27 hospital, and by 2020, to 52 hospital and 231 uh, primary health care. So by August 2023, hepatitis C treatment in, is available in 68 hospital and 474 primary health care. So we when we compare pre-DA and DA era, we can see that during pre-DA era, we only managed to treat about 1,200 patients from 2013 until 2017 due to the cost. But after 2017, we are using DAAs and because of the cheap, the, the, the uh, DAAs are cheaper, much cheaper than the pre-DA era, we can treat more than 20,000 until June 2023. And we have a very high SBR, 95 to 98%. So during the uh, World Hepatitis Day, we also conduct a, a campaign, Find the Missing Millions. In 2019, we had a nationwide population-based HCV screening campaign where within that one week of period, we screened more than 11,000 in 49 public hospitals and 38 public uh, primary health care with the prevalence of 1.9%. And in 2022, we had targeted screening campaign Within three months, we had a campaign in nine states at the fishermen villages, farm workers, Felda settlements, and those using or uh, injecting drug. So this is uh, uh, the model in Malaysia that we are uh, using now. So we screen the RDTs at the primary healthcare, prison, rehab centers, and also by the CSO. Those post positive. HCV and uh, RNA and uh, or core antigen will be sent to the hospital to confirm the viremia. Once result back, the cirrhotic status will be assessed using the April and FE4. Compensated cirrhosis and non cirrhotic will be treated at primary healthcare itself. Decompensated will be sent to the hospital. Treatment will be started using Dakla or Ravidazvir in combined with Sofosfovir. And HCV RNA will be sent to the lab uh, to evaluate the SBR trial. If not detected, that means the patient is cured. If detected, that means the patient has a treatment failure. And this patient will be sent to the hospital for second line treatment using soft and valve. So this is the multi-pronged strategy of Malaysia to navigate hepatitis elimination agenda. Of course, we have very affordable and accessible drug. Uh, we had the uh, sofosovir, the class of uh, about less than three hundred US dollars, and currently it costs less than hundred US dollars. And ravidazvir, of course, we uh, uh with sofosovir, the cost is about four hundred US dollars. And we quickly decentralized the uh, treatment to many primary healthcare throughout the country. Of course, we have a very good interorganizational partnership with the different uh, government agencies, uh, DNDI, FINE, and CSO. We explore new options throughout, uh, through the R&D. Currently, we are conducting a study using Rosokfos and Ravidazbir among non sorotic patients, eight weeks versus 12 weeks, so that we can reduce the price if it has eight weeks, uh, showed uh, eight weeks a very successful study. And of course, we have political work and central, uh, good central coordinations uh, in terms of laboratory and distribution of DAAs. And of course, our political, uh, our government provide 10 million uh, per year for hepatitis C project and uh, for treatment. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Said. This brings us to the end of this panel. Now we will take some questions. We are a bit short in time, so if we have burning questions, please raise your hand. Yes, Mila? Let's 
questions for Dr. Vasudhi. As to the outcome. Okay. It's okay now. Huh. The question is to Dr. Vaseem with regards to outcome. So, can you also tell us what was the outcome with HIV, HIV HCV patients and non-HIV HCV patients with soft and DAC regimen? Uh, so, right now, uh, that uh, data is not readily available, but uh, we have also planned to for a cohort study of this 4,000 patient. And we have actually very few HIV and HIV co-infected patient with this, but that data right now is not available. Yes. My question will be to Mr. Aslam, Dr. Khawar Aslam from Pakistan. So, what is the cost of your uh, drug regimen that you use for hepatitis C. Uh, I wanted to compare it with other countries. So can you hear me? Can, can you, you hear me now? Uh, could you please tell us about the cost of the drug regime that you use yeah, yeah. for treating your patients? Yeah. So, so can, can you can you can you uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So right now in MSF projects, the both of these interventions we are using the drugs from MSF supply. Uh, we are using first line drugs, the sofosbuvir, daclatacevir, that cost us around one, I think one point uh, two euro or one point one euro uh, per pill. So maybe eighty four uh, pills, it costs around like maximum like ninety euro. But it's, it's in terms of the national, because they are WHO pre-qualified, one thing. In Pakistan, there is there 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 is no source which has, which providing the WHO pre-qualified um, direct antivirals. So in Pakistan, the cheapest drugs, which I know uh, for a fact is 1600 PKR uh, per month. So it, it may, it costs around uh, uh, 5,000 for the whole treatment means like $20, 20 or 25 USD. So that is that is the comparison between the MSF uh, drugs and the the national program, but they are not WHO pre qualified. Uh, Twenty US dollar for the whole treatment regimen. Uh, yes. yes, in the in national, national program, program, it's twenty USD for the whole for the whole treatment for three months. Sorry, uh, doctor, you're saying that the supply is coming from MSF and it's 20 euros. No, it's from... MSF, MSF project in, in Pakistan are using the drugs from MSF supply that cost one, like 84 or 90 euro for the whole treatment. Uh, then I'm also uh, 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 comparing the cost of drugs which are Pakistan is producing uh, uh, it's, it's around 20 to 25 US dollar for the whole treatment, for the complete three months treatment. So you can compare with compromise on the quality and the frequent rupture of drugs. So that is one of the, one of the dilemma with, with the Pakistan producing drugs. Thank you for the information and congratulations to you for producing such, you know, uh, important drug at such low cost. Thank you. It is so interesting because all of the presentations, we basically come back to the price because the price is so high. I'm in Bangladesh, 15 years, and it's still 950 US dollars. And doctor, because the production is local, I wonder what uh, Bangladesh government is going to do about this when we are going ahead with strategic planning and everything. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, so. It all comes down on the uh, demand. So when we will have more testing facilities and we will screen uh, screen a large number of population, I hope the demand will increase and the cost will decrease. So that is my hope. And we are also uh, actively talking with the pharmaceutical companies so that how we can how we may reduce the price. For example, this year. 
they have like it is an informal discussion I, i'm not sure if i have uh, i should say that but they say that we can have uh, a bit uh, tablets in bit less price like around 600 usd for the whole course but it's it's a like informal discussion going on so yeah i think it will it will be like this uh, as long as we cannot create demand so more patient hcb patient needs to be diagnosed first and then the demand will increase and the cost will actually decrease thank you uh if there is no other question uh you uh, have one my question. question is for dr said uh, my question has two parts um the first part is malaysia is clearly more developed than bangladesh so um do you think the success story of Bangla the success story of tb elimination in uh, malaysia does it have to do with the availability of funds or the willingness to cooperate uh, to build these uh, policies which are inclusive which as you said the finding the uh, next 1 million so this is the first part of the question the second part of the question is do you think this program can be replicated in the context of bangladesh thank you um uh, for me the the success is uh, not only the fund is available uh, from the beginning the first year but uh, the commitment by the government until 2030 but i think the corporations within our medical within the hospital primary health care uh, we quickly expand our treatment and screening throughout the country and i think that's the most important because there's a cooperation a teamwork within us within a uh, different health care uh, uh the the second one i think it can be a uh, uh, duplicate and the, the whatever we have done in malaysia, uh, malaysia in bangladesh that bangladesh and of course uh the costing should be bring down um i think the bangladesh is too uh, very expensive 950 compared to us started with 300 us yeah dollars and furthermore with ravi does we, we are doing now we it's very safe compared to dakla tasbir in the, our prison project we just screen the same day and then once is a result positive uh, back we just dispense the medication to the prison and the uh, the prison staff will um uh, um uh, gave the treatment to the uh, the, uh, the 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 prisoner we will not see the patient at all and no follow up or no blood test except as we are 12 then only we will take as we are 12 and decide uh, whether the patient uh, treatment failure or successful of uh based on that if let treatment failure then we'll uh, send for second line treatment to them so basically we try to cut short or we try to reduce the uh, follow up so um at ravidas we have been uh, is the first country that we we partially registered in malaysia but now is already listed as, uh, uh, in the who and list so i think any country can be used uh the ravidas bill patients dr wasim presenting our msf activities in the rohingya camp with a simplified model of care uh we wonder if the ministry of health in bangladesh will also be able to replicate or be interested in that and we also hear the bangladesh's interest in rolling out hcv program and we could also learn from malaysia from the success stories and uh, pakistan where community engagement was so important and 14 million to be screened that will not be a small job but if the community is there of course there will be success i also want to quote farhat because she was saying that we will not stop collaborating i think this will be a good start maybe bangladesh and malaysia can talk and there will be good collaboration also with pakistan thank you so much thank you thank you to our panelists sorry can you hold on a moment please because we would like to uh, give you a token of appreciation gentlemen <laughs> sorry yes 
Some scrap there. Some of us are You had so many questions to say. And I'd especially like to thank Dr. Farha and who stepped in last minute at our request. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, now I think we're officially uh, 45 minutes over time. Anthony, very welcome to come up here. Anthony, um, I have to get this right. Caswell Perez That's right. is uh, working here as a deputy uh, country representative in Cox's Bazaar. And um, he has 15 years of humanitarian experience in various places around the world. And he's going to introduce the rest of his panel to you, and I'll get out of the way. And we're moving fast. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I think that we've got here uh, Rachel, um, but Dr. Temi and Dr. Islam. All right, great. So while they, uh, while they get down here, I just want to give you some quick context. Uh, this theme is particularly interesting because we'll be dealing with one of the aspects that's so important for MSF that we mentioned earlier in the day. It's not just the question of neglected diseases, but also neglected populations. Uh, and the refugees at the global level are one of these neglected populations that we work with. Just to give you some, uh, uh, some background, currently there are about 110 million refugees, uh, or rather forcibly displaced population around the world. Um, about 35 million of these people are refugees, 65 are internally displaced people, and 5 million are asylum seekers. Um, they are on the move for different reasons. Uh, some are fleeing persecution, others are fleeing conflict, uh, other situations of violence, human rights violations, food scarcity, uh, inflation, their economic reasons, and of course, as has been mentioned earlier today, uh, more and more often people are also trying to adapt to uh, climate change. Now, um, there's a question of physical danger when they're on the move itself. Um, Perhaps you've seen some of the recent news about a major movement from South America to Central America through the Darien Strait, incredibly dangerous. Uh, but there's also a risk once they get to the place where they're at. So in the presentations that we'll have today, uh, we'll learn more about these risks, especially, especially from a health perspective. And the innovation that's being brought to the table in trying to solve some of the sensibil some of the risks, the vulnerabilities that these populations are, are facing. Okay, um, so uh, we're going to do a little different. Uh, we're going to do the dynamic a bit different than the other uh, than the other sessions uh, for a question of time. So with the first presentation. Uh, we'll have questions immediately afterwards. So, but th for the rest of the presentations, we'll have the questions at the end. Okay. So, um, to start, um, I understand that Dr. Khatib, the associate professor of global health at the Karolinska Institute, is online. Um, are you there, Dr. Khatib? Uh, yes. Hello. Can you see me? Yes. Um, some support here. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Great. Great. Let me share, share my screen. screen. Can you see, see my screen? screen? We see your screen perfectly. And we hear you fine, Dr. Khatib. 
Great, great. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Um, so, so I will dive straight into it also due to the time as well. As well. Um, so, so the, the idea, idea here is that basically about immunization health, health that how can we really rethink uh, children immunization programs, and, and I'm, going, I'm going to share a uh, little bit from uh, a different context based on uh, refugees' context, violence settings, and tense, unstable settings in the low in and in the low income settings. settings. Uh, the, the idea started, started by the, the famous, famous using the famous yellow, yellow card or the uh, uh, children immunization card that it's hard, hard for the parents to actually remember all the details, and especially when you scribble on them the details, details. And, and especially when they move in, 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 in start with the context of refugees, refugees that they move somewhere else, else. Most, most probably they're, they're going to use, to use these, these cards, and, and on, on the top of it, when, when parents, parents going, going into, uh, as, as refugees, refugees, going, going into different, different places, places, they are going into so many life transitions and, and a lot of stress, stress around them. them. So, so, and, and then, then with COVID, COVID happened recently, um, there, there are a lot of information that our parents will be missing them. them. And, and on, on the top, top of it as well, well when we talk about the SDGs, uh, it's the, the majority, majority of the SDG goals actually the vaccination talk to them and information for parents. So, so the, the idea, idea came, came into, into place that, that how can, can we have an immunization app, children immunization app called SEMA to basically provide digitalized uh, information about, about the vaccines, uh, the vaccines appointments, reminders about the vaccines for the parents, and, and if, if the parents, parents miss, miss the appointment, so then, then they, they will have a reminder, reminder that, hey, you missed, missed the appointment as well, as well and, and then they, they can record all the children's immunization records in this app, plus the benefits of the vaccines, and, and later on when, when COVID, COVID happened, in terms, in terms of information about COVID and also uh, information about parenting skills during stressful times that was information, information uh, uh, parenting skills evidence-based information published by the UNODC. Um, so the project started at the refugee camp in Jordan. Um, it was an app that, that the parents, they use it, they install it on their smartphones. And the, the context, context of the camp in Jordan, the Zatari camp, was, was that, that the majority of parents, almost 99.9% the households, and there is at least one person in the household uh, owns a smartphone. But then and later on, on, when we there was, there was an interest in the app to be used in Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa we, we realized that this is going to create an exclusion criteria when, when it comes to using the app by the parents, because, because not everyone is using smartphones in the general community in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the idea became that we create a clinic-based app where they can install it in the clinic and then they record the information inside the clinic and then the communication with the parents will happen through SMS uh, with reminders, automated reminders, plus health information to the parents. So the app, as we speak, is being uh, uh, tested in uh, north of Cameroon, which is a, a violent place that there's a tension there uh, in terms of guns, in terms of curfews. So the Minister of Health is highly interested in how to stay in touch with the parents and especially through the immunization program by providing the correct information about health-related issues. Um, so the, the outcome from the, uh, the uh, parents app was quite successful in the, in the Zatari camp in Jordan. We saw a reduction. We had a couple of studies, but based of, because of the limitation of time, I will not go so much into details. We looked into the cost effectiveness. We looked into uh, the effectivity of the app. Uh, we looked into the technology literacy for the parents. So we learned a lot from the context of the Zatari camp. And now the clinic-based app has uh, different features regarding the support of the clinic as well for the parents. So when it comes to defaulters, uh, that they can uh, mobilize resources and the community, community health workers to be able to go and uh, trace what happened to the defaulters or call them. Um, so we did a, a small testing at the beginning and we saw that 
some parents actually they go somewhere else. They don't they don't come back to the same clinic, so we cannot call them defaulters. So now we are learning again how can we be systematic in this, and then we are only limiting it to the parents who are under the catchment area of this uh, vaccination clinic to be able to not to go into the false signal of defaulters. Um, also, the app has uh, the children information for the parents, has educational information. Uh, also, we have uh, we are now developing a vaccine course training for uh, the nurses as well from a public health perspective. It can work offline. So whenever the nurse uh, has an internet connection, then it can upload to a secured server uh, the information of the, the, the vaccine uh, appointments. Uh, the health messages uh, are, we are using uh, the health messages from evidence-based information from the UNODC, but also the UNICEF has released recently parenting tips. So we are also, as we speak, integrating uh, these parenting tips into uh, the SEMA app. And uh, we have the automated reminders as well. And also due to the internet connection, we managed to learn how to um, uh, overcome different different technical hiccups in the process to be able to optimize the process where uh, the internet can uh, be on off or the internet connection can be not so 100% reliable. Uh, in Lebanon, Lebanon has a, a, a economic crisis. So since two years now over around for around two years, and due to the economic crisis and the loss of the of the local currency in Lebanon, the Minister of Health started to have gaps in the in the vaccines that are available uh, for the children immunization programs, national immunization programs. And then they they suggested five vaccines to become optional because they are lacking in the uh, outpatient departments in different clinics uh, and also for the ministry supply. So the vaccine track record becomes very important, especially if there will be any outbreak happening in any area to understand what's happening. So now we are translating the app into Arabic language. Right now the app is available in English and French and now Arabic is on the way. Um, in Rwanda, uh, also we received the approval and also soon will be launched as well. The app, we will be launching it in English and in Kenya, Rwanda, uh, because the last uh, the last bit of the vaccination, national vaccination program in Rwanda, there is a gap in it. However, Rwanda has the among the highest vaccination uh, rate in the world. But the Ministry of Health would like to really would like us to test the app from zero until 15 months to see whether the last bit can be supported. And uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge all the, the collaborators and the funders. Without them, really, we, we couldn't do this work. And uh, I'm now ready for your questions. Thank you. to increase vaccination. Um, so as I said, we're going to do it a bit different uh, with Dr. Khatib. He has to go to uh, another meeting. I don't know if anyone has uh, a question for Dr. Khatib. Yes, just a second. In absence of internet and connectivity, how do you tell parents that this will work? Did you hear the question, Dr. Khatib? Yeah, thank you. Um, I heard the, the question, question that in the absence of internet, internet connectivity, connectivity, how to, to, to carry out this project? project. Uh, the, the internet is not 100% offline. Uh, when, whenever, whenever there is an internet connection, so the app can operate on an Android phone uh, in, when in an offline mode, and whenever there is an internet connection, it will uh, it will upload it will push the data towards the server. Uh, however, of course, 
uh, it is preferable to have the internet on a daily basis for a short period of time because if there are uh, babies coming back to their appointments, you would like the server to be notified so then, then there is no false signal of sending a reminder for uh, parents to come back you missed your appointment while the parents actually have been there. So, so we, we made a delay, delay for around 30 hours after the official day of the appointment to give a margin in case there is no internet up to 30, 30 hours. So, so far it has been good and okay, the process, uh, but it's a very good question, so we, we, we kept this in mind. But uh, from, from the context where we are doing the testing right now, um, the internet is available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khatib. Any other questions? All right, well, in that case, thank you very much, Dr. Khatib. Uh, an applause for Dr. Khatib, please. Thank you so much, thank you. And, and sorry, sorry again, actually, actually I have, I have, I have a, a, a medical, medical appointment. appointment. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Oh, that's fine. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Great. So we're going to continue with the other speakers. We have two, we have three more speakers online. Um, next, uh, actually we're going back to Malaysia. Um, so we are going to speak with Dr. Uh, Rajaratnam, a senior lecturer at the National University of Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Rajaratnam, are you online? Okay, we have your presentation. Are you there, sir? Oh, it's recorded. Okay. Sorry, it's recording. Healthcare in Malaysia implications for research, social policy, and social work practice. I conducted this study as part of my um, PhD research, which I completed in 2020. Um, I looked at the challenges faced by Rohingya women and girls in accessing healthcare. You might wonder why the Rohingyas. Um, Rohingyas constitute to about 100,000 out of 183,000 refugees in their country. And approximately 34% of them are women. This study is important. It's also because there's a lack of research on refugees and healthcare services in the country, especially from social work perspective. As social work research is done primarily to um, inform practice, the study can also be a reference to the formulation of social work practices with refugees and asylum seekers um, in Malaysia. We also hope that the results of the research will be useful for the Ministry of Health um, who, that governs uh, medical social workers in public hospitals in the country as well as the Ministry of Women, Family, and uh, Community Development, which govern other social workers in civil services in, in Malaysia. As for the methods, qualitative case study design were used. Um, primary data for this study were gathered from 33 participants comprising of Rohingya women, refugees, and asylum seekers, medical social workers, uh, medical officials, um, volunteer workers, activists, refugee organization officers, and the mental health care service provider. Members from the Rohingya Women Development Network, RWDN, a Rohingya women's organization in Malaysia, helped to collect the data from Rohingya women in Oman. This organization worked with and for Rohingya women, implementing various initiatives, including advocacy, education, and women's empowerment. The study also used data from post group discussion um, with two groups of Rohingya women and in depth interviews with 12 Rohingya women as well. In a public hospital in Malaysia, key informant interviews were conducted with medical social workers as well as medical officers. Some more interviews were conducted also with volunteer workers, activists, refugee organization officers, and uh, healthcare service provider, mental health care service provider, sorry for refugees and asylum seekers. Ethical approval to conduct the study was obtained from the Medical Research and Ethics Committee of Malaysia, MREC, as well as Human Research 
Ethics Committee of University Science Malaysia, where I conducted this PhD study. This is the description of the participants and interview location. You can see the methods used uh, as well as the participant, the location, the number of participants, as well as uh, sessions conducted for this study. Let us now go to the findings. The Rohingya refugee women and asylum seekers interviewed for this study reported experiences where they themselves or other women were harassed, raped, or even murdered. These were perpetrated by rioters and authorities when they were in Myanmar and by traffickers when they were fleeing the country by boat. You can see the visual on the slide which shows the migration path to Malaysia via sea. The informants of this study predominantly travel either from Myanmar to Bangladesh and Thailand and then to Malaysia for directly reach uh, Malaysia from Myanmar. They fled their homes during and after the conflict to avoid the violence and other hardship. There were physical violence perpetrated against the people on the boat, especially men by the traffickers. There are many accounts of um, men not being led to bathe. Many died on the boat, unable to bear the assault or owing to illnesses. There was no way to account for the number of deaths, that's what uh, these women told. Their bodies were typically wrapped in plastic and thrown into the sea. While some endured this violence on the boat, others experienced it in temporary shelters in Thailand. It was easier for the traffickers to abuse them in Thailand. They were housed in smaller groups. They were separated and taken away in smaller groups. Apart from being subjected to harassment and violence by the traffickers, the Rohingyas did not have access to safe and clean shelter, um, adequate food, clean water to drink, and fresh clothes to uh, change into. They didn't really have uh, any medicines to use in case of any uh, can eat. Once these Rohingyas were released by the traffickers into Malaysia upon recovering their money, their suffering did not end. Rohingya women and girls continue to face numerous challenges in Malaysia, including intimate partner violence. To this study, we also wanted to know uh, these women's access to public hospitals, um, as well as the larger Rohingya community. We found that the Rohingyas generally access public hospitals that are closer to where they live and work. In the hospitals where this research was conducted, a high number of Rohingya patients were seen because it is located near a wholesale market where a high number of people from this ethnic uh, group live. The registration and possession of a UNHCR card have a significant impact on the Rohingya's access to healthcare services, particularly public hospitals in Malaysia. Among the Rohingya women and girls, those who are pregnant and those with serious health conditions were the ones who were most at risk as they faced barriers to receive medical assistance. The majority of the challenges and fears associated with pregnancy and delivery were shared by uh, younger Rohingya informants. Those without a UNHCR card reported to avoid visiting hospitals for fear of being arrested, detained, or unable to receive treatment. Financial barriers to healthcare services, to access healthcare services, the inability of refugees and asylum seekers to pay for their hospital bills and medicine emerged as one of the main barriers to their access to public hospitals in Malaysia. The Rohingyas were connected to any NGOs or Malaysian locals or individuals who can assist them with the admission and guarantee that their bills will be paid and can sometimes gain better access than others who do not have this connection or network. When we looked at what medical social workers in the hospitals, uh, what they do and how they work with refugees and asylum seekers, we found that in Malaysia, medical social workers provide their services only for Malaysian citizens. In the case of refugees and asylum seekers, they only take up their case if the patient is under 18 years old. As these patients are protected under the Child Act. As for the conclusion, the challenges the Rohingyas face do not end after arriving in Malaysia. 
women and girls, especially they continue to face violence perpetrated by the husbands, even within and outside um, the institutions of marriage. Their suffering is compounded by their lack of um, recognition of status of refugees uh, in Malaysia. And that prevents them from having mainstream or legal access to employment, education, and healthcare. We know that the Rohingya women will continue to face these challenges, which affects their physical and mental health. Despite their coping strategies, if policymakers, social workers, researchers, and other key stakeholders do not take measure at various institutional levels, the Rohingyas, especially the women and girls in Malaysia, will not be able to have better access to health consequently a better life. For the key suggestions um, for research, I believe that men and boys would also have been subjected to uh, violence, including sexual violence, um, apart from them being the perpetrators. This was beyond the scope of our investigation. Future research could focus on perspectives of men and boys who have been victims, as well as perpetrators of physical, emotional, psychological, as well as sexual violence. Um, as for social policies, there's a need for cross-sectoral coordination. There needs to be a policy that facilitates this uh, coordination to enable social workers to provide services to refugees and asylum seeking women and girls in the country. Social workers need to also advocate for the needs of asylum seekers and refugees at the national and state levels. As social workers in Malaysia are in the process of introducing the social work profession bill in parliament, which we anticipate will happen uh, in, the current, in the coming years, the bill will allow for the recognition of the profession of social work, registration and certification of practice, which will be regulated by the Social Work Profession Council. I hope this study will not only highlight the need for social workers to be present, but also for those who specialize in working with refugees and asylum seekers. We need refugee and asylum seekers, social workers in the country. As for social work practice, this study suggests that um, social workers in hospital be trained to work with refugees and asylum seekers. They need to be trained and sensitized to various needs of refugees and asylum seekers in the country, especially for those who are coming, fleeing the conflict and, and uh, arriving here, they need a lot more attention and care. And, and it varies depending on um, the nature of the event that they are fleeing from. They need to, social workers need to also build networks with non-governmental organizations that are able to provide support and assistance to refugees and asylum seekers. Um, so they need to work with this organization. As for limitation, this study is not without its limitation. This study was carried out with only one group of Rohingya women within a particular age range and uh, those who live in one area within a state with a number of, where the number of Rohingyas were high. The researchers did not look into other intersectional social identities of the Rohingya women as this was also beyond the scope of the study. However, despite the limitations, uh, the research provides important challenges Rohingya women and girls face within their family and in accessing healthcare services that they need. This study would not have been um, possible if not for all the informants in the study. I would like to thank all of them. A special thanks to uh, all, Rohing all the Rohingya women informants who trusted us and provided information as well as their time for this study. I would also like to thank um, and express my deepest gratitude to Sharifa Shakira from RWDN and Imran Muhammad. I wouldn't have completed this study without uh, both of them. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out um, via my email, which I've uh, posted on the last slide. Thank you. All right. Well, a very interesting presentation. We see another facet of vulnerable groups, uh, particularly women.
and uh, innovative research on the role that social work can play uh, as part of a cross-sectoral strategy to be able to attend these meetings. Um, the next person that we have is Dr. Ashrafu Khan uh, of the ICDDRB. Um, Dr. Khan, uh, good afternoon and welcome. Hello, good, good afternoon. afternoon. Uh, the microphone is yours, sir. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you hear, hear me? me? Yes, we hear you fine. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, respected audience and my dear colleagues, assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Rasha Fulislam Khan. Uh, I'm going to talk on cholera surveillance for early warning and preparedness for epidemics in Rohingya Myanmar nationals in Cuxis Bazar. Uh, we all know the Rohingya Myanmar nationals were forcefully displaced from their own nation. Just after a massive influx of uh, these Rohingya uh, nationals that started since uh, 25th August 2017, a high offic official team from government of Bangladesh and ICDRB visited uh, these places uh, like Ukia and Tekna Upajela of Kaksis Bazar, where uh, they came to assess the situation. And considering the public health situation, a surveillance network uh, was established to identify the enteric pathogens and early detection of cholera epidemics. Cholera is one of the major public health problems globally, and Bangladesh is a cholera endemic country, and this disease is recorded all over the country, not uh, only the Kaksis Bazar, it is uh, everywhere. The global cholera burden was estimated uh, around 2.86 million cases uh, per year, and the population at risk of uh, approximately 1.3 billion, and which is uh, among the 69 endemic countries. And this uh, national uh, one came here. Uh, the diarrheal diseases, including the cholera, have long been uh, regarded as a serious threat uh, to the refugee population, like uh, this Myanmar uh, Rohingya refugees. And these newly arrived displaced people living in such a condition where uh, public health uh, facilities were lacking. Uh, and the prevailing conditions confer to a high risk uh, to them for the cholera. And assessing the risk uh, of an outbreak, the government of Bangladesh, with the support of a uh, global task force for cholera control, the World Health Organization, ICDRB, and other stakeholders conducted a uh, campaign uh, just uh, one month after their massive arrival, that is October uh, 2017. And moreover, ICDRB also initiated cholera surveillance uh, with the aim to identify the outbreak of diarrhea and uh, cholera to take appropriate preventive measures, including uh, uh, necessary campaigns. And uh, the surveillance, uh, initially the surveillance uh, uh, immediately after their influx, the two surveillance sites was initially opened. And gradually, uh, several sites uh, in Ukia and Technam. And these were the facility based sentinel surveillance. And basically, the, this comprises the IOM hospitals, MSF clinics, uh, other government and non government uh, uh, health facilities. And this uh, uh, map shows the uh, sentinel sites uh, resided in the Ukia and Technam Upuchela of Cox's Weather District. And uh, this slide shows the, all the long list of 17 uh, sentinel uh, cholera sites. Uh, and uh, these are uh, basically uh, the uh, 14 sites in Ukia and three sites in Tekna Pujela of Cox Bazar. And it comprises both the government and non government health facilities, and including the Upujela Health Complex, both Upujela Health Complex. And uh, these are resided around the camps and mainly covered the, cover, covering the FDMN population as well as the host population. And this uh, surveillance uh, uh, 
has a person definition case definition the patient attending treatment facility with three or more loose or liquid stools within 24 hours or less than three loose or liquid uh, stools causing dehydration was considered potentially eligible for the surveillance system and those who matched the case definition and had no other severe comorbidity they were enrolled and we targeted uh, the 10 radial patients from each surveillance sites per week and we tested uh, for the for the uh, video quality and the surveillance also uh, uh, tested other pathogens like uh, other enteric, enteric pathogens like enterotoxigenic e coli salmonella shigella and uh, the certain percentage of uh, samples were tested for these other uh, pathogens. And upon receiving the consents, patients' uh, socioeconomic characteristics such as age, uh, gender, uh, profession, medical history, sanitation, hygiene history, these were recorded. And a stool sample was collected uh, from each participant, and a rapid diagnostic test, RDT, was performed uh, for the review quality. And sample are also uh, stored in the carry media, uh, transport, transportation media, and these uh, samples were transported at the central uh, lab at ICDDRP Dhaka. And from uh, this surveillance system, uh, from September 2017 to April 2023, a uh, total of uh, more than 17,000 samples were uh, collected and tested uh, from the MPM uh, populations. Among the tested samples, 3.5% uh, were uh, detected uh, positive by uh, rapid diagnostic test, RDT, and 1.4% uh, were uh, culture confirmed with the recovery. Over 3% uh, Rohingya participants uh, presented with severe dehydration, and in addition uh, to the recovery, uh, the other enteric pathogens like enterotoxicity E. coli was 11%, uh, followed by Salmonella 3.9%, uh, and Shigella 2.7%. Were identified. And major risk uh, uh, for cholera uh, were AIDS, patient uh, presenting with vomiting, uh, dehydration, and a sharp stool, and also the process of water treatment. And we identified the seasonality of the cholera cases showed between the mostly uh, the time in the September to October, and there were several rounds of uh, vaccines were conducted in this population. And this slide shows uh, the year-wise distribution of RDT positive and culture-confirmed cholera cases among the Rohingya Myanmar nationals. And we see the uh, approximate uh, average 3.4% uh, samples were tested positive uh, by RDT and 1.4% were culture-confirmed cholera. And uh, this uh, graph shows the monthly distribution of RDT positive and culture-confirmed uh, cholera cases. And from this graph, we observe, we see that the, between the September and November 2019, we observed the first spike of uh, confirmed cholera cases among the Rohingya Myanmar nationals uh, following their massive influx. The next increase in cholera cases was observed in June 2021 and, and lasted until the October 2021. And the next year in September 2022, Another upsurge was detected, and all this uh, upsurge was uh, basically peaks so occurred during the post monsoon season. Uh, and and the, in in this year, the 2023, the last call outbreak was observed uh, during the month of March and April, which is the pre monsoon period. And uh, we can say that our key findings were uh, this dem uh, start demonstrate the cholera prevalence and epidemiology among the uh, these Rohingya Myanmar nationals. And uh, the surveillance data shows that most of the upsurge occurs uh, during the uh, post monsoon period, although that in this year this upsurge happened in the pre monsoon period. And there are some risks identified, like the age group less than five years and patient presenting with vomiting, dehydration. Severe, uh, severe cases and the uh, uh, process of water treatment and hand washing practices were the risk factors, major risk factors. And uh, considering the risk and and the res in response to the upsurge cholera cases detected in the surveillance system, there were uh, several uh, seven rounds of OCP campaigns that were carried out over time period, and a clear declining trend uh, of acute watery diarrhea and cholera was found 
after each round of the uh, campaign. And all the results uh, from the surveillance uh, uh, were incorporated with the WHO early warning alert and response system, that is EORS. And in response to any notification of cholera cases from the surveillance uh, team, uh, triggered to activate a joint assessment and response team uh, that follow the cases and identify the sources and, and restrict the transmission. And this surveillance uh, has been the only source of culture, only source of culture confirmed color data. And by using this data, uh, there were reactive OCB campaigns were carried out in these given populations. And these are the some a few pictures of uh, OCB campaigns uh, in the Rohingya camp. And uh, this surveillance system generated uh, evidence, uh, and this surveillance data uh, from we published. Uh, different uh, prestigious journals, uh, peer review prestigious journals, including the Lancet. These are the some uh, publications here. In conclusion, we could say the cholera surveillance in the camps uh, area provided a visual on any sort of cholera epidemic and helped the rapid response team to take immediate and necessary measures to prevent or end control. And after the influx, continuous monitoring, so surveillance and uh, joint uh, collaboration team all uh, help to take the appropriate measures to control the cholera epidemic uh, uh, in this population, uh, along with the involvement of the WASH and health sector partners. And whenever any triggers of cholera upsurge were detected, OCB campaigns was planned and executed uh, to combat with the disease. And aligning, aligning the surveillance data, including the RDT and culture results, with the UR systems uh, that helped to reduce the cholera burden in Bangladesh. And this system can be implemented in similar refugee settings around the globe. We acknowledge the participants, those who have uh, participated in this surveillance system. And the study was funded by the UNICEF. And thank you all. Thanks for you uh, for the patient's theory. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. Um, as we can see that one of the significant challenges that uh, refugees face, in this case, uh, something very close to home, is uh, when the basic conditions um, result in something so basic like this that will potentially potentially end up killing uh, some young children. Um, all right, great. So moving on then, um, the next presentation is also uh, another case of uh, what's happening in Cox's Bazaar. Um, so for this presentation, we have Dr. Sunyato of MSF and uh, Dr. Islam as well. Um, one of them is based in Luxembourg, and the other one's based in Cox Bazaar. Uh, so the mic's yours. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, at first, I want to thank uh, to the MSC scientific team uh, to give me the opportunity to present our study. Also, I want to give the thanks to my colleagues, families, and uh, my friends uh, who are now watching me. Let's go to my, go to my presentation. Uh, that's my presentation, the title. The title of our study is KBC in Cox Bazar, Bangladesh, a retrospective analysis of the epidemiological and clinical characteristics of cases, March 2022 to March 2023. Next. Next, please. Background. As most of us know, scabies is an infestation caused by the mite, sarcoptes scabies, affecting the skin, causing skin lesions and itching, particularly at night. 
In 2017, World Health Organization categorized the scabies as a neglected tropical disease. Scabies is considered as a common treatable disease, but it can be occurred as epidemic as well as outbreak, most commonly in the overcrowded situations like prisons, nursing homes, schools, and the refugee camps. In Cox's Bazar, the influx of Rohingya refugees started in August 2017, and now they are hosted in 33 congested camps. MSA provides primary health care services in the refugee camps and noticed increased skin disease in the consultations of outpatient departments towards the end of 2021 and early of 2022. As the trend failed, all the health care facilities, the health sector coordination was alerted. Then all health organization was conducted to rapid community mapping in 2022 and found that the prevalence rapidly declining. The first survey was done in April 2022 and the prevalence was more than 10% and the repeat survey was done in June 2022 and the prevalence was less than 2%. However, the number of scabies, skin disease consultations in the outpatient departments remained high. Then finally, all health organizations uh, was conducted a prevalence survey in May 2023 and published the result in July 2023. And the result showed that the average prevalence was 40% with some camp as high as 90%. Study objective. Our study objective is to describe the epidemiological and clinical characteristics of cases treated in MSF scabies clinic during the period March 2022 to March 2023, which include demographic characteristics, clinical characteristics, and programmatic descriptions. We hope that our study could help inform course of action in tackling the situations. Methodology. Uh, the study design is cross-sectional study using routinely collected program data. The study setting is uh, two primary healthcare centers located in Camp 14 and 15 supported by MSF. Each has separate clinic dedicated to treating scabies. Total population. The top total population of both camps around 90,000, but people from nearby camp 16, about population 22,000, others camp, as well as the host community can also access to these healthcare facilities. Who was included in our study? Well, all individuals of all ages of all nationalities who seek care in the SKBs clinic during the period March 2022 to March 2023 were included in our study. Data source. The data we used was extracted from project monitoring tool in Kobo, which was entered real time during the consultations and supervised by medical data supervisor. Data cleaning. The extracted database was then cleaned by Microsoft Excel and analyzed by SPSS. Ethical consideration. This study fulfilled the exemption criteria set by the MSF Ethical Review Board for posteriori analysis of routinely collected clinical data. The ERB known is 2346. This study was conducted with the permission from Medical Director Operational Center Brussels and received the exemption ethical approval from the Ethical Review Board of the University of Creative Technology, Chidong, Bangladesh. This is the result. Here we can show that there are high number of consultation in this period. The red mark indicates the study duration. During this time, the total number of scabies was 1,40,120, which was based on the consultation at the MSF scabies clinic within the period 12 March 2022 to 16th March 2023. As we show that there are some months with a high peak. Uh, in this data, in this slide, we can show that the highest present ca cases was presented in January 2023. And it was around 15,000, which was 10.3% of the total number of cases, and around 2,965 cases per week. For the demographic characteristics, the age group. Our study found that SKB is not only affected the young age group, but also the adults, which are the major. About 35% of cases uh, affected uh, less than 5 years old, but 40% of cases was adult more than 15 years old. Gender. According to our data, female gender or major, about 58% of patients are female and 42% patients are the male. 
which actually lower proportion than in our general OPD. In our general OPD, about two third patients were female and one third patients are male. Nationality, where we can see that about more than 95 percent patients were forcibly displayed Myanmar nationals. On the other hand, on less than five percent of patients are Bangladeshi nationals. As for the camp origin, according to the proportion with the size of the camp, more 50, 45 percent patients came from camp 15 and 35 percent patient came from camp 14. Roughly about 20 percent of patients came from camp 16 and others came. Household members, majority of the, our patients, about 80 percent or came from household 5 to 10 members. For the clinical characteristics, during the study period, simple scabies dominates 82 percent and complicated scabies stand at 18 percent. For the case category, 73 percent were categorized as new cases, while 18 percent were reinfested. That means they already had it before, but scabies came back again after the four weeks, even though the initial effective thought of treatment, successful effective the treatment. Contact cases, the asymptomatic common that by default were advised to come to the clinic for medication. This accounts for 9 percent of the total patients. This data shows the breakdown of age and sex for case selection and case type. We differentiated the new cases, reinfestation and contact cases started from July 2022. The proportionate of new cases was 88.1 percent in the initial first three months but decreased to 71.4 percent after the subsequent period. Reinfestation was 7.8 8 percent but increased to 19.3 percent after the initial of first three months. Contact cases were also treated and constitute about 9.3 percent. Complicated scabies with secondary bacterial infections was 7.8 percent is increased to 7.8 percent to 18.7 percent after the initial first three months. Now the treatment. The treatment was Oral ivermectin 200 microgram per kg body weight, while permethrin was used for those contraindicated to oral ivermectin, such as pregnant women and children less than 15 kg. Here the data showed overall 71 percent of patients were treated with oral ivermectin, while permethrin was used only 29.8 percent. The first dose of oral ivermectin was given. DOT, directly observed therapy, that means the tablet was taken in front of a health worker and moreover 20.5 percent of cases has uh, got the antibiotics which corresponded the total number of complicated cases. Finally 60 percent of cases were got the antihistamine. That's all from my side. Now I want to uh, come my this advisor. You and actually it was just that all mean. I think we see a lot of data, a lot of numbers. So but it kind of give you the whole description of what has been happening in Kokbazar regarding this outbreak. Oops. Anything? But I think the slide disappears. Yeah, sorry about that, but I think this is Kind of a cumulative we show for the one year of uh, data collection, and I think sometimes the most important of study and research is what does it have, what implication it has on practice, and also what uh, we can do with it. So, so as we see, the results show that there has been a high sustained caseload of the scabious cases, which in this case MSF has to dedicate dedicate resources making the clinics with the uh, HR to take care of this high load of cases with come also with limitations because imagine if you see 500 consultation per week or even per day then you have to also consider how the quality of care that we are giving I think all of us knew scabies you know it's as mentioned before by Soriful, it's a neglected disease but also that it's 
treatable. And actually, we see that there is nothing surprising in terms of epidemiological and clinical characteristics. There are many literature who show it's affecting younger children. In our case, it's affecting all children. But I think what's important to note is how it evolves over time, that we see that in the first three months, there are just simple cases, easily treatable. After nine months after, we see that the proportion of complicated cases, those with uh, bacterial infection, increased considerably to one in five. And furthermore, small proportion of scabious cases can also develop kidney diseases or even sepsis related to the bacterial co-infection. So MSF has been so far doing the screen and treat strategy, meaning we treat the patient who come to seek care. We also told them to bring the household member who may not be symptomatic yet, but need some treatment as well. At a certain moment, we increase from just giving single dose, which is quite effective as well with ivermectin. But then we also give the double dose, which has to be given between 7 to 14 days, and also make sure that there is water in the health facility for the patient to take their first medicine with this DOT approach. Uh, furthermore, I would like to tell you, which I think the team is also sitting here, to tell the additional programmatic intervention that we do. Because we know treating alone is not enough. We see we treat 140,000 cases for two camps with 90,000 people. So you can say that maybe everybody has been treated once at least. The Watson team, the environmental health, has done an in-depth assessment, which reveals that even though the number of water points or water source may be enough, but the functionality and the utilization may be suboptimal. Hence, we also intensified health promotion activities through our community health volunteers. And as well, we conducted several internal assessments on the behavior and also the treatment compliance, whether if we give the second dose at home, whether they will really take it on the prescribed days. Uh, additionally, we also try to identify the hotspot where the, where the reinfestation or transmission can continue to occur, such as the madrasa or the schools where the students normally sleep there, uh, study there during the week, and come back to the household during the weekend. And as well, we also try to treat household as a unit of intervention. So we go to the house, we don't decontaminate the bed sheet, the linens, and the environment, and so on. And also, we try to distribute as well the hygiene kits for a few months in 2022. Last but not least, I think it's quite important is to continue documenting this um, challenge that we face in order to inform the advocacy efforts and mobilizing the other actors that uh, is active in the camp, because I think MSF alone cannot solve uh, the problem. So the, uh, we, we acknowledge that the study is, has its limitation, especially that the use of the routine data, which we already know the load of the patient that we see. So even though it's an entry on the point, real time, maybe the quality of data may not be optimal, and as well, we are aware from the beginning that it's facility-based data, hence we don't have a real estimate on the community-based uh, incidence and prevalence. Also, in an effort to improve and refine our variables and data tools, there has been a change uh, of, of uh, category of data during the outbreak period. However, we are confident that it has been collected systematically in a dedicated service, and our medical assistants, such as Sorry, who, who presented before, were now fully trained and are uh, quite uh, uh, confident with all the data that we need to collect. So, as a conclusion from this study, we are aware that scabies is a real significant health concern in South Gaza refugee camp, with over 140,000 cases recorded during 12 months period. The screen and treat approach that has been implemented by MSF in its facilities is not sufficient to control the outbreak and cut the transmission chain. The scale of this outbreak alone warrants further actions, including prevalence survey, which happens after a while, and as well, uh, possible mass drug administrations, complemented by multidisciplinary intervention, especially related to environment and health and adequacy of water, and the camp's living conditions. So, I think the one who acknowledged the most, uh, who needs to be acknowledged is the, the community, of course, and uh, part of our team who is here, our data supervisor Shaquille, Mahmoud, and Sikit, who is sitting there, who has been tirelessly addressing the scabies outbreak in this very challenging setting. 
as well the University of Chittago and the community in, in the country. Looking forward to have your question. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm a little biased with this presentation because I've been quite involved, and I would say that one of the successes of this research is in fact that uh, the health sector has committed to the MDA in Cox Bazar, which should be rolled out uh, shortly. Um, so uh, that's excellent work, uh, where we get this research that actually ends up in doing uh, significant um, pushes of other actors. All right, um, so um, next we have, again, uh, Cox Bazaar. Um, and actually a really interesting perspective here. Uh, right now we focused on very tangible aspects, um, well, diseases, uh, but the next presentation is very interesting in this sense. So uh, I present uh, Dr. Yancey uh, from McMaster University in, the, in Canada. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, my name is Rachel Yanti, and I am a former nurse and exercise instructor at Royal Mountain and a PhD student in, uh, at McMaster University in Canada. And I'll be talking today about the role of spirituality and end of life care in Cox Bazaar for Um, so, just a bit of context. Um, it sounds like we're all quite aware of what's happening in Cox Bazaar, generally speaking, but um, our study took place at Goilamara Mother Child Hospital, which is located just on the southern end of the main medical campus, just outside Kingston Park. And so it serves both um, Rohingya families and patients, as well as um, Bangladeshi home um, Goilamara offers the highest level of care that's available in for neonatology and preventive care. So any, the most critical patients um, in that category are usually at the Royal Mount Hospital. Um, uh, the thing is we have limitations in terms of the capacity and the scope of that level of care, so we aren't able to offer advanced patient care like ventilators, dialysis, and so on. Um, since around 2019, there's been increasingly a focus on preventive care and end-of-life care at Royal Amara because of Complexity of patients that, are, that come there, as well as the relatively high mortality rate in the Indian Department of Health. So, the purpose of our study was to understand the experiences of MSF staff who were involved in providing palliative and end of life care in order to inform program implementation of palliative care, both at Goyal Amara, in other MSF contexts, and also in other humanitarian. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on findings related to the role of spirituality and uh, religious values in decision making that inform the death. Um, obviously, uh, family and uh, patient involvement in decision making is critically important in palliative care because of different methodological and ethical reasons we weren't able to understand the um, so this was a focused ethnography, and it took place um, between March and August of 2021 when I was in the program on this project. We used four different types of data collection, different observations, including recorded and field notes, interviews with 22 individual staff members, health promotion sessions that were documented in the subject of the field, also five focus group discussions with some of the teams in community health, um, analysis of documents such as clinical guidelines, palliative care guidelines, and um, There were a total of 37 unique participants or staff members that took part in an individual interview for a focus group. Um, all of them were Bangladeshi staff, with the exception of two Rohingya staff, and 
five and twenty. All of the local staff that were interviewed uh, were Muslim except for one that was from Singapore. Um, the international staff is just hard to really um, describe any specific um, And because of the focus of the study, I consulted with several co authors and colleagues who were either Bangladeshi or And just to note that the study was received as a proposal both from the local staff as well as the Bangladeshi University. Um, so, um, according to the World Health Organization, palliative care involves relieving um, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual suffering on children, adults, who are facing life threatening End of life care is understood to be one part of that larger. Um, at Guela Mara, the, the English phrase palliative care had a slightly different meaning. Um, it tended to really refer to the care in the last hours and days of life, uh, when most of the options for care were available in the United States. Um, it tended to mark a transition when a child switched from the focus of care for injured to the comfort of the And the phrase putting a child in palliative care. Um, Relieving suffering was an important part of the establishment of palliative care, um, but that tended to focus on avoiding Staff really emphasized the importance of psychological support, good communication, um, but those were things that were not said in other parts of the So, because of the significant shift in focus from child to quote unquote put in palliative care, the decision to do that was very complex. So there were three main values that really stood out um, present in both the did and these affected how staff experienced providing palliative care and how they um, in the next Slides, I'll be showing different quotes from the perspective of how they understood the The first one is the importance of taking our or taking action on behalf of our patients. This was really strongly present in most of the people often said things like, We have tried that, or I feel okay about taking your word for it, or whatever. This was really significant. Um, as this one nurse said, Caregiver next to the child is also a sad child, but we have done enough for them. After trying hard enough, we have nothing to do. They will be satisfied with us when we have done enough. Um, another really important value that the staff um, predisposed for was this idea of was best exemplified by this quote on the slide. I heard this nurse said, now above all, we have to make sure those of us who are patients know that we are just first and death of the blood Now, this idea of being a medium of the health care that we provide, God is working through us to make sure that we are there for our patients. Um, this idea was interpreted quite differently by different people. For some people, that meant that God is working through us and our care has been And so when concerns came up about the health of the patient, very upset about the health of the One nurse said, uh, Rohingya families are suffering from the pain of their bodies and their minds, apart from the pain of the Other people really emphasized the need to be patient. Um, we have done everything we could, and at this point, we can't do anything else. We have to just keep doing what the God's been doing. Other staff emphasized You are not God's medicine. Um, among our international staff, some of the Bangladeshi doctors, there was a, a really strong emphasis on the um, The quote that I think best explains this is from the Bangladeshi doctors. They said,
said, we need to accept that as healthcare providers, the first thing we always need to remember is that we are not patients, we are not patients. And by giving treatment to patients many, many times throughout the day, we need to step back a little, at least for these very reasons, why, what is our goal, and what is our intention. So for, from their perspective, a lot of the suffering that happens in the system is certainly a product of that, but from the point of view of the patient and what they need to do to make sure that they are getting the care that they need. So even among those folks who were staff who were doing this work, were Muslim, there was also this concern from an academic that if by choosing to do this work, um, not acknowledging our Muslim heritage and not acknowledging our heritage and not living in God, that we cause more social suffering than we can help. One nurse said, I don't have any right to burden her with my suffering, to, bur to burden her most of suffering. Almighty is the best of us. I wish that Allah knows best what will happen to us. So in many cases, we don't have anything to do with what is happening to us in this world. And accepting our limitations by accepting our suffering is the only way to make sure that we are getting the care that we need. So just a couple of thoughts um, from the conversations I've had with colleagues on this work. Um, it was very clear that even though the staff might have had different views of what was appropriate for the child, there was actually a lot of overlap between their underlying core beliefs and their ideas for best for the child. So what they wanted to do was to accept the limitations of what was happening to them. Even among some of the staff and staff who weren't religious themselves, there was still this acknowledgement that there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a curiosity and there's an exploration of some of the intersections of what I believe to be the best for the child. And so there was also this interesting way that even at people who had a similar religious value could interpret that same religious value in different ways and different contexts. Um, a colleague of mine shared, I apologize if I shared this or described this incorrectly, but a colleague of mine shared a very interesting hadith from the Quran in which the Prophet Muhammad um, said that he was going to tie up his hand and say, should I tie up my hand and say this so that it doesn't wander away or should I trust in God so that it doesn't Muhammad is said to have responded by saying, tie the hand of him who trusts in God. And so the idea is that we can, people have the capacity to hold different values at the same time and at different times in different contexts. And in palliative care, we have a, a phrase that's different but has a similar or similar implication. And that is that we hope for the best and we pray for the worst. And so we may be sincere in the hope that we will get the best, but of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. We might suggest that But there is also always a need for us to make sure that we are getting the best for the child. And that that's part of what we are trying to do. Um, important finding from this study is the way that um, conceptualization of the negative staff effects of what the Muslim religious value is is necessarily interpreted as not giving the child the best, as not giving the child the best for the child. That that was sort of contradictory with their values and with their beliefs and with their ethics. And so important to really emphasize the importance of this work and what it has to say is to actually be thinking about it from the standpoint of what is appropriate for the child and what is appropriate for the child. So that it's not in contradiction with what the Muslim religious value is. So a couple of recommendations. Um, when beginning a palliative care program, you should speak with staff and ask them what their goals are. It's really important to understand what the staff value and what the staff goal is for the child. This can be used towards Study like this, or drafting policy discussions, or even just informal conversations with the folks who are doing the work. Um, we would suggest that they get some sort of a plan or some sort of model or some intervention or some sort of way to have a lot of time to support the conversation with the child. For us, one thing that we noticed is that most of the staff were very uncomfortable with how patients are with their religious beliefs. So we passed on some of those ideas to the staff as well. So that was some Um, and then just, just recognizing that in the particular context of the work that we're doing, the power differences between staff and patient are really different. And all these factors make it really, really difficult to make sure that patients are getting the best for the child. But that's really the cornerstone of what we're trying to do. I think there's research that says 
did get a lot of people to share and help me with that. Um, but I just want to thank so much for us or um, continue to offer compassion to our friends and to all those who are here. Um, I really appreciate my colleagues for coming together for this group of All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Rachel. Sorry for that little delay. I just wanted to make sure it was next on the agenda. Um, so very, very interesting uh, perspective. Um, you know, this, uh, this question about looking at uh, belief systems and how they can support us and how we we, can um, we have somebody online right now, uh, Dr. Oliver Moore, who is a public health expert. Well, with significant experience in uh, in different contexts, uh, he will be sharing with us um, something um, um, a case about primary health care in two refugee camps at the Thai Myanmar border. So it's in the region. Um, Dr. Moore, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me, Dr. Moore? We don't hear you. Okay, okay just, just a second. second. Can you, Can you hear me, me now? now? Yes, we hear you perfect. Okay, okay perfect. perfect. So many thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm honored to present here at uh, with the MSF at the Scientific Day, and um, we could uh, start right away with the first slide. This is the uh, long title, and um, um, the title is the same as it is in the publication. We published the the, uh, the results of this study last year. And uh, so let's go right away to the introduction. Please, uh, the next slide. So on the Thai side of the border, there are camps for displaced people, and they were established uh, quite some time ago in the 80s already. And uh, since uh, 2018, there were around 87,000 refugees from the Myanmar side um, housed in nine official camps along the border. And there are several local and international NGOs supplying services uh, um, in close cooperation with the camp residents to ensure uh, access to basic needs. Next slide, please. So um, as, you, as you can see here on the left side, there's a, a little map and the orange dots show you the the camps uh, along the the Thai Myanmar border of course on the Thai side next slide please um Ma the, the NGO Malteser International I mean this is the NGO where, where we got the data from um offers health services water and sanitation the refugee camps uh, in two out of the two, in two out of the nine refugee camps along the border, the name of the camps are Melaun and Meramalwang, and each of the camps uh, harbors around uh, ten thousand refugees. So that was end of uh, two thousand eighteen. Um, the camps are located in the tropical forest, are difficult to access, and uh, the nearest hospital is eighty kilometers away. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So the um, what is the focus of the study? So it is more a, it was a descriptive study uh, uh, about the evolution of the healthcare support in the camps over an eighteen year period, um, from basic uh, curative care in the first years to uh, uh, to a comprehensive primary healthcare program, and also the. Uh, we assess the trends in all-cause mortality, though that is crude mortality, and infectious diseases targeted by the program. Next slide, please. 
Um, the primary healthcare program relies, of course, on local staff. So uh, camp residents who are able to communicate it in the local languages as well as in English. And this medical staff runs the outpatient and the inpatient clinics. Each of the camp is, um, has got one uh, uh, inpatient clinic and several outpatient clinics. The curriculum for, for the healthcare workers is a uh, uh, 11 months curriculum, six months theoretical, uh, theoretical, theoretical training and five months practical internship in the clinics. Next slide, please. Um, as mentioned before 2000, this uh, project uh, was mainly a curative healthcare program. And over, ye over the years, it became quite comprehensive. So prevention uh, was included, um, a strong mother and child component, the data collection and uh, was improved, guidelines established, um, and also a strong wash component. So water, sanitation, hygiene was included. Next slide, please. So um, what did we assess? So it was a retrospective primary healthcare evaluation. So we used secondary data and um, we assessed all cause mortality and morbidity, morbidity trends in uh, um, the most relevant infectious diseases. Also health service utilization was assessed. The problematic changes in the project and events with a pot potential effect on health of the tar target population was examined. Next slide, please. Um, so data collection was quite an issue since we had to go on one hand through all the reports which were written um, to the donor. The donor was uh, the EU. Um, and uh, so we went th through um, all the yearly rep reports to um, to check for the service pro provision training activities, events with a potential effect on health, all those um, all those uh, things were uh, retrospectively reviewed, and um, um, also all the wash uh, um, wash uh, activities, including vector control and other health interventions, were extracted of the from the annual reports. Next slide, please. So the other part of the data collection was the database. So from there we collected the, the demographic data. Uh, or we, we obtained the demographic data and the pooled annual mean of the camp's population was used as the denominator. So the crude mortality rate and disease specific, specific morbidity data from both camps were extracted. And uh, also we, um, we checked the outpatient consultations and three uh, WASH indicators were collected. And I can tell you already that of those three collectors, uh, three indicators we collected, all three of them were reached uh, uh, were reached throughout the throughout the eighteen years uh, we covered. Um, next slide, please. So now we are coming to the to the to the results. So the first slide I want to show you is. Um, is is uh, um, is showing you um, the utilization rate of health services. As you can see, in the early years between 2000 2003, we had a high utilization rate, and then it went nicely down over the years. Um, the gray columns show you the population trends in the camps. So uh, the initial uh, size of the population in 2000 was the same as it was in 2018. Interestingly. And in between, there is this peak uh, in, um, I think it was 2000, I cannot see it properly, I think it was in 2003. Um, and um, the um, we identified one push and one pull factors for the, for the mainly caring population coming over the border to the camps. So first, uh, we suppose it was the UNHCR registration process, um, which started... Um, uh, which started in, in 2000, um, around 2005. Um, so the the becoming a, becoming a refugee in the camps was some sort of uh, attractive since there was the opportunity to um, get into a resettlement program um, to uh, Western countries like uh, 
um, Norway, Australia, New Zealand, and the USA. So this was probably a pull factor. Um, and the push factor was the unrest uh, in Myanmar a couple of years later, which also led to many people uh, um, fleeing and uh, uh, coming over the border to the camps. Next slide, please. So incidents of watery diarrhea and dysentery, um, also a nice, um, a nice development here. Incidents, uh, incidences went down in both. Um, as you can see here, in two thousand and three, there was a there was um, um, ninety percent coverage of households and uh, with flush latrines. Um, and uh, a couple of years later. Um, water chlorination started, and after the start of the water chlorination, dysentery incidents went uh, further down. Um, so these are remarkable trends, I think, and then we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, incidents of uh, pneumonia also also went nicely down. In the early years, we had a we had an um, uncontrolled use of antibiotics, so antibiotics to, um, uh, vanished uh, from the central pharmacy in Meramalwan camp and were sold in the market. Um, and um, so we tried to, or the team tried to solve this problem, better training, better uh, better management of the pharmacy. And, uh, and um, so these interventions led to uh, some success at least that's probable, and incidence of low respiratory tract uh, infections went uh, nicely down. So next uh, slide, please. So all-cause uh, malaria, this is also a beautiful trend. Um, probably more spectacular are the trends between 1990 and 2000, where the drop of incidence was, was uh, much more spectacular. But... Um, here you also see certain interventions and uh, reinforcement of the malaria control program um, in, in, in the later phase of the project led to a further, further decline of uh, malaria incidents, all-cause malaria incidents. Next slide, please. So uh, a further slide on the results. And despite the continuous drain of, of trained health workers, I mean, often we lost the health workers since they were since they were in the resettlement program and left the, left the country. Um, the volatile influx of refugees and the isolated location of the two camps, the initial basic curative health developed into an integrated primary health care project. And uh, malaria, and pneumonia, watery diarrhea, and dysentery morbidity dropped 12, 3, 2, and 5 fold respectively. And also health service utilization dropped from 7.1 to 2.9 consult consultations per refugee per year. Um, so what's the conclusion? So an integrated and evidence-based primary healthcare project adequately funded and implemented by one health agency is an effective and relevant approach to reduce the uh, infectious disease burden in such a setting where integration into the health services of the host country is not an option. Um, yeah, this is it. Next slide, please. So many thanks for this opportunity. I hope you found the results as interesting as we did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, here we have a, an excellent example of how uh, these crises, sometimes we, 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 we tend to perceive them as something that's very acute, but they end up being quite protracted. And here's an example of, um, you know, the changes that can be made over uh, an 18-month period. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to open up the, the floor to questions. Uh, sorry about that. But you can grab them on the way out and ask them any questions you have. Um, what would I take as a learning from these sessions is just the complexity of the different refugee um, or uh, forcibly displaced contexts, um, be it uh, the question of vaccinations, uh, work in social work and women, uh, cholera surveillance, scabies, palliative care, primary health care. 
uh, and just how innovative approaches can uh, alleviate the suffering in different ways. Uh, we talked about mobile technology, uh, social work and case management, uh, trans, uh, transdisciplinary work, um, for example, with WASH, uh, with vector control. Um, the use of ethnography to be able to uh, identify belief systems and how that's relevant to, um, uh, to providing care. And of course, comparison over uh, a, a, a long period of time. So anyways, uh, thank you very much and a, a final applause for the participants. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm cancelling the tea break, just to let you know, unilateral decision here. But anyway, anybody can have tea or coffee and has been having tea or coffee for the last two or three hours. That's great. So I'm going to hand over to Manoshi now uh, for the next session. Thank you very much. Let's give a hand. <laughs> Just for a quick photo, can you please stand here? Thank you. Good evening again. How are you all? Are you feeling sleepy? Uh, if uh, you are feeling sleepy, you can go for the tea or coffee because Helen just cancelled our tea break. Um, so now we'll directly going to the next part. Our mini panel discussion that will be about factors associated with depression among older people in an urban area of Dhaka and non-communicable diseases related to health-seeking behavior of indigenous older adult residing in the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh. Uh, I am thrilled to announce our speakers for the evening. We have Dr. Rajan Talukdar, Medical Officer, Directorate General of Health Service, Bangladesh. Dr. Talukdar is an experienced physician who has worked extensively with indigenous older adults in the Chittagong Hill Tracks and passionate about improving the health and well-being of this vulnerable population. We also have Dr. K. M. Tohidu Rahman who will be joining with us via online who is a Senior Research Officer, Department of Public Health and Informatics, BSMMU. He is a promising researcher with remarkable dedication. Our moderator for this evening is Professor Dr. Mostafa Jaman, Public Health Informatics Department, BSMMU. I am pleased to introduce Professor Dr. Mostafa Jaman, the Executive Editor of BSMMU Journal and a faculty member of the Department of Public Health and Informatics. He had led World Health Organization Bangladesh NCD team for more than a decade. His research interests include risk factor of non-communicable diseases. Dr. Jaman is a highly respected expert in the field of non-communicable disease. He is a prolific author and editor, and his work has been published in a numerous leading medical journals with high level of age index. I am directly handing over to Dr. Mostafa Jaman sir for taking the lead. Thank you.
Thank you for a nice introduction, for your kind, kind words. <clears throat> uh, today, uh, we are going to discuss issues related to elderly people. Both these papers are, the studies were done among people as at 65 years and older. I believe the investigators have taken this cutoff point as the definition of elderly people. But as per Bangladesh legislation, an elderly is defined as anyone is it 61, 60 years or older. Maybe uh, they wanted to keep a comparability with studies done in other parts of the world. Becoming an elderly person, sometimes very scary, but sometimes very prestigious. If I recall my experience when I heard for the first time that a shopkeeper addressed me as uncle, it was, it was really shooting on my heart. And I, I just stopped shopping and I went out of the shop. I digested it. I took a lot of time to digest it that I am already crossing a zone of young adult to older adults. Then, becoming an elderly, 60 years and above. Yeah, another layer. People started, especially small kids, started calling me grandpa. But it was not that painful when I, uh, compared to the word when I heard, I was called as uncle. But 60, 65 has its pride also. Taking the social norms here might be in other parts of the world. People of this age are highly respected. They have given special care. And that should be the case. Once I was uh, standing on a queue of uh, BRTA, Bangladesh Road Transport Authority, for renewing my driving license. And someone came forward and told me, sir, why you are standing here? You have a special line for you. So I moved there, but I was a little confused whether it was a respect or a neglect. So my colleagues, uh, Tawhidur Rahman and Rajan Talukdar, they have done their work among people of that group who are sometimes confused whether they are getting respect or insult. So please, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Tawhidur Rahman. Are you online, Dr. Tawhid? Dr. Tawhid? The first author is S. S. Rahman. I don't know what is the full name, but Dr. Rahman, because uh, Dr. Rahman is not in the country, I was informed that Dr. Tawhid will make the presentation and he will be presenting it from outside the country. If there is any delay in getting him, Dr. Tawhid, uh, please uh, take time and the organizers can take a little time. By the time, I would like to invite the next presenter, Rajan Talukdar. Ah, Tawhid, you are here. Welcome, Dr. Tawhid. Uh, where are you staying now? Uh, I'm, I'm in, uh, uh, in, in Chicago. Chicago. So, so this is academic University of Chicago. Okay, University of Chicago. So, may I request you to make the presentation? Directly yes, definitely. At the same Thank time. You. Thank you.
So as Dr. Fung was saying that uh, the study was uh, done uh, uh, among the elderly people, uh, and he has already introduced me. I am Dr. K. M. Dawidur Rahman. I work as the senior research officer uh, in the Department of Public Health and Informatics, BSMMU. And the uh, title of my presentation Dr. is Dr. Tawhid, uh, can you go for presentation mode? Yes, yes definitely. Is it okay now? Thank you. Thank you. So the title of my presentation is Factors Associated with Depression Among Older People in an Urban Area of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And we already uh, all know that depression has emerged as a significant mental health disorder, not only in uh, older community, but uh, in every age group. And the quality of life of, of the older adults uh, is severely hampered by uh, depression. In Bangladesh, there are uh, almost 40% uh, older adults, and among them, 40% uh, of the older adults are depressed, and 23% uh, of them have uh, suicidal thoughts. But there is a uh, lack of information regarding and uh, lack of research regarding the causes of depression in uh, older adults of Bangladesh. Thus, we uh, try to find, identify the risk factor associated with depression among older people in an urban area of Dhaka, Bangladesh, with specific objectives of uh, to identify the socio economic status, to identify the loneliness and concern of fall level of older people to identify the comorbidities associated with depression among older people and also to identify the risk factors associated with depression. This study was done in a cross-sectional design uh, at Uttarkhand area of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And the study was done back in uh, 2022. Uh, uh, and, and it was uh, done among the people over 65 uh, years of age living in the study area. The total sample size was 135. And the study was done with a pre-tested semi-structured questionnaire, which included uh, some validated scale like geriatric depression scale short form, which is 15 items, uh, Dijon uh, loneliness scale, which has uh, 11 items, uh, fall ep efficacy scale international version, which has seven uh, items, and uh, graded uh, chronic uh, pain scale, uh, which, uh, which is the revised version. And the data analysis was done using the uh, IBM SPSS version 25, and all the descriptive and analytical statistics was done using this software, and logistic regression was done to find out the uh, factors associated with elderly depression. And ethical clearance was obtained from the Institutional Review Board of Bangladesh Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Now I will jump into the results. Uh, among, among the participants, 58.5% uh, were female, and uh, we can uh, see that uh, female were more depressed than the males. Among, uh, among the de depressed, 69.2% were uh, female. It was significantly higher than the um, uh, non uh, male. And uh, the age group of female were, sl were slightly uh, higher, although non significant, but the mean age of the whole population was 70.8 years. And uh, we can also see that the uh, widow or widower or the uh, participants who were living uh, without their uh, uh, partner were more depressed uh, than the other group. And the participants with uh, 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 formal education had uh, less amount of depression that th than those uh, who had uh, no formal education. And we try to uh, find out the association between different comorbidities and uh, depression. We uh, uh, found out that diabetes mellitus and chronic pain uh, has uh, uh, some amount of association, and uh, there were more amount of depression among those who had diabetes mellitus and chronic pain. Here we can see that the high concern, uh, 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 there is a high concern of falling. Um, high concern of falling uh, participants had uh, more depression than uh, those of uh, low concern of fall. And also, uh, the participants who were moderate to severe lonely were more, more depressed than those of uh, not lonely. In the regression analysis, we can see that uh, no formal education with 3.89 times more uh, 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 more, more chance of uh, getting depression than uh, formal education. Also, uh, the person with a uh, high concern of fall had 6.6 .6 times more uh, uh, chance of uh, having depression than uh, those of low or moderate concern. 
and also the person with uh, uh, moderately uh, moderately loneliness had uh, 11.34 times and severe loneliness has 27.05 times uh, more chance of getting depression than those of uh, not lonely. Although uh, seeing the result, you can see that the uh, confidence interval is uh, a little bit widespread. Uh, that's because uh, the sample size was uh, not that much uh, bigger. Uh, that is why uh, uh, that is why we uh, we will, would like to recommend a, a further study. Definitely, we need further studies, and we'd like to uh, recommend further studies with higher sample size and a little bit more generalizable sample uh, collection, so that the uh, result can be uh, more generalizable for the population. But according to this study, more than two thirds of the older population were found to be depressed. And the state of depression was associated with lack of formal education, moderate to severe loneliness, and high concern about falling. And uh, uh, proper screening of the elderly depression and early intervention are needed in some cases, and appropriate intervention program should be designed with special attention given to the respondents with no formal education and having concern of falling. So I would like to uh, congratulate all the uh, investigators who were uh, associated with this uh, the, uh, study, and also would like to thank all the participants who par participated in the, uh, in this research. And also, I'd like to thank Bangladesh uh, Sheikh Mujib Medical University for fund funding this uh, study. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. concerning. Uh, thanks, uh, presenter, for the new, uh, nice presentation. Uh, my uh, question uh, to the speaker is, is there uh, any option to see um, uh, or opportunity to see the uh, uh, family, uh, like unique family or joint family? Because we know that the elderly people uh, are like widow or uh, married, but uh, there is maybe association with a uh, family structure. So in developed country, we see that there is a relations uh, like Japan, uh, where people are uh, dying alone in their flat. So, uh, but uh, in our family structure, it is uh, like a bit different. So is there any um, answer from this study we have found it or not? Thank you. Dr. Tawhid, please. Uh, yes, thank you. That's a nice question. Uh, I think we should address this. Uh, uh, actually, actually, in our study, we also, also uh, try to find, find out if there is any association with depression uh, among the participants who are living alone or uh, or who are living uh, with the joint family. But uh, we could not establish any kind of relationship. That is why uh, we did not include it in the pre uh, short presentation. But yes, we did explore this. But maybe uh, in case of uh, a further study with larger sample size uh, uh, will be maybe helpful to find out any kind of association. But uh, yes, uh, family structure and uh, social, um, uh, you know, some uh, social gathering or club-like programs, these were, uh, uh, these were associated with uh, uh, depression i mean they can reduce the depression if uh, if the elderly people are associated with some kind of social work or social clubbing um uh, and 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 it was also found that uh, traumatic life uh, events or physical abuse in the family this type of events are also associated with depression so i think there is uh, a lot of scope to uh, work work with um uh, definitely uh, in future uh, some some other studies will explore these possibilities Please, another question. <clears throat> Please introduce yourself. Uh, I am Nipun Islam, working with 
MSF OCB via Cox's Bazar. Uh, it is a very clear and uh, impressive presentation. And the topics is also really very important. Uh, my thought is there if uh, what could be the policy implications for the future, the policy recommendations. And uh, another thing, see if we uh, categorized the depression, the mild, moderate, and severe, so we can also identify the uh, early intervention groups. That it is it possible for the studies? Yes, uh, thank, uh, thank you, you for the suggestion. suggestion. I think uh, it is possible to categorize depression into uh, mild, moderate, severe. It's just a matter of uh, which scale we are using to. Uh, you know, uh, uh, measure the depression level. So, uh, if uh, uh, if we use a different kind of scale to, to uh, find out the different categories of depression, it is possible. And also to uh, answer another question, what is the policy implication? I guess, uh, as I was saying, that there are uh, some other factors that uh, other countries or other studies have found that the lack of social support is one of the prime cause of uh, getting elderly depression and also, uh, you know, the physical abuse and other uh, uh, traumatic life events. Uh, maybe uh, government can design specific intervention for uh, reducing this type of uh, 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 social context or uh, they, can, uh, they can take some programs so that uh, elderly people can, can get uh, some uh, the improved social support. So this will uh, definitely improve the mental health condition of uh, elderly people. Please. Excellent. So, uh, you have I, I, I also supplementary have, no, question? No, no question. I, I am satisfied with the answers and thankful. Okay. And uh, I, I believe in our country, the geriatric care will be improved in future. Really very, uh, very less, it's, we can say, very low for the old elderly people where the need is very high. Thanks. We are also going to be in this group soon. Please. Assalamu alaikum. I'm District and Session Judge Court. So my question to the uh, presenter that, uh, as you said, the depression for the older people, and if you categorize the people who are depression, like is it severe or middle, and uh, it will uh, mitigate by the medicine or the counseling. It will help to uh, mitigate the depression for the older people because they're already suffering from different types of uh, medical issues. And for their hypertensions and other pressure, blood pressures and different uh, issues uh, make the depressions uh, and impact on their health. So if you categorize those things, then it will help to uh, by counseling or by the taking medicine, which will uh, mitigate the depression from the older people. Yes, thank, thank you, you for, for the suggestion. suggestion. I, I think uh, in, in the future studies, we'll try to implement uh, this categorization. No more question? One uh, burning question, I think uh, his mentor can help also. How did you land into 135? Going to a community, Uttarakhand is such a big area, and you purposely selected 135. How did you land there? How did you calculate it? I have seen when you classified loneliness into three categories, it was almost impossible to analyze the last one. Mm -hmm. So uh, the sample size is an issue here. So how did you decide your sample size? Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Dr. Zaman, that's an uh, important question, question I should address. address. Uh, uh, we, we had, had a sample, sample size uh, calculated a little bit higher than uh, 135, but uh, we, we selected Uttarakhand because we had an existing uh, sampling frame uh, there. And uh, uh, another geriatric uh, nutrition-related study was already conducted there. So we already had the sampling frame, and we wanted to uh, conduct a follow-up research on geriatric depression. Uh, but uh, the previous study was uh, three, four years back. And uh, when we went to the community, we saw that many of the uh, older elderly people that we already had listed uh, died or moved out. Uh, and also, uh, we, ha we had selected... Uh, three uh, villages in Uttarakhand uh, community that we, we have uh, surveyed previously. So 
among these uh, three villages, we found uh, uh, we we purposely selected one thirty five uh, participants. I think this is one of the, uh, the limitations of this study. Um, as I al uh, already mentioned, that uh, we need further follow up studies uh, regarding geriatric depression, maybe in another community or maybe uh, in a separate style like urban, rural, and peri-urban, uh, so that uh, the results can be uh, uh, make more generalizable. Thank you for clarifications. This is not a question, but as we all know, those who work in uh, uh, epidemiology, the hypertension, diabetes, all those that have been identified as risk factors. But the big question is, which has caused what? Because it was determined that a, as a single point examination, depression caused diabetes, or diabetes is the cause for depression. So we should be cautious about uh, making a firm conclusion from a small study like this. We need further work. Colleagues and friends, uh, by this time I have seen the percentage of elderly in Bangladesh was 7.48% in 2011. And the rise was very sharp in 2022, last census, we have seen 9.28%. Almost two percentage points has increased during this time. So it will expand further. We need appropriate, appropriate uh, policy measures to face the problems of the elderly people. With this comment, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Rajan Talukdar for making a presentation. It is on health seeking behavior for non-communicable disease, but it is among the in indigenous elderly adults living in Chittagong Hill. Dr. Rajan, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, most of Zaman, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, giving me opportunity to present my abstract. I think I'm the last presenter here. Uh, I won't take time. Uh, I'm going to uh, present my uh, abstract. Uh, first, I uh, would like to uh, Introdu uh, uh, introduction, uh, um, non-communicable diseases. Uh, non-communicable diseases are common among older adults. And about 70% deaths in Bangladesh in 2019 were due to non-communicable diseases. And there is uh, limited data on health-seeking behavior of the indigenous older adults in Bangladesh towards non-communicable diseases. Uh, also, there is uh, some disparities uh, regarding uh, health-seeking behavior and he other health facilities and uh, sorts of things. Uh, so our study aimed to identify health service selection preferences uh, by indigenous older adults in Chiragang Hill Tracts. The method was a qualitative study, uh, which was performed at Kagrachori in 2022 after getting the uh, ethical uh, clearance from Institutional Review Board of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Uh, the study population were 65 years and above indigenous people. I, uh, we took uh, Takma, Marma, and Tripura, these three ethnic uh, communities, uh, uh, those who have non-communicable diseases, one or uh, more. And uh, the sample size was uh, six focus group discussions. We conducted focus group discussions uh, by using a guideline in their native languages because uh, Chakma, 
Marma and Tripura, those uh, communities, speak different languages. And data collection was uh, done by the data collectors who can speak their native language, uh, which was audio recorded, then uh, transcribed and transcribed. Uh, uh, focus group discussions were then translated into English. Then we uh, analyzed the data uh, by using Atlas TI-9. Uh, the result was, uh, there was, uh, it was actually an uh, experience. Uh, those who can afford modern medicine, they take Fazari, which is uh, traditional hill medicine, uh, the uh, one uh, male chakma participant said, uh, there is fear of being diagnosed of deadly diseases. That is why they don't uh, go to take laboratory tests. Uh, one female uh, participant explained, and uh, the, they prefer hospital uh, institutional treatment for non-communicable diseases, uh, which is uh, they don't uh, think that the traditional uh, healers uh, can uh, give the treatment of the uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, one male marma mm, I told that I do not go to institutional uh, health facilities due to fear because uh, I don't know uh, how to explain my problems to them uh, because most of the health facilities are uh, and uh, doctors, uh, they uh, uh, communicate are uh, not, they are native, uh, native uh, language speakers. Uh, after uh, analysis, uh, we found uh, four specific uh, issues and that uh, influence their uh, health seeking activities, uh, which are uh, socio-demographic issues, institutional issues, health belief issues, and individual issues. Um, in conclusions, uh, uh, I found that, we found that uh, self-medication is common in indigenous older adults. Uh, they are health-seeking uh, decisions are influenced by their peers. And they hear from their uh, relatives, their neighbors, and uh, they take their decisions. Uh, they uh, perceive that uh, non-communicable diseases are modern diseases and uh, non-treatable by traditional healers. Uh, yes. And there are uh, barriers, uh, who, uh, language barriers, lack of awareness, uh, waiting time was uh, complained by one of the, uh, uh, not one, actually uh, several participants uh, uh, complained about waiting time and also complained about uh, not having companion to take them to their uh, institutional hospital for uh, taking uh, treatment or advice for non-communicable diseases. Uh, so they seek uh, help from uh, traditional healers for these barriers. Uh, if all treatment fails, they uh, try to uh, solve everything by uh, spiritual solutions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rajan, for very crisp presentation. Is there any question from anyone? Everyone, everyone is waiting for the cultural event. We still have some preparation time for the cultural event. No question, comment or observation. No one. Okay. Sure, sure. Make it lively. And don't forget to tell a rhyme. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I'm very proud that Dr. Razan was my student and he did after, uh, I mean, this study under my supervision. And uh, he is from that community. And when he decided to do something from his community, made all of us very proud that, okay, you should go to your community and you need to know from your community. And uh, the, the thing
thing, uh, I think, due to the time constraint, Rajan didn't tell that why we uh, were interested to go there for these elderly people or NCD. Uh, you know, the government of Bangladesh, they are forcing uh, and doing many things for non-communicable diseases and which is related with the AIDS. And uh, so NCD corners are developed in the hospitals. So if the people, I mean, for whom it is created, if they do not go there, so this will be, will be will go in vain. So uh, it's, it was very, uh, I mean, wise to know about their thinking in the community. And you know, the lot of, uh, I mean, I did factors identified. But what surprised me a lot that I did never uh, thought that it will come out that they don't want to go to the community because uh, because of the language barrier. They, they do not feel comfortable that the doctors, they are, they are coming from the plain land and I cannot communicate with them. I don't feel comfortable to go there. So these policy makers can take some suggestions from this study and he is in the process of publishing this paper. Definitely it will be help. And uh, so language barrier should be removed and the people from that community can be deployed in those health facilities. So it's a useful one. I, I think we can give a big hand to Dr. Rajan Talukdar for his work. And of course, the big hand to the boss, right? <laughs> OK, uh, thanks for the supplementation. But I, I want to say one, uh, ex one proverb. Probably I forgot the full text. It is something like, who has taken my keys? Government has a quota for medical admission for those tribal people or whatever the term is. Where are they? Because they, were, they are given admissions with the condition that they will serve their people. When I was in WHO, I was in government, that, that question burned me every time when people say, people from Plainland go there for offering service, but where the people who, for whom government has opened the door of the medical colleges, where they have gone? I'm sorry, I'm, uh, maybe I'm, uh, uh, my voice is a little emotional at this stage, but I really mean it, and I will be shouting for this. Because one of the point he has mentioned that they don't understand the language. But government has spent a lot for people, those who will understand their language. Number two, another point that has been highlighted, we go there because medicine is given free. This is the whole impression all about the primary care. People go there because there are medicines. No medicine supply, no patient will go. So we need to be able to sell ourselves about the service we provide. It's not only the medicines that government distribute there. Our services are not valued because it is not accompanied by the, by the supply of medicine or other logistics. Number three, they depend on the traditional healers because they talk very nice. They use their, uh, the language that people talk and their words are so convincing, so sweet and people are ready to pay for them even more than an educated doctor. But this, we have a lot of pride as after becoming a doctor, after becoming a nurse, a lot of pride. We hardly open the mouth. In one policy dialogue, one journalist was telling that we do not expect anything from you other than a smile from the healthcare provider. And someone from the back said, even the smile is very costly. So please make the smile cheaper so that people rely on us rather than going back to a spiritual healer 
traditional uh, healers and so on. But the study was really nice. Please uh, don't delay in publishing it so that people get some clue to work, work further. The study done by Tawhid. Tawhid, are you still online? Maybe. Uh, it was also very useful because depression is very common and it is gradually, gradually ex engulfing all, all, all the glories that we are earning with the modern life. But at the expense, we are losing a lot of things. So mental health is an issue, especially depression uh, is becoming an issue. We need to take care of these in the coming days. If not, if not, what, uh, how people say? If not today, then when? If not today, then when? With this, I would like to conclude the session with special thanks to the person who has introduced me so nicely with a lot of uh, sweet words, kind words, and the presenters making a nice presentation. And of course, we have a very class, classic uh, audience here. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Kaliku Zaman, for supplementing it and leading the team for doing Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Mustafa Jaman, Dr. K. M. Tohidi Rahman, and Dr. Rajan Talukdar. We'd like to give you a token of gratitude. Please give it a moment. I request Dr. Mustafa Jaman sir to hand over the token of gift to Dr. Rajan Talukdar. And I'd like to call Helen to do the honor to hand over the gift to Dr. Mustafa Jamansa. Let's put our hands together. Thank you so much. We have come to the beginning of the end of our scientific seminar. It has been a day filled with learning, sharing, and inspiration. The seminar has provided us with a wealth of knowledge and insights. We have learned from experts in the field, shared our own experiences, and inspired each other to continue working towards a better future. But this is just the beginning. Now it's up to us to take what we have learned and apply it to our work in our real field. Now. For the closing remark, I would like to announce that Professor Dr. Mohammad Munru Zaman Khan, Pro Vice Chancellor of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, to come to the stage and share a few words. He is the Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and Development and Professor of Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He is the Founder President of Cancer Mission Foundation, Dhaka and President at Bangladesh Society of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. I humbly request Dr. Mohammad Munir Zaman Khan to come to the stage, please. Let's put our hands together and welcome him. Actually, I am suffering from severe uh, running nose. So I am wearing a uh, surgical mask to uh, feel comfort and to protect you all. Distinguished guests and scientists from home and abroad. MSA uh, Scientific Days, year uh, 2023. 
organized in, in partnership with the Department of Public Health and Informatics. Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. I am very glad and happy to be here with the, uh, a lot of scientists and researchers. To close the MSF Asia Scientific Days 2023 conference, you have a very busy and productive day of talking about medical research, making new friends, and sharing knowledge. I have been really impressed by the enthusiasm of the speakers and panelists throughout the day and by how they have been engaged and involved making this conference a successful one. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I enjoyed two uh, paper presentations. Uh, one is uh, from uh, regarding Hill Trucks people, and another is uh, about depres uh, depression. When actually, uh, diabetic depression is very much, very much alarming to, uh, for the, uh, many, every society and every country. Diabetic patient is suffering from the depression, uh, especially type 2 diabetes mellitus. Very much carefully uh, uh, research is needed at this field. I hope you will uh, come forward to uh, find out this uh, and bridge this uh, gap. I am hopeful that the research and ideas that have been shared here will have, will have an impact on the health of people in Asia and all over the world. Here we have discussed a wide range of important topics including tuberculosis, neglected tropical diseases, non-communicable diseases, possibly displaced population and health of elderly, indigenous people and many more. I am very much glad to our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, for her emphasis on research. She believes that research is essential for progress in all areas, including healthcare. At BSMMU, we are committed to conducting research that makes a real difference in the lives of people in Bangladesh and around the world. Here, we emphasize and encourage the students and physicians to do effective research along with the patient care. I am a people from discipline of physical medicine and rehabilitation, that is physiatrist, I'm a physiatrist. We are uh, dealing the patients with suffering from different types of disabilities, disabilities. These people are very much neglected in our society and uh, these disabled uh, people will be more and more after the uh, conflicts of Hamas and Israel and uh, Russia and Ukraine. These people are very much um, uh, suffered uh, in all aspects of their quality of life. Since 2015, MSF Scientific Days has brought together experts from the humanitarian and academic sectors to share their research and innovation in healthcare. I am proud that this year BSMMU has partnered with MSF to host this important conference. My heartfelt gratitude to MSF for organizing such an important event. I am especially excited about the potential for the research that has been shared at this conference that has real world benefits for our people. For example, the research on new ways to diagnose and treat tuberculosis will lead to decrease in the burden of this disease. The research on improving the health of forcibly displaced population and older people may lead to better outcomes 
for these vulnerable groups. I sincerely encourage all of you to collaborate and share ideas and work together to make a positive impact in the world for the better tomorrow. Especially, I hope, who are from the abroad, you enjoy and you um, uh, stay in Bangladesh. Is um, uh, Dr. Tina can <laughs> many tell us about their, uh, uh, is their pleasant or their uh, comfort? Their uh, I hope you all are you are in comfort zone or in comfort position. Thank you again for being here today and uh, uh, give me the opportunity to say something in front of you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud Munir Zaman Khan, sir, for your insightful speech. With this, we have come to the closing of the scientific part, but still we have a cultural part. Uh, before my vote of thanks, I uh, would like to call Helen. I think she must have something to announce. I just would like to thank everybody uh, from our team who have been working very hard uh, um, in the run up to this and also now, and to the BSMMU uh, team. Thank you very much for that as well. And I don't know if everybody knows this, but we actually start the planning for this months in advance, and we form an editorial committee. And one of the most faithful members of our editorial committee is here today, uh, Petros. N normally, uh, he's uh, not. Normally, he, he, for the last couple of years, of course, because of COVID, he couldn't join uh, necessarily in person. But it's very nice to have him here now. Um, and. Um, it's been a, an excellent experience for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. On behalf of MSF and the Department of Public Health and Informatics at Bangabandhu Sheikh Moji Medical University, I and Helen would like to express our sincere gratitude to everyone who made this MSF Scientific Days 2023 a success. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our keynote speakers, panelists, abstract presenters, chairs, moderators, poster pre presenters, for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. We are grateful for your contribution to the event. Secondly, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to the organizing team from MSF, volunteers from BSMMU, and the technical and background team who have worked tirelessly behind the scene to make this event a success. Their contribution from setting up the stage, sound system, food, and everything, and to ensure that everything runs quite fine, are essential and often overlooked. I'm truly grateful for their dedication and hard work. Finally, my sincere gratitude to all of you, all the attendees, for attending this seminar throughout the day. I know it's a long day, but a, an insightful one. I hope you have found the presentations informative and thought-provoking. Thank you again, but we'll not say goodbye right now because we'll have a small cultural show for you. So please wait, don't leave us, don't miss it. We'll commence within five to six minutes from now. Our next EMC for the cultural part of this evening will be Dr. Afrin Tahi. Please be seated. We'll bring our cultural part to you very soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>